Part three, chapter three of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter three, enforcing a report. August to December of 1857. The nation is grateful to you for what you did at Scutari, but all that it was possible for you to do there was a trifle compared with the good you are doing now. Sir John McNeil, Letter to Florence Nightingale, December 1857. Reformers, who are familiar with the ways of the political world, more often sigh than rejoice when they hear that a subject in which they are interested has been referred to a royal commission. They know that the chances are many to one that the subject, like the report, will be placed on a shelf and stay there. Sometimes the reference is a well-understood euphemism for such an intention, and even when it is not, there are many things which may bring about the same result. The commission will perhaps produce a litter of reports from whose discordant voices no definite conclusion can be drawn. In any case, the report or reports will have to engage the earnest attention of his or her majesty's government, and the attention, earnest or otherwise, is sure to be prolonged. Before the process has come to an end, many things may have happened to overlay the subject in question. Every generation of reformers sees a certain number of subjects on which its heart has been set deeply and turned under a pile of blue books. This was the danger with which Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale were confronted in August 1857 in the case of their royal commission on the sanitary condition of the British Army. Against the risk of an equivocal report, they had, indeed, guarded themselves in advance, but the danger of a definite report leading to no immediate action had still to be met. Mr. Herbert was no less anxious than Miss Nightingale to meet it. He had devoted unsparing toil to the commission. His toil would be reduced to futility if the report were merely to be pigeonholed. They laid their plans on the consideration mentioned at the end of the last chapter, namely the effect which the disclosures of the Royal Commission was likely to have on public opinion. Mr. Herbert communicated the gist of the report privately to Lord Panmure. It could be officially presented and published sooner or later as the negotiations with ministers might go. Mr. Herbert pointed out to Lord Panmure that the report was likely to arrest a good deal of general attention, that there was time to take measures toward reform before the report became known to the public, that the simultaneous publication both of its recommendations and of orders and regulations founded upon them would give the prestige which promptitude always carries with it. Mr. Herbert would gladly give every assistance in his power toward that end. He put the case with his usual suavity, but there was iron within the velvet. The publication of the report could properly be postponed for a while, but not indefinitely. Lord Panmure had to choose between committing himself to instant reform, so as to whitewash the government beforehand, and postponing reform, in which case he would have to reckon with a public opinion inflamed by the disclosures of the report. And meanwhile, Miss Nightingale still held her report in reserve for use in an appeal to public opinion should the negotiations fail to secure any guarantee for prompt reform. The plan of active reform agreed upon between her and Mr. Herbert was that four subcommissions should be appointed, with Mr. Herbert himself as chairman of each, to settle the details of a reform and in some measure to execute it in accordance with the general recommendations of the report. These subcommissions were severally, one, to put the barracks in sanitary order, two, to organize a statistical department, three, to institute a medical school, and four, to reconstruct the army medical department, to revise the hospital regulations, and draw up a warrant for the promotion of medical officers. This last, from its comprehensive and cleansing scope, was called by Miss Nightingale the Wiping Commission. Mr. Herbert sent these proposals to Lord Panmure on August 7th, and two days later he wrote to Miss Nightingale, Panmure writes fairly enough, but he has gone to shoot grouse. I have asked Alexander to meet me at the Burlington on Wednesday at three to discuss and settle things, so I have disposed of your time and rooms. 
The grouse, however, were not quite ready, and on the 14th Mr. Herbert caught Lord Panmure on the wing. Mr. Herbert seemed to carry his point. The four sub-commissions were agreed to in general terms, and as he sent word to Miss Nightingale on the same day, he was able to leave for Ireland with a lighter heart after seeing Pan. But I am not easy about you. Here am I going to lead an animal life for a month, get up early, pursue your animal, catch him, eat him, and go to sleep. Why can't you, who do men's work, take man's exercise in some shape? This is my parting sermon. I use, for the purpose of scolding you, a liberty which nothing gives me but my hearty regard and affection for you. Mr. Herbert had well earned his month's fishing, but as Dr. Sutherland presently wrote to her, one thing is quite clear, that women can do what men would not do, and that women will dare suffering knowingly where men would shrink. Miss Nightingale would not, and could not, take man's rest, because she felt her cause too intensely. She could not be of so light a heart as her friend, because she knew her pan a little better than he did. Dr. Andrew Smith, she heard, was putting up a stiff fight against reform. Lord Panmure stayed on in the Highlands late into the autumn, paying only a flying visit or two to London. His subordinates were as laborious as ever in piling up objections. He became frightened at his own acts, and at one time revoked, but afterwards under pressure reinstated, the authority he had given for the wiping subcommission. Mr. Herbert returned to England in September, and came up to London to see Miss Nightingale before the first meeting of the first subcommission. Many weeks elapsed before all of them were set on foot. She, meanwhile, was incessantly at work, and Dr. Sutherland, who lived at Highgate, was constantly with her. She wrote reminders to Lord Panmure. Although I hear you saying, there is that bothering woman again, she begged Mr. Herbert to do the like. She drafted instructions and schemes for each of the subcommissions, as each of them set to work, there were meetings in her rooms to settle the procedure. There were periods, as Miss Nightingale afterward recalled, when Sidney Herbert would meet the cabal, as he used to call it, which consists of you and me and Alexander and Sutherland, and sometimes Martin and Farr, every day either at Burlington Street or at Belgrave Square, and sometimes as often as twice or even three times a day. A few extracts from her correspondence will show the extent of her work and the eagerness of her temper. August 7th, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. The reconstitution of the Army Medical Department as to its government has been carried by the Commission almost in the form which you recommended. I have been requested by Mr. Herbert, who went out of town last night for a few days, to draw up a scheme as to what these new men are to do and I now venture to enclose it to you, earnestly begging you to consider it, and send it me back with your remarks in as short a time as you possibly can. We have carried the barracks subcommission with Panmure, Dr. Sutherland, to be the sanitary head. September 29th. Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale. Pan is still shooting. It is to me unconscionable. In future you must defend the bison, for I won't. October 10th. Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. I will not say a word about India. You know so much more about it than anybody here. We have seen terrible things in the last three years, but nothing to my mind so terrible as Panmure's unmanly and stupid indifference on this occasion. I have been three years serving in the War Department. When I began there was incapacity, but not indifference. Now there is incapacity and indifference, Panmure's coming up to town last Thursday week was the consequence of reiterated remonstrance, and he is going away again after the next Indian mail. That India will have to be occupied by British troops for several years, I suppose there is no question. And so far, from the all-absorbing interest of this Indian subject, diminishing the necessity of immediately carrying out the reforms suggested by our commission, I am sure you will agree that they are now the more vitally important to the very existence of an army. I came up to town, from Malvern, on Thursday week, and met Mr. Herbert for this purpose. Panmure had not done a thing. It was extracted from him then and there that the four sub-commissions should be issued immediately. The instructions had been approved by P. seven weeks ago. A week, however, has elapsed, and we have heard nothing. I shall not, however, leave P. alone till this is done. Mr. Herbert's honour is at stake, which gives us a hold upon him. Without him, of course, I could do nothing. November 9th, Sir J. McNeil to Miss Nightingale. 
we may now reckon on something being done to rescue the country from the sin and shame of having so culpably neglected our soldiers. I rejoice that you are to see the fruits of your labors in their behalf. November 15th, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. Here I come again. Panmure has granted the wiping commission with such ample instructions for preparing draft instructions and regulations, defining the duties of, etc., etc., and revising the Queen's QMG's barracks, purveyors, and hospital regulations, as you may guess them to be, when I tell you they were written by me. Mr. Herbert is, besides, to send Panmure a constitution for the Army Medical Board, and a warrant for promotion himself. All that is necessary now is to keep Mr. Herbert up to the point. The strength of his character is its simplicity and candor, with extreme quickness of perception. Its fault is its excessive eclecticism. Ten years have I been endeavoring to obtain an expression of opinion from him, and have never succeeded yet. This new subcommission entails upon me a labor I most gladly undertake, of putting together draft regulations to be submitted to Mr. Herbert, as suggestions for the draft he will propose to the subcommission. These regulations must, of course, rhyme with the report. I think you would recommend, etc., etc., December 1st, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. This is the first rough proof of the regulations chiefly written by myself, which Mr. Herbert will submit to the Regulations Committee on Monday. I send them to you with his sanction, begging you to cut them up severally and to send them back as soon as possible. I, in my own name, direct your particular attention to criticize the regulations for nurses. You will, of course, understand that my name does not appear. We are so sorry to give you this trouble, but feel the necessity of having your advice. December 14th. Mrs. Herbert to Miss Nightingale. Dearest, Sidney wishes me to send you these, if you will be so kind as to look over them. I know it's wrong. 2. A later letter from Sir John McNeil is quoted at the head of this chapter. He considered that compared with the work which she was doing now, what she had done at Scutari was a trifle. Mere child's play was the phrase which she herself used in making the comparison. Preceding pages will, I think, have inclined the reader to the same conclusion, or at any rate have enabled him to understand what Miss Nightingale and Sir John meant. And this large and difficult work was being done by a woman who had already taxed her physical strength dangerously in the East, and who was now threatened in the opinion of competent observers by a complete breakdown. Of the members of what was called her cabinet, Sir John McNeil was the one for whose intellectual power and judgment she had the highest respect. To Mr. Herbert she was personally the most attached. But to Dr. Sutherland also she sometimes opened her inner thoughts and feelings. He was of a somewhat wayward disposition, which alternately pleased and vexed the business-like lady-in-chief, but he was an indispensable helper, whilst in his wife Miss Nightingale inspired deep affection, and the two women interchanged intimate religious experiences. All Miss Nightingale's friends, and Dr. Sutherland as a medical man, more especially, saw that she was overworking. Change of air and seclusion she herself felt compelled to seek, and she found them at Malvern in the establishment of Dr. Johnson, who had moved thither from Umberslade. But rest from work she would not and could not take. She was at Malvern in August and September, and again in December. Her faithful Aunt May, her true mother, as the niece at this time called her, kept watch over her alike at Malvern and in London. The society of her own mother and sister, with their many and lively interests, she found distracting. Whether at the Burlington or at Malvern, she desired to use every hour of strength for her work and for nothing else and when Dr. Sutherland joined the others in begging her to desist, her heart was heavy within her. She was sore that her friend should understand her so little. She surmised that he had been prompted by her sister. She was morbidly anxious at the time that no member of the family except Aunt May should know how ill she was. She had attained her freedom for the life of independent work at a great price, as the first part of this memoir has shown. Perhaps in her present overwrought condition she was haunted by a dread lest the galling solicitude of her family might lure her back into the cage. Dr. Sutherland had written two letters at the end of August, begging her to put all work aside. 
She was thinking of everybody's sanitary improvement, he said, except her own. Pray leave us all to ourselves, soldiers and all, for a while. We shall all be the better for a rest. Even your divine pan will be more musical for not being beaten quite so much. As for Mr. Sidney Herbert, he must be in the seventh heaven. Please don't go, Dr. Gully, but do eat and drink and don't think. We'll make such a precious row when you come back. The day when you left town it appeared as if all your blood wanted renewing, and that cannot be done in a week. You must have new blood, or you can't work, and new blood can't be made out of tea, at least so far as I know. There is a paper of Dr. Christensen's about twenty-eight ounces of solid food per diem. You know where that is, and depend on it, the doctor is right. And now I have done my duty as confessor, and hope I shall find you an obedient penitent." To this letter she replied as follows, Miss Nightingale to Dr. Sutherland. And what shall I say in answer to your letter? Someone once said, He that would save his life shall lose it, and what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He meant, I suppose, that life is a means and not an end, and that soul, or the object of life, is the end. Perhaps he was right. Now, in what one respect could I have done other than I have done? Or what exertion have I made that I could have left unmade? Had I lost the report, what would the health I should have saved have profited me? Or what would ten years of life have advantaged me exchanged for the ten weeks this summer? Yes, but you say you might have walked or driven or eaten meat. Well, since we must come to Sentir della Spazira, let me tell you, O oh doctor, that after any walk or drive I sat up all night with palpitation, and the sight of animal food increased the sickness. The man here put me, as soon as I arrived, on a sofa, and told me not to move, and to take no solid food at all till my pulse came down. I remind myself of a little dog, a friend of mine, who barked himself out of an apoplectic fit, when the dog doctor did something he had always manifested an objection to. Now I have written myself into a palpitation. Do you think me one of Byron's young ladies? He it was, I think, who made a small appetite the fashion. Or do you think me an ascetic? Asceticism is the trifling of an enthusiast with his power, a puerile cocketing with his selfishness or his vanity, in the absence of any sufficiently great object to employ the first or overcome the last. Or since I am speaking to an artist, and must illustrate and not define the Cristo della Moneta, of Titian at Dresden is an ascetic. The Er ist vollbracht of Albert Dürer at Nuremberg is a Christ, he whom we call an example, though little we make of it. For our church has daubed that tender, beautiful image with coarse, bloody colors till it looks like the sign of a roadside inn and another has mysticized him out of all human reach, till he is the god and god is the devil. But are we not really to do as Christ did? And when he said, the son of man, did he not mean the sons of men? He was no ascetic. But shall I tell you what made you write to me? I have no second sight. I do not see visions nor dream dreams. It was my sister. Or rather, I will tell you that I have second sight. I have been greatly harassed by seeing my poor owl lately, without her head, without her life, without her talons, lying in the cage of your canary, like the statue of Ramses the Second, in the pool at Memphis, and the little villain pecking at her. Now that's me. I am lying without my head, without my claws, and you all peck at me. It is de rigueur de obligation, like the saying something to one's hat, when one goes into church, to say to me all that has been said to me a hundred and ten times a day during the last three months. It is the obligato on the violin, and the twelve violins all practice it together like the clock striking twelve o'clock at night all over London, till I say, like Xavier de Maistre, Azez, je la sais, je ne la sais que trop. I am not a penitent, but you are like the R.C. confessor, who says what is de rigueur, what is in his formulary to say, and never comes to the life of the thing, the root of the matter. Dr. Sutherland to Miss Nightingale, Highgate, September 7th. What can I say, my dear friend, to your long scold of a letter? You are decidedly wrong in passing yourself off for a dead owl, 
and in thinking that I have joined with other equally charitable people in pecking at you. It is I that have got all the pecking, although I hope that I am neither an owl nor dead, and your little beak is one of the sharpest. But like a good live hero, I bear it all joyfully because it is got in doing my duty to you. I want you to live, I want you to work. You want to work and die, and that is not at all fair. I admire your heroism and self-devotion with all my heart, but alas, I cannot forget that it is all within the compass of a weak, perishing body, and am I to encourage you to wear yourself in the vain attempt to beat not only men, but time? You little know what daily anxiety it has cost me to see you dying by inches in doing work fit only for the strongest constitution. Dr. Sutherland urged her to take, at any rate, a week's complete rest, but she would not. Her cause was her life, and she could not for the sake of life lose what alone made life worth living. While they were delaying, the soldiers were dying. Her work would not wait. She begged him to come down to Malvern and work with her in order that they might have everything ready to put before Mr. Herbert in London by the time he returned from his fishing. Dr. Sutherland wrote pretty excuses. Mrs. Sutherland made counter-suggestions. Why should not Miss Nightingale stay on at Malvern altogether? Would not Mr. Herbert, she wrote, September 11th, go to you for a few days, settle all the points, and then communicate daily by letter? You have so much tact that you would be able to maintain your influence. Do think, if this be possible. It is quite against my own interest to desire it, for if you come to London I may get a glimpse of your dear face. But Miss Nightingale persisted, and Dr. Sutherland surrendered. He went down to Malvern, was himself ill there, and Miss Nightingale reported progress of the sick baby to his wife. But the two invalids, we may be sure, talked of other things than their ailments. 3. So little was Miss Nightingale in a mood to succumb to her physical weakness that she had offered to go out to India, where her friend Lady Canning was at the Viceroy's side during the mutiny. "'Miss Nightingale has written to me,' wrote Lady Canning to her mother, November 14th. "'She is out of health and at Malvern, but she says she would come at twenty-four hours' notice if I think there is anything for her to do in her line of business.' I think there is not anything here, for there are few wounded men in want of actual nursing, and there are plenty of native servants and assistants who can do the dressings. Only one man, who was very ill of dysentery, has died since we went to the hospital a fortnight ago. The up-country hospitals are too scattered for a nursing establishment, and one could hardly yet send women up. Miss Nightingale was very serious in the offer, for she had made it twice, first through Mr. Herbert, and then in a personal letter carried by her cousin, Major Nicholson, who had been ordered to India at this time. She thought of herself as a soldier in the ranks, and, absorbed intently though she was in her work for the army at home, she would have considered active service in the field a superior call. Had the Viceroy felt the need of accepting Miss Nightingale's offer, it is possible that her power of will and the excitement of activity might have carried her through the ordeal, but she had barely strength for the work on which she was already engaged. Of her daily life during this period, at Malvern and in London successively, her sister's letters give a vivid description. Lady Verney to Madame Mole, September 1857. The accounts of Eth have been very anxious, and May says she does not sleep above two hours in the night, and continues most feverish and feeble, and cannot eat. She never left that room where you saw her, was scarcely off her sofa for a month. Now she goes down for half an hour into a parlor to do business with the commissioner who has been there to see her. Aunt May says it throws her back more to put off work for the cause she lives for than to do a little every day, so we reconcile ourselves. Tuesday, she says, was a very uneasy day, and F. said she felt as she had done when recovering from the fever at Balaclava. Still both doctors say there is no disease, that it is only entire exhaustion of every organ from overwork, and that rest will alone restore her. Rest for much longer than she will give herself, I fear. She has two packs a day. This is all the water curing. It seems to bring down the pulse, and she lies at the open window the chief part of the day, not reading or writing, only just still. She cannot be better anywhere. No one can get at her. 
Aunt May is a dragon, and the commissioner is the only person who has seen her. Aunt M says, I cannot disguise to myself that she is in a very precarious state. Lady Verney to M. Mole, December 5th, 1857. Aunt May's bulletin is generally the same. Mr. Herbert for three hours in the morning, Dr. Sutherland for four hours in the afternoon, Dr. Balfour, Dr. Farr, Dr. Alexander interspersed. They are drawing up the new regulations, but this you must not tell. F. is as nervous of being known to have anything to do with it as other people are of getting honor. Dr. Sutherland burst out to Aunt May the other day that F.'s clearness and strength of mind, her extraordinary powers, her grasp of intellect and benevolence of heart struck him more and more as he worked with her, that no one who did not see her proved and tried as he did could conceive the extent of both. The most gifted of God's creatures, he called her, and the determined way in which she will not let any one know what she is about is so curious. She will not even tell us, we only hear it from these men. She is killing herself with work, which they all say no one else can do, no one else has the threads of it or the perseverance for it, and yet no one will ever know it. Others will have all the credit of the very things she suggested and introduced, at the cost, one may say, of life and comfort of all kinds, for it is an intolerable life she is leading, lying down between whiles to enable her just to go on, not seeing her nearest and dearest, because with her breath so hurried, all talking must be spared except what is necessary, and all excitement that she may devote every energy to the work. And May says again today how Mr. Herbert is in sometimes twice a day, and Dr. Sutherland the whole day, but please don't tell anyone. Because she alone can give facts which no one else hardly possesses, because she knows the bearings of the whole which no one else has followed, has both the smallest details at her fingers' ends and the great general views of the whole, what is to be gained and what avoided. While Miss Nightingale was lying ill at Malvern, she was being courted in counterfeit at Manchester. Her parents and sister were visiting Manchester to see the Art Treasures exhibition, and the newspapers had included Florence in the party. The sightseers, wrote Lady Verney, took Lady Newport, a very sweet-looking woman in black, for Florence, and treated her like a saint in the Middle Ages. Let me touch your shawl only, they said, as they crowded around, or let me stroke your arm. Mrs. Gaskell told me we could have no idea how deep the feeling is for you in the hearts of the people. The feeling would perhaps have been yet deeper if the people had known the work which Miss Nightingale was still doing, and the delicate health from which she was suffering. At the end of 1857, she thought that death might overtake her in the middle of her work with Sidney Herbert, and she wrote this letter to him, to be sent when I am dead. 30. Old Burlington Street, November 26, 1857. Dear Mr. Herbert, 1. I hope you will not regret the manner of my death. I know that you will be kind enough to regret the fact of it. You have sometimes said that you were sorry you had employed me. I assure you that it has kept me alive. I am not sorry to stay alive to do the nurses, but I can't help it. Lord, here I am, send me, has always been religion to me. I must be willing to go now as I was to go to the east. You know, I always thought it the greatest of your kindnesses sending me there. Perhaps he wants a sanitary officer now for my Crimeans in some other world where they are gone. Two, I have no fears for the army now. You have always been our Cid, the true chivalrous sort, which is to be the defender of what is weak and ugly and dirty and undefended, rather than of what is beautiful and artistic. You are so now, more than ever, for us. Us means, in my language, the troops and me. 3. I hope you will have no chivalrous ideas about what is due to my memory. The only thing that can be due to me is what is good for the troops. I always thought thus while I was alive, and I am not likely to think otherwise now that I am dead. Whatever your own judgment has accepted from me will come with far greater force from yourself. Whatever your own judgment has rejected would come with no force at all. 4. What remains to be done has, however, already been sanctioned by your judgment. First, as to Army Medical Council, Army Medical School, General Hospital Scheme, Gymnastics. Second, as to what Dr. Sutherland must needs do for the sanitary branch, 
and third as to colonial barracks canadian mediterranean west and east indian five i am very sorry about the nursing scheme it seems like leaving it in the lurch mrs shaw stewart is the only woman i know who will do for superintendent of army nurses believe me ever while i can say god bless you yours gratefully f nightingale then she asked her uncle to assist in her making a will she was anxious about the nightingale fund the management of which she had not yet been able to devote attention she proposed to leave it to st thomas's hospital the property to which she would ultimately be entitled upon the death of her father and mother she proposed to apply to the building of a model barrack according to her ideas that is with day rooms for the men separate places to sleep in like jeb's asylum at fulham lavatories gymnastic places reading rooms etc not forgetting the wives but having a kind of model lodging house for the married men in a letter of instructions to her uncle she named sir john mcneil mr herbert and dr sutherland as the men who would best carry out such a plan she included a few family bequests but what was nearest to her heart at this time was to leave personal keepsakes to mrs herbert and other friends who had worked for her long and faithfully for this purpose in order that there might be no question about possession she begged her sister to send up to london from embley various goods and chattels which had personal associations with herself and she had one other wish it related to her children the associations with our men she wrote to her sister december eleventh amount to me what i never should have expected to feel a superstition which makes me wish to be buried in the crimea absurd as i know it to be for they are not there end of part three chapter three enforcing a report part three chapter four of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by amelia chesley the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook section three chapter four reaping the fruit eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty with aching hands and bleeding feet we dig and heap lay stone on stone we bear the burden and the heat of the long day and wished were done not till the long hours of light return all we have built do we discern matthew arnold you must now feel wrote sir john mcneil to miss nightingale may thirteenth eighteen fifty eight when her work for the health of the british soldier at home was beginning to bear fruit that you have not labored in vain that you have made your talent ten talents that to you more than to any other man or woman alive will henceforth be due the welfare and efficiency of the british army napoleon said that in military affairs the moral are to the physical forces as four to one but you have shown that he greatly underrated their value the rapidity with which you have obtained unanimous consent to your principles much exceeds my expectations I never dared to doubt that truth and justice and mercy would prevail, but I did not hope to live long enough to see their triumph when we first communed here of such things. I thank God that I have lived to see your success. Sir John's thanksgiving was caused by the tone and the result of a debate which had taken place in the House of Commons upon May 11th, 1858. Lord Ebrington, prompted by Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale, had moved a series of resolutions with regard to the health of the army, founded upon the report of the Royal Commission. He had laid special stress upon the figures, due to Miss Nightingale's insight and industry, comparing the mortality in the army in, and in civil life, respectively. He called attention to the horrible state of the barracks, and his resolutions concluded thus, that in the opinion of this house, improvements are impermittively called for, not less by good policy and true economy than by justice and humanity. The government accepted the resolutions, and Miss Nightingale's campaign had thus obtained the unanimous approval of the House of Commons. 
she had worked indefatigably and through many channels and she continued so to work in order to focus and stimulate public opinion in the sense of lord embrickton's resolutions by the end of eighteen fifty seven the sub-commissions on army medical reform were making good progress and the report of the royal commission was about to be published she devised an effective means of forcing its salient feature upon the attention of every person most concerned in the evils or most influential towards securing the necessary remedies i have referred already to her diagrams illustrative of the mortality in the british army as finally prepared with dr farr's assistance they showed most effectively at a glance by means of shaded or colored squares circles and wedges the deaths due to preventable causes in the hospitals during the crimean war and the rate of mortality in the british army at home our soldiers enlist as she put it to death in the barracks she now wrote a memorandum explaining the diagrams and pointing their moral and had two thousand copies printed this anonymous publication entitled mortality of the british army is called in her correspondence coxcombs primarily from the shape and colors of her diagrams she had proposed and mr herbert agreed that the memorandum and diagrams should be included as an appendix in his report in order that her pamphlet might appear as reprinted from the report of the royal commission and thus be given the greater authority so as soon as the report was issued she distributed her coxcombs to the queen and other members of the royal family to ministers to leading members of both houses of parliament and to medical and commanding officers throughout the country in india and in the colonies she had a few copies of the diagrams glazed and framed and three of these she sent to the war office the horse guards and the army medical department i do not know whether these departments hung up the present it is our flank march upon the enemy she wrote in sending an early copy to sir john mcneill and we might give it the old name of god's revenge upon murder the report of the royal commission appeared at the beginning of february eighteen fifty eight and the secretary sent one of the earliest copies to miss nightingale i like him very much she replied february fifth i think he looks very handsome lady tullock says i make my pillow of blue books it certainly has been the case with this she did not sleep over it however she was immediately up and doing among her papers there is a curious collection of letters and memoranda partly in her handwriting partly in that of mr and mrs herbert showing how industriously they set to work to pull wires in the press the monthly and quarterly reviews were in those days deemed of great importance in influencing public opinion and miss nightingale drew up and sent for mr herbert's criticism a list of the principal among them entering against each magazine or review the name of the writer whom she designated as the ideal contributor of an article upon the report they had as much trouble in adjusting the parts as a theatrical manager finds in settling his cast lord stanley for example promised to write but he was particular about his place of appearance it must be the westminster review or nowhere and miss nottingale had already allotted that place to the principal star mr herbert himself and moreover the managers in this instance were drawing up a cast for other people's houses and the editors did not in all cases prove amenable mr elwyn the editor of the quarterly rejected the article submitted to him but mr reeve of the edinburgh was an old friend of miss nightingale and he accepted her nominee though he displeased her by mangling the article in the ministerial interest however in the dailies the monthlies and the quarterlies the report had on the whole a good press and what is no less important for influencing public opinion a prompt press two these things had hardly been arranged when there was a political crisis and this involved miss nightingale and her allies in additional work lord palmerston's government was defeated on the conspiracy bill and resigned lord derby came in february twenty fifth with general peel as secretary for war here then we say good-bye for the present to the bison he had been dilatory to the last mr herbert had hoped to see the army medical school established in january and had written to Miss Nightingale to nominate suitable men for the various chairs. Not, he added despairingly, that Panmure would appoint any one, even if the angel Gabriel had offered himself, St. Michael and all angels, to fill the different chairs. He is very slow to move. Miss Nightingale took formal leave of Lord Panmure later in the year, in sending him a copy of one of her books. "'You shock me,' he replied from the Highlands in November. 
by telling me I once called you a turbulent fellow. Had anyone else said so, I should have denied it, but I must have been vilely rude. Accept my apology now, and to bribe you to do so, I send you a box of grouse. Mr. Herbert at first cherished high hopes of Lord Panmure's successor. Miss Nightingale and Mr. Herbert were particularly anxious upon a personal point. The Army Medical Department had not yet been reformed, and it was known that Sir Andrew Smith would shortly retire. By seniority, Sir John Hall would have claims to the post, and his appointment would, the Allies considered, be disastrous to the cause of reform. It would be useless, they felt, to frame new regulations without an infusion of new blood. This, therefore, was the first point on which representations were made to Lord Panmure's successor. I have seen General Peel, wrote Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale, February 27th, and he promised to make no appointment nor take any step in regard to the medical department or sanitary measures till he has conferred with me. I think Peel may do well if we can put him well in possession of the case. General Peel duly did what they wanted on this personal issue. I hope we may assume, wrote Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale, May 25th, that Smith is really gone. It is no use trying to realize the enormous importance of such a fact. They must now, he continued, fix the appointment of Alexander. Three days later he wrote to Dr. Sutherland, Please tell Miss N. that I warned Peel against the expected recommendation of Sir J. Hall, and he will, I think, be prepared to turn a deaf ear to it. I wrote yesterday to him on another subject and threw in some praise of Alexander. Such is the gentle art of influencing ministers. On June 11th, Dr. T. Alexander was appointed to succeed Sir Andrew Smith. Dr. Alexander unhappily died suddenly at the beginning of 1860. But it was a great thing for the reformers, at a time when the Army Medical Department was being recast, to have one of themselves at the head of it instead of a supporter of the ancient regime. I cannot say, wrote Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale, September 16th, 1858, how glad I am to have your account of Alexander. Everything in futuro must depend on him. You cannot maintain a commission sitting permanently in terrorem over a director general, and Alexander seems able and willing to be his own commission. So the Allies had done at least one good stroke of business with General Peel. Another of the new ministers, Lord Stanley, the colonial secretary, was also helpful. He will send the coxcombs out to the colonial governors, wrote Mr. Herbert, March 16th. He offered any service his position can enable him to give to assist our cause, and suggests that a commission should inspect colonial barracks, and he proposes to discuss the matter with you. Presently, however, Lord Stanley was moved from the colonial to the India office, where Miss Nightingale enlisted his interest in another sanitary campaign, which was thenceforward to fill a large space in her working life, as will appear in a later part. So then, the new government seemed promising— but it soon began to appear that at the war office the cobwebs were beyond the power of the new broom to sweep away. Some reforms were carried out, but the permanent officials were as obstructive under General Peel as under Lord Panmure. These war office subs, wrote Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale, June 29th, are intolerable. Half a dozen fellows sitting down to compose minutes just for the fun of the thing on a subject which they cannot possibly know anything about. Peel ought not to let these subs interfere, spoil and delay as they do. That office wants a thorough recasting, but I doubt whether Peel is the man to do it. He has a clear head and good sense, but I think he is overpowered by the amount of work which Panmure, by the simple process of never attempting to do it, found so easy. But alike amid hope and care, amid fear and anger, Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale worked away at their reforms unceasingly. Throughout the year 1858, she was in a very weak state of health. She divided her time, as before, between Malvern and Old Burlington Street, traveling backwards and forwards in an invalid carriage, and escorted by Mr. Clough, now sworn to her service. Her aunt, Mrs. Smith, was still in frequent attendance upon her. Her father was with her for a while at Malvern, and, like everyone else, enjoined the desirability of rest. Well, my dear child, he wrote afterwards from Lee Hurst, September 25th. It's no small matter to see your handwriting again, and to make believe that you are a good deal more than half alive. But the worst of it is that there's no depending upon you for any persistence in curing yourself, while you have so many others to cure. I often wonder how it is that you, who care so little for your own life, 
should have such wonderful love for the lives of others. She seldom saw her mother and sister. In June 1858, her sister married. Thank you very much, wrote Miss Nightingale to Lady McNeil, July 17th for your congratulations on my sister's marriage, which took place last month. She likes it, which is the main thing. And my father is very fond of Sir Harry Verney, which is the next best thing. He is old and rich, which is a disadvantage. He is active and has a will of his own, and four children ready-made, which is an advantage. Unmarried life, at least in our class, takes everything and gives nothing back to this poor earth. It runs no risk, it gives no pledge to life, so, on the whole, I think these reflections tend to approbation. For herself, she thinks, wrote her aunt, that each day may be the last on which she will have power to work. And her ally, Mr. Herbert, was also feeling the strain. He had all the four subcommissions at work, and from time to time during the year, 1858, he broke down, on one occasion under a sharp attack of pleurisy. It was now Miss Nightingale's turn to lecture him, she wrote to Mrs. Herbert, begging her not to let Sidney call. "'I really am not ill,' he wrote, March 18th, "'only washy and weak, while I always recover wonderfully, "'and paying you a visit to-morrow will do me no harm but the contrary.' She wrote to Mr. Herbert himself, suggesting a cure at Malvern. "'I should like to come,' he said, September 16th, "'and look at the place which I have a notion I shall some day go to, "'and see you episodically, unless you would rather not be seen.' but I do not think that either of the allies expected or desired the other to take the advice which they interchanged. Well or ill, each of them worked unrestingly. 3. Upon the matter of barracks, Mr. Herbert did the harder work. He inspected barracks and hospitals throughout the kingdom. He wrote or revised each report upon them. But he, or Dr. Sutherland, or Captain Galton, or all of them, reported the results of each inspection to their chief, as they sometimes called her, and she was unfailing in suggestions and criticisms. When the London barracks were being overhauled, for General Peel had obtained a substantial grant from the Treasury for immediate improvements, the woman's touch came into play. She called into counsel her Crimean colleague, Mr. Sawyer, and took the improvement of the kitchens in hand. The work was only just begun when Mr. Sawyer died suddenly. His death, she wrote to Captain Galton, August 28th, is a great disaster. Others have studied cookery for the purposes of gourmandizing, some for show, but none but he for the purpose of cooking large quantities of food in the most nutritious manner for great numbers of men. He has no successor. My only comfort is that you were imbued before his death with his doctrines, and that the Barracks Commission will now take up the matter for itself. In the work of the other three sub-commissions, Miss Nightingale had a large share. Mr. Herbert, Dr. Sutherland, Dr. Farr, statistics, were in constant consultation with her, personally or by correspondence. There are hundreds of letters to her at this period, full of technical detail. I give in, writes Mr. Herbert. Your arguments are not to be answered. I want your help very much. I send a disagreeable letter I have received from Sir J. Hall. I will call on you tomorrow and talk it over. I send you a copy of the instructions. I want help and advice. At every stage of each transaction, the Allies were in close cooperation. The correspondence with Dr. Sutherland is sometimes in a lighter vein, and Mrs. Sutherland's letters to Miss Nightingale are deeply affectionate. But the doctor, who was not always very businesslike, sometimes tried the patience of the exacting lady-in-chief. Her aunt records a day when a tiff with Dr. Sutherland caused her niece a serious attack of palpitation of the heart. Mr. Herbert was ill at the time, and was waiting for a draft, which Dr. Sutherland was to prepare for submission to the Secretary of State. Miss Nightingale was requested to put pressure upon the doctor. At last the draft came, and Mr. Herbert did not like it. He begged Miss Nightingale to use her influence in obtaining some revisions. Dr. Sutherland did not take this move kindly, and declined to call upon her. The quarrel, however, was speedily composed. At a later date, Miss Nightingale spent some weeks in the house of William and Mary Howitt at Highgate, it is not a mere phase, wrote Mary Howitt, when I say that we shall feel as if she had but left a blessing behind. I suspect that this visit was in order to enable Miss Nightingale to keep a firmer touch upon the big baby, as she and Mrs. Sutherland sometimes called the doctor. This is the first day of grouse shooting, Caratina, wrote he, 
when the barracks commissioners were in the north. But as you will allow none of your wives to go to the moors, the festival has passed off without observance. Thus, then, the reformers worked during 1858. Their main labors were interrupted in the middle of the year by the last fight over the Netley Hospital. Lord Panmure had gone ahead with the building in spite of Miss Nightingale's objections and of her conversion of Lord Palmerston to her views. But since then, the report of the Royal Commission had appeared. The hospitals and barracks subcommission had presented an interim report against Netley, and there was a new Secretary of State. Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale made a hard fight, and she wrote a series of newspaper articles in the hope of stirring up public opinion. But General Peel was actuated by the same motives that governed Lord Panmure. He appointed another committee to report on the adverse report, and proceeded with the building. Unhappily, the country which has led the van in sanitary science, says an impartial authority, has as its chief military hospital a building far from satisfactory. Miss Nightingale's final defeat on this particular issue suggested to her the importance of instructing public opinion upon the whole question of hospital construction. She accordingly contributed two papers on the subject to the Social Science Congress at Liverpool in October 1858. Her friend, Dr. Farr, who was present, reported the marked attention which the reading of the papers attracted, and at the request of Lord Shaftesbury, the president of the Congress, Miss Nightingale presented her manuscript to the city of Liverpool as a memento of the occasion. These papers were the germ of her famous Notes on Hospitals, to which we shall come in the next part of this memoir. 4. On the main issue of army medical reform, Miss Nightingale sought to influence public opinion by the distribution, among carefully selected persons, of her notes on matters affecting the health, efficiency, and hospital administration of the British Army. The notes were written, and for the most part printed, in the preceding year, and I have already described them. The distribution of them at this time brought her letters of encouragement from many of the most illustrious and influential personages in the land. The Prince Consort, in an autograph letter of thanks, took occasion to assure her once more of the Queen's high appreciation of her services. The Princess Royal, then Crown Princess of Prussia, begged for a copy, and Miss Nightingale, in reply, November 9th, asked Sir James Clark to express for her how very gratifying the Princess Royal's kind message was. I cannot tell you the deep interest I feel in that young heart so full of all that is true and good, or with what pleasure I anticipate the benefit to her country and ours from her being what she is. These two women, between whom there were many points of sympathy, were often to correspond and to meet in later years. The Duke of Cambridge, in a particularly cordial letter, assured Miss Nightingale that the whole army is most sensible of the devotion with which you may be said to have sacrificed yourself to its work, on a recent memorable occasion, and I cannot but add my personal admiration of your noble conduct on that as on all other occasions. The Duke added the hope that from time to time he might have it in his power to carry out her valuable suggestions for the comfort and welfare of the troops. Miss Nightingale often trounced the commander-in-chief in her correspondence. He had so little sympathy with any radical reform that she could not consider his popular title of the soldier's friend to be really well deserved. Yet she had a certain fondness for him, and was alive to his better qualities. She had seen him first during the Crimean War, and she recalled a characteristic incident. What makes George popular, she wrote, is this kind of thing. In going around the Scutari hospitals at their worst time with me, he recognized a sergeant of the guards. He has a royal memory, always a great passport to popularity who had had at least one-third of his body shot away, and said to him with a great oath, calling him by his Christian and surname, Aren't you dead yet? The man said to me afterwards, Safian o his royal highness, wasn't it, mum? With tears in his eyes. George's manner is very popular. His oaths are popular with the army, and he is certainly the best man both of business and of nature at the horse guards. That even I admit and there is no man I should like to see in his place. Miss Nightingale was careful to send copies of her notes to those who by their pens could influence public opinion. Among these was Harriet Martineau, who, to whom Miss Nightingale wrote November 30th. The report is in no sense public property. 
I have a great horror of its being made use of after my death by women's missionaries and those kinds of people. I am brutally indifferent to the wrongs or the rights of my sex, and I should have been equally so to any controversy as to whether women ought to or ought not to do what I have done for the army. Though a woman, having the opportunity and not doing it, I ought, I think, to be burnt alive. Miss Martineau, promising to be discreet, asked if she might make use of Miss Nightingale's facts and suggestions. The offer was promptly accepted, and Miss Martineau was supplied with copious powder and shot. Miss Nightingale was probably the more attracted by Miss Martineau's offer to popularize her notes, owing to a very earnest letter from Dean Millman. He had read the notes, with serious attention and profound interest, and asked, December 18th, Is all this important knowledge, this strong practical good sense, this result of much toil, thought, experience, to be confined to half-averted official ears, to be forced only on the reluctant attention of a few, and most of these too busy and perhaps too opinionated to profit by it? Is it to be buried in that most undisturbed grave of wise thought and useful information, a blue book? That most repulsive, unapproached, unapproachable place of sepulture? Surely you have not lived and labored your life of devotion, your labor of love, to leave public opinion untouched and unenlightened, but by what may creep out as the general result of your views, or what may be adopted by government, perhaps imperfectly and parsimoniously? Are the many, who alone by the expression of their judgment and feelings, can keep the few up to their work, and encourage them by their approval and cooperation to remain ignorant of what is of such vital import to the army, to the country, to mankind? A series of articles by Miss Martineau in the Daily News, and afterwards a popular volume, carried Miss Nightingale's suggestions at second hand into a large circle. Between these two women there was marked attraction. The correspondence about the illness and death of Miss Martineau's niece and her reliance upon Miss Nightingale's sympathy are particularly touching. Each of them had sorrows, each was seriously ill, and each alike at once turned to her public work. At the end of 1858, Miss Nightingale put out one of the most effective of her controversial pieces. Her facts and figures about the mortality of the army in the East, as printed in her notes and in the Royal Commission's report, had not passed unchallenged and a pamphlet had appeared calling them in question. Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale suspected in it the hand of Sir John Hall, and she immediately prepared a reply. This is entitled, A Contribution to the Sanitary History of the British Army During the Late War with Russia. It was published early in 1859, anonymously, but all her friends detected her Roman hand. The pamphlet which provoked it is dismissed in a contemptuous footnote, an obscure pamphlet circulated without a printer's name reproduces nearly every possible statistical blunder on this and other points. It purports to be a defense of the defunct army medical department by a non-commissioner, but it is more like a jeu d'esprit. The answer contained in the body of Miss Nightingale's brochure is conclusive, and the coxcombs were repeated in yet more telling and attractive form than before. It is the most concise, the most scathing, and the most eloquent of all her accounts of the preventable mortality which she had witnessed in the East. In a few truthful words, wrote Sir John McNeill, in acknowledging an early copy, December 26th, you have told the whole dreadful story, and I do not think that we shall hear any more controversial medical statistics. Facts are chills that win a ding and down a be disputed. So sang Burns, and he was seldom mistaken in his opinions. I have read every word of the contribution, and pondered every column and diagram, and I come to the conclusion that it is complete and unanswerable, but that it would be disparaging to such a work to regard it as controversial. I wish with all my heart that every young officer in the British Army had a copy of it. The old I have little hope of. Miss Nightingale's mastery of the art of marshalling facts to logical conclusions was recognized by her election in 1858 as a member of the Statistical Society. End of Part 3, Chapter 4, Reaping the Fruit, Part 1
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part 3, Chapter 4, Reaping the Fruit, Continued. 5. The new year, 1859, brought an event of great importance to the cause of army reform. In March, Lord Derby's stopgap government was defeated on Mr. Disraeli's reform bill, and after a general election, Lord Palmerston returned to power. Mr. Sidney Herbert, who for some years had been working at army reform as an outsider, now became secretary for war. I must send you a line, he wrote to Miss Nightingale, June 13th, to tell you that I have undertaken the Ministry of War. I have undertaken it because, in certain branches of administration, I believe that I can be of use, but I do not disguise from myself the severity of the task nor the probability of my proving unequal to it. But I know that you will be pleased to hear of my being there. I will try to ride down to you tomorrow afternoon. God bless you. Mr. Herbert's task was not rendered less severe by the appointment of Mr. Gladstone as Chancellor of the Exchequer. They were close and affectionate friends, but public economy was with Mr. Gladstone the greater friend. Much of Mr. Herbert's strength was exhausted in disputes with the Chancellor of the Exchequer over the question of the national defenses. Mrs. Herbert sent to Miss Nightingale the current riddle. Why is Gladstone like a lobster? Because he is so good, but he disagrees with everybody. Mr. Herbert could by no means always count upon the Treasury for consent in all his schemes for improving the sanitary and moral condition of the army. Still, he was able, as Secretary of State, to accomplish a great deal, and will be convenient here, with some slight anticipation, in certain cases of chronological order, to summarize shortly the fruits of the long collaboration between Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale for the health of the British soldier. She herself wrote such a summary in 1861, in a paper to which reference has been made already. And I often use her own words. The Barracks and Hospitals Improvement Commission had already done a good deal when he came into office, and he continued the work. Buildings were ventilated and warmed, drainage was introduced or improved, the water supply was extended, the kitchens were remodeled, gas was introduced in place of the couple of dips, by the light of which it was impossible for the men to read or pursue any occupation except smoking. Structural improvements were made in many cases, and Mr. Herbert, so far as he could extract money from the Treasury, reconstructed buildings which had been condemned by his commission. This policy was abandoned for many years after his death, and later generations heard in consequence of sanitary scandals in barracks at Windsor and Dublin and elsewhere. The general report of the Barracks and Hospitals Commission, dated April 1861, was presented to Parliament in that year, and many of Miss Nightingale's friends on reading it referred to it as her book. They were not far wrong, for much of the report, and especially the long section dealing with the proper principles of hospital and barrack construction, was in large measure her work. Miss Nightingale, in order to ensure that such principles should be better understood and carried out in the future, induced Mr. Herbert to appoint a special barracks works committee, to report as to measures to simplify and improve the system under which all works and buildings, other than fortifications, are constructed, repaired, and maintained in order to give a more direct responsibility to the persons employed in those duties. Of this committee, Captain Galton was a member, and the draft report was submitted to Miss Nightingale for criticism and suggestion. There are many causes to which the improved health of the Army in our own time may be attributed, but the chief of them has probably been the improvement of barrack accommodation, and for this the name of Florence Nightingale deserves to be held in grateful remembrance by the army and by the nation. As a supplement to the improvements in barrack kitchens, Mr. Herbert introduced a reform in the direction which Miss Nightingale had pressed upon Lord Panmure's attention. He established a school of practical cookery at Aldershot for the training of regimental and hospital cooks in the art of giving men a wholesome meal. Miss Nightingale had been painfully impressed in the Crimea by the importance of this reform. The second sub-commission was charged with the duty of reorganizing the Army medical statistics. This was one of the requirements of rational reform which had most forcibly struck Miss Nightingale in the East. 
the emphasis which she laid upon this side of her experience, the persistence with which she pressed the matter, the statistical skill with which she showed the way to a better system, are amongst the most valuable of her services to the cause of army reform. When the suggestions of the subcommission were carried out, the British army statistics became the best and most useful then obtainable in Europe. The third subcommission was to carry out another of Miss Nightingale's favorite ideas, the establishment of an army medical school. There were here the most wearisome delays and obstructions, and it was not until Mr. Herbert himself became Secretary of State that he was able to give effect to his subcommission's report. And even then, as soon as the minister's personal oversight was averted, the war office subs set to work to defeat their chief. Mr. Herbert had appointed the staff in 1859, but it was not till September 1860 that the first students arrived at Fort Pitt, Chatham. They promptly came to the conclusion that the school was a hoax. As well they might, for the school was without fittings or instruments of any kind. The explanation, which may be read elsewhere, is remarkable even in the annals of departmental muddles. There was apparently no method known to the red tape of the routine men whereby the school could be fitted, and it might have remained empty indefinitely, but that a trenchant letter from Miss Nightingale secured the personal intervention of the Secretary of State. There, at last, wrote Mr. Herbert to her, in forwarding the official order at the end of its long travels through departments and sub-departments. The Army Medical School was peculiarly Miss Nightingale's child, and she watched over its early stages with constant solicitude. Mr. Herbert had commissioned her, in consultation with Sir James Clark, to make the regulations. She had the nomination of the professors. For the chair of hygiene, she nominated Dr. E. A. Parks, whose acquaintance she had made during the Crimean War. It would be difficult to exaggerate the services which the stimulating teaching of this great sanitarian rendered to the cause of military hygiene. He had much correspondence with Miss Nightingale in connection with the syllabus of his first course of lectures. In every administrative difficulty, the professors went to her for help. The correspondence between her and Dr. Aitken is especially voluminous. She had made a successful fight against much opposition to have pathology included in the professoriate, and Dr. Aitken was ultimately appointed to the chair. He it was who set Miss Nightingale in motion about the fittings of the school. He often asked her to give us another push. Kind thanks, he wrote, March 1861, when a further hitch had arisen, for placing our train on the proper line. Her intervention at headquarters was necessary even to extract pay for the professors. I have just received an intimation from the war office, Dr. Aitken wrote to her August 7th, 1860, that Sir John Kirkland has been authorized to issue my pay, so I presume the numerous officials concerned have been able to satisfy each other that I am in existence. The at once in this instance is equal to six days, an activity I am inclined to believe is due to your exertions on Sunday. Sunday was the day of the week on which, if on no other, she always saw Mr. Herbert. Dr. Aitken was sarcastic, and not without cause, about the circumlocution office, but it is possible that the fault was not always on only one side. Professors are said to be sometimes children in matters of business, and on one tale of woe addressed to Miss Nightingale, the docket, in Dr. Sutherland's handwriting, but doubtless at her dictation, is this. I hope the present difficulty has been got over, but it will be well to bear in mind that the school is so nearly connected with the administrative part of the war office that all your future proceedings, whether by minute or otherwise, should be concise and practical. The school survived the perils of its infancy and introduced a most beneficent reform by affording means of instruction in military hygiene and practice to candidates for the Army Medical Service. Formerly, as Miss Nightingale wrote, Young men were sent to attend sick and wounded soldiers who perhaps had never dressed a serious wound or never attended a bedside except in the midst of a crowd of students following in the wake of some eminent lecturer who certainly had never been instructed in the most ordinary sanitary knowledge, although one of their most important functions was hereafter to be the prevention of disease in climates and under circumstances where prevention is everything and medical treatment often little or nothing. Miss Nightingale's services as the true founder of the school were publicly acknowledged at the time. 
Dr. Longmore, the professor of military surgery, told the students that it was she whose opinion, derived from large experience and remarkable sagacity in observation, exerted an especial influence over originating and establishing this school. In the Army Medical School just instituted, wrote Sir James Clark, hygiene will form the most important branch of the young medical officer's instruction. For originating this school, we have to thank Miss Nightingale, who had her long and persevering efforts effected no other improvement in the Army, would have conferred by this alone an inestimable boon upon the British soldier. The school was afterwards moved to Netley. It is now in London, is one of the medical schools in the university, and is placed in convenient proximity to a military hospital. The Tate Gallery on the embankment at Millbank stands between two buildings which are of peculiar interest to anyone concerned in the life and work of Florence Nightingale. To the east of the gallery is the Royal Alexandra Hospital, a general military hospital for the London district. It is built, of course, on the pavilion plan, and in every other respect conforms to Miss Nightingale's ideas of what a hospital should be, with many additions to its resources, which the progress of science has suggested since her day. A complete apparatus for X-ray treatment, capable of being packed into five cases for service in the field, is likely to attract the special attention of a visitor. But in connection with Miss Nightingale, there was something else which struck me more. As I went through the surgical wards with the commandant, the smart orderlies, old style, now the trained men of the Army Medical Corps, stood at attention. The colonel entered into conversation with the sergeant of the ward. He was awaiting promotion until he had qualified in the hospital under the matron, sisters, and staff nurses. Promotion in the corps is now dependent on an examination plus a certificate from the nursing authorities. Into how great a thing has the introduction of female nursing for the army, due to Miss Nightingale, grown, and how ironical are some of the time's revenges which the development has brought with it. Originally, the female nurses occupied the lowest place. Sometimes they were little more than superior domestics, often they were amateurs, and their position was always a little nondescript. Now they represent the most highly trained and professional element, and without a certificate from them, no male hospital attendant can win full promotion. And there was another thing that struck me. After a tour of the surgical wards, I inquired about the medical wards, but time was pressing. And you would find little to see there, said the colonel, for the army is so healthy in these days that there are few medical cases. On the west of the Tate Gallery stands another and larger pile of buildings, these are occupied by the Royal Army Medical College, through which every Army medical officer has now to pass both a preliminary and a postgraduate course. Shortly before I visited the college, I had been reading the large mass of Miss Nightingale's papers, which contain her first suggestions for the foundation of the school, with her drafts for its rules and regulations, and which described the struggles and difficulties of its humble infancy. And then I was taken through the noble institution into which it has developed, equipped with large laboratories, which are, I believe, among the best in the country, with smaller laboratories for private research, with a department for those cultures which are said to have done so much to preserve the health of the army in India, with a spacious lecture theater, a fine library, a large museum, and with handsome mess rooms for the comfort and convenience of studious youth. The transition was like a transformation scene in a pantomime, the fairy godmother of the college would have rejoiced to see it. Only one thing seemed to me to be wanting. There are portraits or other memorials of many of the men whose acquaintance we have made in these pages. In the entrance lobby there is a bust of Dr. Thomas Alexander, whose appointment as Director General Miss Nightingale procured. In the smoking room there are portraits of the first professors whom she nominated. I noticed no memorial of the two founders to whom the original institution of the college was due, Sidney Herbert and Florence Nightingale. The last of the four subcommissions, the wiping subcommission, had very varied duties assigned to it, and there was no branch of the reform bill which encountered more stubborn opposition from the permanent officials. One of Mr. Herbert's many letters to Miss Nightingale on the subject speaks of the gross ignorance and darkness beyond all hope of the principal obstructive, who maintained that the idea of a sanitary official was all fudge. Some of the work of this subcommission need not be detailed here. It framed a new Army Medical Officer's Warrant, issued by General Peel in 1858, 
and reorganized the Army Medical Department in 1859. These were useful steps at the time, but there have been so many new warrants and so many war office reorganizations since then that this part of the reforms of Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale belongs in any detail only to ancient history. The case is different with the general work of the Wiping Subcommission. Here also there have been new developments, and some of the forms have been changed, but in substance these have all been built upon the foundations laid in the years 1859 to 1860, to Miss Nightingale primarily, and to her more than to any other individual, is due the recognition of a principle which may seem self-evident at the present time, but which was entirely novel in her day, the principle that the Army Medical Department should care for the soldier's health as well as for his sickness. The subcommission, or to go behind the form to the reality, Miss Nightingale and Mr. Herbert, drew up a code for introducing the sanitary element in the Army, defining the positions of commanding and medical officers and their relative duties regarding the soldier's health, and constituting the regimental surgeon the sanitary advisor of his commanding officer. The same code contained regulations for organizing general hospitals and for improving the administration of regimental hospitals, both in peace and during war. Formerly, general hospitals in the field had to be improvised on no defined principles and on no defined personal responsibility. The wonder is not that they broke down, as they did in all our wars, but that they could be made to stand at all. In all our wars, again, the general hospitals had been signal failures, examples, as during the earlier months at Scutari, of how to kill, not to cure. The general hospital system, devised in the code, including its governor, principal medical officer, captain of orderlies, female nurses, and their superintendent, Mrs. Shaw Stewart, was realized in 1861, in the hospital at Woolwich. There were some other reforms introduced by Mr. Herbert as Secretary of State, which owed their origin to Miss Nightingale's experiences, observation, and suggestions. In January 1861, Mr. Herbert issued a new purveyor's warrant and regulations. Hitherto, the purveying department, like many others, had no well-defined position, duties, or responsibilities. It was efficient or inefficient almost by chance, like other departments, it broke down when tried by war, and all its defects were visited on the sick and wounded men, for whose special benefit it professed to exist. The new code defined with precision the duties of each class of purveying officers, together with their relation to the Army Medical Department. They provided all necessaries and comforts for men in hospital, both in the field and at home, on fixed scales, Instead of requiring sick and wounded men, even in the field, to bring with them into hospital articles for their own use, which they had lost before reaching it. The reader will remember how largely purveying defects entered into Miss Nightingale's difficulties in the East, and a reference to her letters from Scutari will show that Mr. Herbert's code was based on the broad lines of her suggestions. As is hardly surprising, since she drafted the code in consultation with Sir John McDeal. Mr. Herbert also appointed a committee to reorganize the Army Hospital Corps, 1860. In former times, there were no proper attendants on the sick. For regimental hospitals, a steady man was appointed hospital sergeant, and two or three soldiers, fit for nothing else, were sent into the hospital to be under the orders of the medical officer, who, if he were fortunate enough to find one man fit to nurse a patient, was sure to lose him by his being recalled to duty, Sometimes, indeed, men were nominated in rotation over the sick in hospital, as they would mount guard over a store. No special training was considered necessary. No one, except the medical officer, who was helpless, had the least idea that attendance on the sick is as much a special business as medical treatment. Unsuccessful attempts had been made to organize a corps of orderlies unconnected with regiments. The result was most unsatisfactory. Mr. Herbert's committee proposed to constitute a corps, the members of which, for regimental purposes, were to be carefully selected by the commanding and medical officers, specially trained for their duties, and then attached permanently to the regimental hospital. This reform, which owed much to Miss Nightingale's suggestions, was carried into effect shortly after Mr. Herbert's death. Mr. Herbert also took up those questions of the soldier's moral health, in which Miss Nightingale had been a pioneer. In 1861, he appointed a committee to consider how best to provide soldiers' day rooms and institutes in order to counteract the moral evils supposed to be inseparable from garrisons and camps. 
the committee of which Miss Nightingale's friends, Colonel Lefroy, Captain Galton, and Dr. Sutherland were members, showed that the men's barracks can be made more of a home, can be better provided with libraries and reading rooms, that separate rooms can be attached to barracks where men can meet their comrades, sit with them, talk with them, have their newspaper and their coffee, if they want it, play innocent games and write letters, that every barrack, in short, may easily be provided with a kind of soldier's club to which the men can resort when off duty, instead of to the everlasting barrack room or the demoralizing dram shop, and that in large camps or garrisons such as Aldershot and Portsmouth, the men may easily have a club of their own out of barracks. The committee also recommended increased means of occupation in the way of soldiers' workshops, outdoor games and amusements, and rational recreation by lectures and other means. The plan was tried with great success at Gibraltar, Chatham, and Montreal. Mr. Herbert's latest act was to direct an inquiry at Aldershot as to the best means of introducing the system there. Miss Nightingale, in thus summarizing the case, did not state what her correspondence shows to have been the fact, that she had been the prime mover in the appointment of the committee, that, as already related, she had worked hard to obtain a reading room, etc., at Aldershot, and that in the case of Gibraltar the equipment of the room owed much to the gifts from her own private purse, and to the contributions of personal friends, Mrs. Gaskell among them, whom she had interested in the scheme. Here, as in so many other directions, Miss Nightingale's work as a pioneer had been greatly developed, and no modern barrack is deemed complete without its regimental institute, with recreation room, reading room, coffee room, and lecture room, while means of outdoor recreation and shops for various trades are also provided. 6. In recounting Mr. Herbert's reforms, Miss Nightingale brought the results of them, after her usual manner, to the statistical test. She prefixed to her memoir some colored diagrams showing how Mr. Herbert found the army and how he left it. In the three years, 1859, 60, and 61, just one half of the Englishmen who entered the army died, at home stations, per annum, as formerly died. The total mortality at home stations from all diseases had become less than was formerly the mortality from consumption and chest diseases alone. The results of comparisons of British armies in the field were equally striking. The China expedition put the reforms to the test. An expeditionary force was sent to the opposite side of the world into a hostile country notorious for its epidemic diseases. Every required arrangement for the preservation of health was made, with the result that the mortality of this force, including wounded, was little more than 3% per annum, while the constantly sick in hospitals were about the same as at home. During the first months of the Crimean War, the mortality was at the rate of 60%, and the constantly sick in the hospitals were sevenfold those in the war hospitals in China. The improvement in the health of the army has, in peace at any rate, been progressive, in 1857, the annual rate of mortality in the army at home was 17.5 per 1,000. Forty years later, it had fallen to 3.42. In 1911, it was 2.47. Besides all this, Mr. Herbert undertook, in 1859, the chairmanship of the Royal Commission on the Sanitary State of the Indian Army. Other work of his in connection with the army is well known, and some of it, such as his fortification scheme, did not endure, but these matters do not concern us here. His measures for the health and well-being of the soldiers were what Miss Nightingale was interested in, and this joint work of theirs has been of lasting benefit. After Sidney Herbert's death, there was an arrest in reform, but the main lines laid down by him have been followed to our own day. In 1896, a friend in the war office went through Miss Nightingale's memoir of Sidney Herbert for her and noted the present state of things in relation to it. The Army Sanitary Committee was still in existence. The School of Cookery at Aldershot was in the Queen's regulations. The general military hospitals were maintained. The Army Medical School had been moved to Netley. The Army Medical Statistics were still published annually. The position of Army Medical Officers had been further improved. There was a regular organized medical staff corps. The recommendations of the Barracks Works Committee of 1861 had been carried out, with the result that the engineer officers had more individual responsibility and were better acquainted than formerly with the details of healthy barrack and hospital construction. Soldiers' institutes had been put up on war office land at several stations. Recreation and reading rooms were to be found in most barracks. 
and no new barrack was erected without them. Such changes as have taken place since 1896 have been for the better, as I have indicated in preceding pages, for the better and more in line with Miss Nightingale's ideas. Her great work, Notes on the Army, contained as events were to prove not only the scheme of all Sidney Herbert's reforms, except those relating to defense, but the germ and often the details of further reforms within the same sphere, which have continued to our own day. During the years of her cooperation with Mr. Herbert, Miss Nightingale chafed at obstruction and delay, and after his death she cried out bitterly at the cessation of further progress. But in the end it was as her wise mentor, Sir John McNeill, wrote, March 26, 1859, It vexes me greatly to find that you are thwarted and annoyed by such things as you tell me of, but I am not in the least surprised. I did not expect you to accomplish so much in so short a time. Be assured that the progress from a worse to a better system is in almost every department of human affairs a progress slow and interrupted. Do not then be discouraged. If you have not done all that you desired, and who ever did, you have done more than anyone else ever did or could have done, and the good you have done will live after you, growing from generation to generation. I do not remember any instance in which new ideas have made more rapid progress. The bearing of the new ideas in relation to the army was pointed out in Miss Nightingale's summary of Mr. Herbert's services. He will be remembered chiefly, she wrote, as the first war minister who ever seriously set himself to the task of saving life, who ever took the trouble to master a difficult subject so wisely and so well as to be able to husband the resources of this country in which human life is more expensive than in any other, more expensive than anything else, and to preserve the efficiency of its defenders. In this work, during Mr. Herbert's term of office, as in the preceding years, Miss Nightingale was his constant assistant, and often the originator. They conferred personally or by letter almost every day. No move in the sphere of sanitary reform was made by the Minister for War until he had taken her opinion. Every draft was submitted to her criticism and suggestion. When Mr. Herbert took office, his wife wrote, June 16, 1859, to thank Miss Nightingale for her dear note of congratulations, adding, He entirely agrees with your suggestions of this morning, and I am copying your circular note for the four pundits. In the following month, July 26, he sends her the proposed sanitary regulations. I shall be very much obliged if you will go over the papers with Sutherland. Sydney is coming to see you today, August 13th, to talk about the regulations. Four days later, can Miss Nightingale give me the names of some governors for our new general hospitals? In later months, the scheme for the medical school and the new regulations for purveyors were discussed between them. On one occasion, a dispatch from Miss Nightingale, enclosed under cover to Mrs. Herbert, followed the minister to Windsor. I gave your letter to your sovereign. It's lucky the real one did not see your cover. The correspondence of 1860 is to like effect. Here is a dispute which is Hebrew to me. Would you look it over with Sutherland? I have written in our joint sense, and so forth. Miss Nightingale supplied, however, more than detail. For one thing, persistent stimulus. At the end, it was stimulus to a dying man. End of Part 3, Chapter 4, Reaping the Fruit. Part 3, Chapter 5 of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1, by Edward Tyus Cook. The Death of Sidney Herbert, 1861. Cavour's last words, la cosa va, that is the life I should like to have lived, that is the death I should like to die. Sidney Herbert, as recorded by Florence Nightingale. The progress of the reforms sketched in the foregoing chapter was somewhat impeded, and an extension of them to a further point was altogether arrested by a cause against which neither Mr. Herbert's courageous spirit nor Miss Nightingale's resolute will could avail. The minister's health broke down under the long strain. He was stricken by disease, 
and with failing health his grasp of affairs was necessarily relaxed the beginning of the end came early in december eighteen sixty a sad change wrote miss nightingale from hampstead december six to her uncle has come over the spirit of my not dreams but too strong realities mr herbert is said to have a fatal disease you know i don't believe in fatal diseases but fatal to his work i believe this will be he came over himself to tell me and to discuss what part of the work had better be given up i shall always respect the man for having seen him so he was not low but awestruck it was settled that he should give up the house of commons but keep on office at least till some of the things are done which want doing it is another reason for my wishing to go to town soon as he is particularly forbidden damp and to see him here always entails a night ride to their meeting on this occasion early in december miss nightingale often referred in letters of a later date mr herbert had put before her the three alternatives between which he had to choose he might retire from public life altogether he might retire from office retaining his seat in the house of commons or he might retain his office and leave the house of commons for the house of lords the first alternative though it might seem to promise the best hope of recovery was soon put away it offered small temptation to a man of herbert's buoyancy of spirit and high sense of public duty the second alternative was that to which he at first inclined he was essentially a politician and a house of commons man he had sat for twenty-eight years in that house where his fine appearance his personal charm and his considerable gift of eloquence made him a commanding and popular figure to go to the house of lords was as he thought and said to be shelved miss nightingale urged him with all her formidable powers of persuasion to make the sacrifice for the sake of their unfinished work and so it was agreed at the cost of many a pang on his part as he confessed but to the relief of his wife a thousand thanks she wrote to miss nightingale for all you have said and done and god bless you for all your love and sympathy mr herbert retained office resigned his seat in the commons and was created lord herbert of lee miss nightingale did not fully realize how ill lord herbert was she did not remember that a life entirely laid out as hers was for work and freed from all distraction involves less strain than one in which social ties general conversation family responsibilities and journeyings to and fro fill up the time between hours of work and she was passionately set upon the accomplishment of the work in which they were engaged she longed to see it crowned and made secure every step already taken by mr herbert in the war office had been an administrative improvement the great principle involved in his reforms was she wrote to simplify procedure to abolish divided responsibility to define clearly the duties of each head of a department and of each class of office to hold heads responsible for their respective departments with direct communication with the secretary of state the cause of army reform would not be completed the permanence of the improvements already made would not be secured unless every department of the war office was similarly reorganized under a general and coherent scheme so miss nightingale urged her friend forward to one fight more the best and the last the war office she had written to him november eighteen eighteen fifty nine is a very slow office an enormously expensive office and one in which the minister's intentions can be entirely negatived by all his sub-departments and those of each of the sub-departments by every other mr herbert had agreed a departmental committee had been appointed to report upon reorganization and lord de grey who was under secretary until mr herbert went to the lords had drafted a scheme 
this was the scheme which in substance miss nightingale now urged lord herbert to carry through but the horse guards was on the alert to mark the least infringement of its privileges and sir benjamin hawes the permanent under secretary at the war office was copious with objections there are amongst miss nightingale's papers many drafts in which she and dr sutherland reorganized the war office from top to bottom sir benjamin might have smiled rather grimly and then set himself with the greater determination to keep things as they were had he seen how near the bottom was the place into which miss nightingale proposed to reorganize him she was quite frank about it the scheme will probably result in hawes's resignation she wrote that is another of its advantages to reorganize the war office on paper is an occupation which during fifty following years was to beguile the leisure of amateurs and to fill with disappointed hopes the laborious days of many a minister to carry out any such scheme into practice is a task which only a minister in full fighting force could hope to accomplish it was beyond the power of a dying man miss nightingale had her fears from the first our scheme of reorganization she wrote to sir john mcneill january seventeenth eighteen sixty one is at last launched at the war office but i feel that hawes may make it fail there is no strong hand over him lord herbert struggled on manfully with his many tasks including it should be remembered constant dispute with mr gladstone over the army estimates but his strength grew constantly less at last he had to confess that on the matter which miss nightingale had urged him to carry through he was beaten lord herbert to miss nightingale june seventh eighteen sixty one as to the organization i am at my wit's end the real truth is that i do not understand it i have not the bump of system in me i believe more in good men than in good systems de grey understands it much better he then describes certain minor reforms in personnel including a definite sphere of responsibility for captain galton this i should like to do before i go and now comes the question when is that to be and what had i best do and what leave to be done by others i feel that i am not now doing justice to the war office or myself on days when the morning is spent on a sofa drinking gulps of brandy till i am fit to crawl down to the office i am not very energetic when i get there i have still two or three matters which i should like to settle and finish but i am by no means clear that the organization of the office is one of them further official details i cannot end even this long letter without a word on a subject of which my mind is full and yours will be too cavour what a life what a life and what a death i know of no fifty lives which could be put in competition with his it casts a shade over all europe while he lived one felt so confident for italy that he could hold his own against austria against the wild italians against the pope and above all against l napoleon but what a glorious career and what a work done in one life i don't know where to look for anything to compare with it cavour had died the day before and his last recorded words were of his cause la cosa va the pathos with which the events of the next few weeks were to invest this letter from sidney herbert made a deep impression upon miss nightingale among some pencilled jottings of hers written thirty or forty years after she recalled phrases in the letter and in conversations of the same date but at the immediate moment lord herbert's confession of failure filled her with despairing vexation sir john mcneill to whom she poured out her soul took the truer view of the case it was sad he admitted june eighteen that lord herbert should have been beaten on his own chosen ground by ben hawes but he added the truth i suspect is that he has been beaten by disease and not by ben 
what strikes me in this great defeat she replied june twenty one more painfully even than the loss to the army is the triumph of the bureaucracy over the leaders the political aristocracy who at least advocate higher principles a sidney herbert beaten by a ben hawes is a greater humiliation really as a matter of principle than the disaster of scutari disease held lord herbert in its grasp but with indomitable spirit he worked on at matters other than reorganization in which he and miss nightingale were specially interested one of these matters was the establishment of a general military hospital at woolwich among the few practical things wrote miss nightingale to sir john mcneill june twenty one which i hope to succeed in saving from the general wreck of the war office is the organization of one general hospital on your plan colonel wilbraham has consented to be governor last week we made a list of the staff and the names were approved by lord herbert there has been an immense uproar perhaps no more than you anticipated from the army medical department and the horse guards lord herbert was to send her the draft of the governor's commission and she asked sir john mcneill's assistance in revising it then she was requested to name a superintendent of nurses her choice fell upon one of her crimean colleagues mrs shaw stuart an admirable though a somewhat difficult lady who had now quarrelled with miss nightingale but whose efficiency marked her out for the post two other of lord herbert's last official acts referred also to the health of the british soldier and each was suggested by miss nightingale one was the appointment of the barracks works committee june six already mentioned the other the appointment of captain galton and dr sutherland as commissioners with mr j j frederick as secretary to improve the barracks and hospitals on the mediterranean station by the end of june lord herbert's health had become worse and he was ordered abroad to spa on july nine he called at the burlington hotel to say good-bye to miss nightingale they never met again a week later he wrote to her from spa i enclose a letter from mrs shaw stuart to cut matters short and start the thing i have begged her to select the nurses on their own terms i mean as to qualifications as the regulations define salary etc so i hope we shall at any rate start the thing now i have written an undated letter of resignation to palmerston to be used whenever convenient to him i have not written it without a pang but i believe it to be the right and best course i believe lewis with de grey for under-secretary is to be my successor i can fancy no fish more out of water than lewis amidst armstrong guns and general officers but he is a gentleman an honest man and de grey will be invaluable for the office and for many of the especial interests to which i specially looked i have a letter from codrington proposing another site for the new branch institute i have sent it to galton i wish i had any confidence that you are as much better as i am lord herbert's buoyancy of spirit remained to him when physical strength was quickly ebbing he became worse and on july twenty five left spa for home he died at wilton on august two to the last wrote his sister to miss nightingale he had the same charm that dear winning smile that almost playful pretty way of saying everything but among his last articulate words were these poor florence poor florence our joint work unfinished part two the death of sidney herbert was a heavy blow to miss nightingale the heaviest perhaps which she ever had to suffer it meant not only the loss of an old friend and companion in whose society she had constantly lived and moved for five years it meant also the interruption of their joint work which was more to her than life itself she felt in the severance of their alliance the true bitterness of death 
miss nightingale to her father hampstead august twenty one eighteen sixty one dear papa indeed your sympathy is very dear to me so few people know in the least what i have lost in my dear master indeed i know no one but myself who had it to lose for no two people pursued together the same object as i did with him and when they lose their companion by death they have in fact lost no companionship now he takes my life with him my work the object of my life the means to do it all in one depart with him grief fills the room up of my absent master i cannot say it walks up and down with me for i don't walk up and down but it eats and sleeps and wakes with me yet i can truly say that i see it is better that god should not work a miracle to save sidney herbert although his death involves the misfortune moral and physical of five hundred thousand men and although it would have been but to set aside a few trifling physical laws to save him the righteous perisheth and no man layeth it to heart the scripture goes on to say none considering that he is taken away from the evil to come i say none considering that he is taken away from the good he might have done now not one man remains that i can call a man of all those whom i began work with five years ago and i alone of all men most deject and wretched survive them all i am sure i meant to have died ever dear papa your loving child f her grief was accompanied and intensified by some remorse miss nightingale to harriet martineau hampstead september twenty fourth eighteen sixty one and i too was hard upon him i told him that cavour's death was a blow to european liberty but that a greater blow was that sidney herbert should be beaten on his own ground by a bureaucracy i told him that no man in my day had thrown away so noble a game with all the winning cards in his hands and his angelic temper with me at the same time that he felt what i said was true i shall never forget i wish people to know that what was done was done by a man struggling with death to know that he thought so much more of what he had not done than of what he had done to know that all his latter suffering years were filled not by a selfish desire for his own salvation far less for his own ambition he hated office his was the purest ambition i have ever known but by the struggle of exertion for our benefit happily for her peace of mind there came to her an almost immediate call to be up and doing in the service of her dear master as in her letters of this time she constantly named sidney herbert the newspapers had at first been somewhat grudging in their obituary notices of him he had been thought of in connection more with the defects of the war office during the early months of the crimean war than with his services as a reformer his family and his friends were pained and on their behalf mr gladstone applied to miss nightingale she did not feel well enough to see him and on august sixth he wrote explaining the case taking the liberty of intruding upon her for aid and counsel and asking the assistance of her superior knowledge and judgment in a matter which so much interests our feelings miss nightingale instantly set to work and wrote a memorandum on sidney herbert's work as an army reformer she wrote quickly but with her usual care in giving chapter and verse for every statement the memorandum was anonymous and was marked private and confidential but she had it printed and circulated it among lord herbert's friends and various publicists among those who saw it was abraham hayward who when a memorial to lord herbert was being mooted a few weeks later strongly urged that she should be asked to publish the paper no one he wrote could or would misconstrue her motives nothing has been more remarkable in her beneficent and self-sacrificing career than its unobtrusiveness it has only become famous because its results were too great and good to be shrouded in silence and retirement admirably as she writes she is obviously never thinking about her style which for that very reason is most impressive and i feel quite sure that the paper in question 
would suggest no thought or feeling beyond conviction and sympathy the memorandum in so far as it relates to what sidney herbert did has been described and quoted above but at the end of it miss nightingale was careful to touch upon what he had meant to do and what remained for others to do he died before his work was done the work on which his heart was set was the preservation of the health physical and moral of the british soldiers this is the work of which ought to bear fruit in all future time and which his death has committed to the guardianship of his country having finished her memorandum miss nightingale sent it to mr gladstone she knew how warm had been the friendship between him and sidney herbert she thought that in the friend who remained the saying might perchance come true una a wulso non de ficit alter at any rate it was her duty to throw out the hint so she underlined as it were the closing words of her paper by offering to talk with mr gladstone about the unfinished work which as she knew was nearest to sidney herbert's heart to this overture mr gladstone replied in a letter giving account of his friend's funeral w e gladstone to florence nightingale eleven carlton house terrace august tenth eighteen sixty one the funeral was very sad but very soothing simplicity itself in point of form it was most remarkable from the number of people gathered together and especially from their demeanour many men were weeping not one unconcerned face among several thousands could be seen but it all brings home more and more the immense void that he has left for all who loved that is for all who knew him i read last night with profound interest your important paper i see at once that the matter is too high for me to handle like you i know that too much would distress him too little would not i am in truth ignorant of military administration and my impressions are distant and vague it is your knowledge and authority more than that of any living creature that can do him justice at the proper time whenever that may be do him justice as he would like it without exaggeration without defrauding others i shall return the paper to you but of it i venture to keep a copy with respect to your making known to me the three subjects i will beg you to exercise your own discretion after simply saying this much my duty is to watch and control on the part of the treasury rather than to promote officially departmental reforms to him i could personally suggest i am not sure that i should be justified in taking the same liberty with sir g lewis especially new to his work on the other hand my desire to promote herbert's wishes as his wishes was not stronger than my confidence in his judgment as an administrator if i now seem reluctant to touch that subject it is for fear i should spoil it in the conduct of a department he seems to me very nearly if not quite the first of his generation i remain dear miss nightingale very sincerely yours w e gladstone on the afternoon of november twenty eighth in willis's rooms in the same place where in the same month six years before mr herbert had spoken in support of a memorial to miss nightingale's honour a public meeting was held to promote a memorial to him i think you would have been satisfied wrote mr gladstone to her on the same evening even if a fastidious judge with the tone and feeling of the meeting to-day i mean as regards herbert as respects yourself you might have cared little but could not have been otherwise than pleased i made no allusion to you in connection with the paper you kindly sent me although i made some use of the materials i acted thus after conference with count streslachi and with his approval i thought that if i mentioned you along with that paper i should seem guilty of the assumption to constitute myself your organ miss nightingale's paper summarizing lord herbert's services to the health and comfort of the british army formed indeed the staple of more than one of the speeches and the long alliance between them in that cause which has been the subject of preceding chapters in this memoir was frequently referred to at the meeting 
general sir john burgoyne said breezily that lord herbert's hobby was to promote the health and comfort of the soldier and his pet was miss nightingale who had for many years devoted herself to the same pursuit mr gladstone mentioned as lord herbert's fellow labourer the name of miss nightingale a name that had become a talisman to all her fellow countrymen and lord palmerston the prime minister in associating the commander-in-chief with the late minister for war added that they did not labour alone they were not the only two there was a third engaged in those honourable exertions and miss nightingale though a volunteer in the service acted with all the zeal of a volunteer and was greatly assistant as i am sure your royal highness will bear witness to the labours of your royal highness and lord herbert section three the alliance which was dissolved by lord herbert's death is probably unique in the history of politics and of friendship as for his friendship and mine said miss nightingale i doubt whether the same could ever occur again for five years the politician in the public eye and this woman behind the scenes were in active cooperation often seeing each other daily at all times in uninterrupted communication there have been other instances in which the same thing has happened but happened with many differences there have been statesmen who have made confidants of their wives and who have found in them wise counsellors and helpful supporters sidney herbert himself received much help in his public work from his wife to whom he was devotedly attached in some penciled jottings about her friends miss nightingale records a beautiful trait sidney herbert made it a rule she says to mark each anniversary of his wedding day by beginning some new work of kindness towards others yet there was room in the ordering of his life during the five years following the crimean war for taking constant counsel from another woman so constant as perhaps in the days of his illness and overwork to cause his wife some anxiety yet miss nightingale was as dear to the wife as she was helpful to the husband and affectionate friendship between her and mrs herbert was not impaired there have been many statesmen again and many other eminent men who have found inspiration or support no less than solace or pleasure in the friendship of women but sidney herbert's attraction to miss nightingale and hers to him were on a plane by themselves she indeed was susceptible as was every man and every woman who knew him to sidney herbert's singular charm and courtesy she admired the brilliance of his conversation she felt pleasure in his presence and he with his quick perception must have enjoyed the ready humour which played around miss nightingale's wisdom but they were also comrades or colleagues even as men are a woman once told me miss nightingale said to an old friend that my character would be more sympathized with by men than by women in one sense i don't choose to have that said sidney herbert and i were together exactly like two men exactly like him and gladstone the secret of this rare friendship between sidney herbert and miss nightingale is to be found first in the fact that the character and gifts of the one were precisely complementary to those of the other though of a sanguine temperament sidney herbert had the politician's caution miss nightingale though of an eminently practical genius was eager and full of impelling force she supplied inspiration which he had the means of translating into political action sidney herbert had the political mind miss nightingale the administrative not indeed that he was deficient in some of the administrative gifts or she in political instinct but what was peculiarly characteristic of her was the combination of a firm grasp of general principles with a complete command of detail and in the particular work in which they were engaged her experience supplied what he lacked i supplied the details she said herself the knowledge of the actual working of an army in which official men are so deficient he supplied the political weight each was thus indispensable to the other and they were united by perfect sympathy in the service of high ideals he wrote miss nightingale of sidney herbert was 
every possession which god could bestow to make him idly enjoy life yet ran like a racehorse his noble course till he fell and up to the very day fortnight of his death struggled on doing good not for the love of power or place he did not care for it but for the love of mankind and of god he was in the best sense she wrote elsewhere a saver of men in that honourable record miss nightingale deserves an equal place with her friend end of the death of sidney herbert eighteen sixty one part four chapter one of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the hospital reformer hospitals and nursing eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one the everyday management of a large ward let alone of a hospital the knowing what are the laws of life and death for men and what the laws of health for wards and wards are healthy or unhealthy mainly according to the knowledge or ignorance of the nurse are not these matters of sufficient importance and difficulty to require learning by experience and careful inquiry just as much as any other art florence nightingale notes on nursing the hospital reformer eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one it may seem a strange principle to enunciate as the very first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm it is quite necessary nevertheless to lay down such a principle because the actual mortality in hospitals especially in those of large crowded cities is very much higher than any calculation founded on the mortality of the same class of diseases among patients treated out of hospitals would lead us to expect florence nightingale eighteen sixty three the work for the health of the soldiers which has been described in the preceding part filled the larger part of miss nightingale's life during the five years after her return from the crimean war and in eighteen fifty six eighteen fifty seven eighteen fifty eight it occupied nearly the whole of her time the work lasted for almost exactly five years from the day of her return from scutari august eighteen fifty six to the day of lord herbert's death august eighteen sixty one but into those strenuous years miss nightingale had crowded much other work besides it has been necessary for the sake of clearness and coherence to treat the subject of army sanitary reform consecutively in a single part in the present part the other main occupations of miss nightingale's life during the same period and more especially during the years eighteen fifty nine eighteen sixty and eighteen sixty one will be described the story of her life and work may be divided for convenience into separate parts but in her own mind each of the branches of effort into which successively she threw herself were connected parts of a larger whole her experiences in the crimean war and the emotions which grew out of them had caused her to throw her first efforts into the cause of reform in the interest of her children the british soldiers but all the time she saw with entire clearness that the health of the army was only part of a larger question namely the health of the whole population from which the soldiers are drawn she had made her reputation by work in military hospitals and her first effort was to improve them but she saw that the condition of civil hospitals was the larger and the more important matter and she saw further still that hospitals are at best only a necessary evil a necessity as some one has said in an intermediate stage of civilization 
the secret of national health is to be found in the homes of the people if in a particular town or quarter for instance there was excessive infant mortality the remedy as she said was not to be found in building more children's hospitals there she was famous throughout the world as a war nurse but she knew that the difficulties which she had encountered in that sphere were due to the fact that the art of nursing was so ill understood at home her vision took wider scope and her efforts to improve the well-being of the people embraced as we shall hear both india and the colonies mr disraeli in a famous speech delivered the saying sanitas sanitatum omnia sanitas but that was in eighteen sixty four it was miss nightingale's motto many years before when the extent of her range and the depth of her influence are considered the claim made for her by an american writer will not seem exaggerated she was the foremost sanitarian of her age our immediate concern is with her life and work first as a hospital reformer chapters one two and then as the founder of modern nursing chapters three four miss nightingale's authority on the subject of hospitals ruled paramount in the years following the crimean war as the reference of the netley plans to her has already indicated popularity and prestige were confirmed by a practical experience which at the time was probably unique have you she was asked by the royal commission of eighteen fifty seven devoted attention to the organization of civil and military hospitals yes she replied for thirteen years i have visited all the hospitals in london dublin and edinburgh many county hospitals some of the naval and military hospitals in england all the hospitals in paris and studied with the sieur de charite the institution of protestant deaconesses at kaiserswerth on the rhine where i was twice in training as a nurse the hospitals at berlin and many others in germany at lyon rome alexandria constantinople brussels also the war hospitals of the french and sardinians her authority on the subject was strengthened yet more when her papers already mentioned which were read at liverpool in october eighteen fifty eight were early in the following year published with additional matter as a book it appears to me wrote sir james paget in acknowledging a copy of the book notes on hospitals to be the most valuable contribution to sanitary science in application to medical institutions that i have ever read the book has not been reprinted since eighteen sixty three and is now perhaps forgotten but if so that is the necessary fate of many a notable book the pioneers of one generation are forgotten when their work has passed into the accepted doctrine and practice of another in its day miss nightingale's notes on hospitals revolutionized many ideas and gave a new direction to hospital construction sir james paget's words accurately suggest the nature of miss nightingale's work in this field before she wrote there was sad need of the application of sanitary science to many of our hospitals the rate of mortality in them was terribly high hospitals created almost as many diseases as they cured there was hospital gangrene hospital pyemia hospital erysipelas hospital fever and so forth it was even questioned whether great hospitals were not and must not necessarily be producers of disease miss nightingale showed that there was no such necessity by the light of sanitary science she traced back the excessive mortality in hospitals to its true causes in original defects in the site in the agglomeration of a large number of sick under the same roof in deficiency of space deficiency of ventilation deficiency of light in a second section of her book going more into detail she enumerated sixteen sanitary defects in the construction of hospital wards 
adding to the statement of each defect precise suggestions of a remedy she added a series of equally detailed hints on hospital construction illustrating them by careful plans exterior and interior of some of the best modern hospitals and of the worst old ones some of my readers may be acquainted only with modern hospitals and it will be well perhaps to describe the defects in the old style of hospital many of the hospitals and infirmaries as they existed when miss nightingale started her crusade had been built with no consideration for the subsoil and the drainage of them was very imperfect the wards were sadly overcrowded often as much as three or four times over tried by the present standard of the number of cubic feet desirable per bed ventilation was defective the wards were often low there were frequently more than two beds between the windows little attention had been given to the supreme importance of having floors walls and ceilings which were non-absorbent the furniture of the wards and the utensils were such as would be condemned to-day as hopelessly insanitary miss nightingale found it necessary to enter in some detail upon the desirability of iron bedsteads hair mattresses and glass or earthenware cups etc instead of tin as also upon that of sanitary forethought in the construction of sinks and other places hospital kitchens and laundries at home were not quite so bad as at scutari but many of the kitchens were still very primitive and many of the laundries inspected by miss nightingale were small dark wet unventilated overcrowded so full of steam loaded with organic matter that it is hardly possible to see across the room all this is now for the most part a thing of the past and the passing of it is due in large measure to miss nightingale coinciding as her book did with a movement for increased hospital accommodation and coming with the prestige of a popular heroine her notes on hospitals opened a new era in hospital reform there had it is true been improvement before her time and she was not the one and only discoverer of the simple principles which she enunciated and which are now the a b c of the subject but the general level of thought or practice does not always rise to the height of the better opinion it depends too often upon the average opinion of the day moreover in some matters there was at the time when she wrote a conflict of principles in which the victory was generally given to the wrong side the beneficial effect of fresh air was not always denied but the advantage of securing warmth by shutting the windows and relying upon artificial methods of ventilation was in practice considered paramount miss nightingale was a pioneer in the consistent emphasis which she gave to the supreme necessity of fresh air and to the importance of direct sunlight not only daylight except perhaps in certain ophthalmic and a small number of other cases she based her contention in these matters on scientific principles she supported it from her experience and observation in the crimean war and in foreign hospitals in many quarters her ideas were new and revolutionary we have heard already what a bitter pill it was to one eminent medical official of her day to swallow the idea of pavilions in hospital construction lord palmerston explained in the house of commons in eighteen fifty eight that strange as it might appear considering the progress of science in every department it was only within a few years that mankind has found out that oxygen and pure air were conducive to the well-being of the body and in the matter of the curative effect of light miss nightingale cited from an official publication the case of a well-known london physician who whenever he enters a sick room takes care that the bed shall be turned away from the light an acquaintance of ours she added passing a barrack one day saw the windows on the sunny side boarded up in a fashion peculiar to prisons and penitentiaries he said to a friend who accompanied him i was not aware that you had a penitentiary in this neighbourhood 
oh said he it is not a penitentiary it is a military hospital miss nightingale's general principles commanded the hearty support of the better medical opinion and to many medical men her details drawn from observation in the best foreign hospitals afforded new and useful hints while at the same time she commanded in a singular degree the ear of the general public including town councillors guardians and benevolent persons it was in this way that her book did so much to improve the level of hospital construction and hospital arrangement in this country upon the construction of military hospitals whether general or attached to particular barracks miss nightingale was consulted constantly and as a matter of course in eighteen fifty nine it will be remembered mr herbert became secretary for war and in eighteen sixty captain galton was appointed temporary assistant inspector general of fortifications a department which included works for barracks and hospitals she respected captain galton's abilities and liked him personally very much he and mr herbert took her advice upon all works within her province and the plans of the new general hospital at woolwich in particular owed much to her suggested ingenuity she even drew up the heads of the specifications for it even where she was not directly consulted or concerned her influence and the standard she had set up in her book had an effect medical officers and military governors sought leave to be able to quote her approval of hospitals under their charge it would as one naively wrote to her improve their chances of promotion a more direct result of the publication of notes on hospitals was to bring in upon miss nightingale copious requests for advice from the committees or officials of civic hospitals and infirmaries throughout the country to all such requests she readily responded writing was with her a means to action and when she was given any chance of translating notes into deeds no trouble was too great for her she had decided views of her own but in particular cases she often consulted other experts dr sutherland one of the leading authorities in such matters was as we have seen constantly with her to her kinsman by marriage captain galton she frequently referred and she sometimes engaged sir robert rawlinson professionally to prepare plans and specifications for her to submit to those who asked her advice he on his part often consulted her in regard to hospitals and infirmaries on which he had been called in to advise her advice was sought both by those who were actually projecting new hospital buildings and by those who were leading crusades for the reconstruction of their local institutions among her papers there is a mass of correspondence specifications plans memoranda of all sorts referring to such matters technical details are often relieved by touches of miss nightingale's humour here are two examples from her letters to captain galton march twenty fourth eighteen sixty one i understand that bearing won't ventilate the barracks in summer because the grates are not hot enough in winter why are the men to die of foul air in august because they are too cold at christmas i think bearing must be an army doctor june twenty eighteen sixty one is the architect's ideal the profile of a revolver pistol if you look at the block plan in this point of view it is very good but as he asks my opinion it is that i would much rather be shot outside than in as hospital principles are beginning to be well known it would be quite enough to engrave this plan on the card of solicitation to stop all subscriptions no patient will ever get well there and as i don't approve of the principle of lock hospitals i had much better let it go on the correspondence about hospital plans ranges in place and scale from glasgow from which city she was asked to advise upon cement for the walls of the infirmary wards to lisbon where a new institution was to be built according to her ideas 
In 1859, the King of Portugal asked Miss Nightingale through the Prince Consort to advise and report upon the plans for a hospital which he desired to build in memory of his wife, the Princess Stephanie of Hohenzollern. This affair occupied some of her attention during two years and caused her not a little impatience. With Dr. Sutherland's help, she went laboriously through the plans submitted by the king's architect on the assumption that the hospital was intended for adults it then appeared that what the king wanted was a children's hospital the prince consort through colonel phipps was deeply grieved at the waste of miss nightingale's time and of her strength so precious dom pedro v taking an easier view did not see that it mattered a hospital constructed for adults but intended for children would his majesty pleasantly suggested only give the children more room and more air the king had to be given a lesson in the niceties of hospital construction the architect and miss nightingale set to work again on amended plans her suggestions were warmly approved on the prince consort's behalf by sir james clark and dom pedro sent her a cordial letter of thanks at home she took similar pains with plans for the bucks county infirmary at islesbury but here it was easier sailing for the chairman of the committee was her brother-in-law sir harry verney and it was promptly decided eighteen sixty to rebuild the infirmary in accordance with the requirements specified in miss nightingale's notes on hospitals in another county hospital that at winchester she took the more interest because one of her father's properties, Embley, was in the county. There is especially voluminous correspondence on the subject, largely with Sir William Heathcote, chairman of the governors, extending over several years. The old hospital was admittedly bad, but the first idea was to patch it up. Miss Nightingale took infinite pains in working up the case against this course, she studied the report which sir robert rawlinson the sanitary engineer had sent in and she tabulated the statistics of mortality comparing them with those of well-appointed hospitals on healthy sites thus armed she told the committee roundly that they were proposing to sink money in patching up a pest house where a number of people are exposed to the risk of fatal illness from a special hospital disease was hampshire eager she asked to emulate the evil fame of scutari then she tackled the financial problem she compared the estimated cost of adaptation with that of building a new hospital on a better site she submitted plans and details of her estimate she promised the advice of dr sutherland in the choice of a new site i understand she wrote that lord ashburton will give one thousand pounds towards a new hospital if built upon a new site if not nothing as lady ashburton was one of her dearest friends this condition was probably not unprompted on the same condition she promised contributions from herself and her father she collected and sent in the opinions of eminent experts civil engineers and medical officers on the question she prodded friends possessing local influence would you please she wrote to captain galton february tenth eighteen sixty one devote the first day of every week until further notice in driving nails into jack bonham carter m p about the winchester infirmary in the end she carried her point and a new hospital was built by mr butterfield on a higher and healthier site it is the greatest pleasure the architect wrote to her december eighteen sixty three to try and work out the views of one who is ably and earnestly endeavouring to make a reformation among other institutions upon which she advised in this eighteen sixty or immediately ensuing years were the birkenhead hospital the chorlton union infirmary the coventry hospital the guilford surrey county hospital the leeds infirmary the malta incurables hospital the putney royal hospital for incurables the north staffordshire infirmary and the swansea infirmary 
correspondence from foreign countries and a collection of tracts upon hospital construction 1863 sent to her from france and belgium show that the reformation was widespread in india also her book was found useful it arrived in the nick of time wrote sir charles trevelyan the governor of madras august tenth eighteen fifty nine as you will see by the accompanying note from major horsley the engineer entrusted with the preparation of the plan of the addition to our general hospital part two like other reformers miss nightingale encountered an occasional defeat one was at manchester in a cause wherein she was enlisted by a friend of cobden mr joseph adshead he saw something of miss nightingale during these years and corresponded voluminously with her he is the subject of one of her clever and vivid character sketches a sketch which throws interesting sidelights on her own character too miss nightingale to samuel smith burlington february twenty five eighteen sixty one dear uncle sam adshead of manchester is dead my best pupil how often i have called him my dear old addlehead and now he is dead he was a man who could hardly write or speak the queen's english i believe he raised himself and was now a kind of manufacturer's agent in manchester he was a man of very ordinary abilities and commonplace appearance vulgar but never unbusinesslike which is i think the worst kind of vulgarity having made a competency he did not give up business but devoted himself to good works for manchester and there is scarcely a good thing in manchester of which he has not been the mainstay or the source schools infirmary paving and draining water supply etc etc at sixty he takes up an entirely new subject hospital construction fired by my book and determines to master it this is what i think is peculiarly anglo-saxon he writes to me whether i will teach him this is about eighteen months ago and composes some plans for a convalescent hospital out of manchester to become their main hospital if the wind is favourable he comes up to london to see me about these the working plans passed eight times through my hands and gave me more trouble than anything i ever did because adshead would not employ a proper builder but would do them himself which is part of the same character i believe the plans are now quite ready but nothing more he meant to beg in person all over lancashire and had already some promises of large sums he had been asking for about a year but never intermitted anything i don't know whether you remember that i had a three months correspondence with him and oh the immense trouble he took about the transplantation of the spitalfields and coventry weavers to manchester preston burnley etc it never came to anything he was sixty-one when he died this is the character which i believe is quite peculiar to our race a man a common tradesman who instead of retiring from the world to make his salvation or giving himself up to science or to his family in his old age or founding an order or building a house will patiently at sixty learn new dodges and new-fangled ideas in order to benefit his native city how i do feel that it is the strength of our country and worth all the our catholic orders put together i hate an order and am so glad i was never let in to form one mr adshead had taken a prominent part in a movement to get the manchester royal infirmary condemned as insanitary and to rebuild it in better air outside the city boundaries miss nightingale though she did not join publicly in the controversy plied mr adshead with powder and shot but they were defeated manchester decided to pat and not to rebuild in the case of st thomas's hospital in london which was confronted from a different cause with the same choice she was successful hospital officials when in difficulty not infrequently went to miss nightingale this was the case with mr whitfield the resident medical officer of st thomas's then on its ancient site in the borough 
when the future of the hospital was threatened by the projected extension of the southeastern railway from london bridge to charing cross the railway company sought powers to take some of the hospital's land and the opinion of the governors was likely to be divided on the policy to be pursued mr whitfield was from the first in favor of the course which ultimately prevailed the railway company should be compelled to buy all the hospital's land or none and in the former event the hospital should be rebuilt on a healthier site and on an improved plan but there were others who were disposed to take the line of least resistance and to be content with rebuilding on the old or an adjacent site so much as the railway works made necessary mr whitfield opened the case to miss nightingale in february eighteen fifty nine and besought her aid she entirely agreed with him and threw herself wholeheartedly into the matter among the governors of the hospital was the prince consort to whom she sent a careful memorandum the prince went into the case with his usual thoroughness and ultimately concurred in miss nightingale's views he was scrupulous as the correspondence shows to avoid any interference with the parliamentary side of the case but he let it be known among his colleagues on the board of governors what his opinion was upon the best policy for the hospital to pursue in the event of parliament leaving it in the option your intervention with prince albert wrote mr whitfield presently to miss nightingale has wrought wonders but there were still two opinions there was a strong party which attached more importance to retaining the hospital on its old site in the midst of the people whom it served than to removing it to one which might be more salubrious but must be more distant this is a controversy which continually recurs miss nightingale took immense pains in working up the case for removal she resorted as usual to a statistical method she analyzed the place of origin of all the cases received tabulated the percentages in various radii and showed that the removal of the hospital to such and such distances would affect a far smaller percentage of patients than was commonly supposed then she made out sums in proportion setting on the one side so much inconvenience and conceivable danger in making a smaller number of patients take a little longer time in reaching the hospital and on the other the greater convenience and larger chance of recovery which all the patients alike would have in better surroundings at the end of eighteen sixty the critical moment arrived the railway company had served the hospital with notice to decide within twenty-one days mr whitfield wrote to miss nightingale in a state of considerable flurry he was by no means certain how the voting would go every vote and every influence were important could she not whisper once more in the prince consort's ear she wrote to the palace forthwith and the prince communicated his views to the court of governors on her side and not only on her side you will find in the prince's letter she was told by one of those behind the scenes your own arguments and sometimes even your own words embodied ultimately the governors decided as miss nightingale wished the railway company was required to take all or none of the hospital's land it took all and as usually happens in railway cases the price was not suffered to err on the side of moderation st thomas's hospital was removed to temporary buildings on the old surrey gardens and there remained till the present hospital was completed in eighteen seventy one a fair american visitor taking tea upon the terrace of the houses of parliament and looking across the river to the sevenfold splendors opposite is said to have inquired are those the mansions of your aristocracy they are only instances of the reform which miss nightingale introduced in hospital construction being the pavilions of st thomas's but miss nightingale was never consulted i feel sure upon the architectural ornament of the parapets her sense of humour would have made short work of the urns 
which as some one has suggested seem waiting for the ashes of the patients inside end of the hospital reformer eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one Part four, chapter two of the life of Florence Nightingale, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Passionate Statistician, 1859 to 1861. Full and minute statistical details are to the lawgiver as the chart, the compass, and the lead to the navigator, Lord Broom. I remember hearing the first Lord Goshen make a speech in Whitechapel many years ago in which he avowed that for his part he was a passionate statistician. Go with me, he said, into the study of statistics, and I will make you all enthusiasts in statistics. Mr. Punch parodied Marlowe thereupon and invited his readers to all the pleasures proved that facts and figures can supply unto the status-ravished eye i do not know whether any large response to the invitation was forthcoming from lord goshen's hearers or mr punch's readers though since the day when lord goshen spoke social reformers have more and more guided their schemes by the chart and compass of statistics if miss nightingale saw the speech it fell upon eyes long ago opened a fondness for statistical method a belief in its almost illimitable efficacy was one of her marked characteristics few books made a greater impression on miss nightingale than those of adolphe quetelet the belgian astronomer meteorologist and statistician and she had few friends whom she valued more highly than dr william farr the leading statistician of her day in this country from his meteorological studies quetelet deduced a law of the flowering of plants one of his cases was the lilac the common lilac flowers according to catelet's law when the sum of the squares of the mean daily temperatures counted from the end of the frost equals four thousand two hundred and sixty four degrees centigrade miss nightingale was greatly interested in such calculations and the lilac had a special place in her year lady verney's birthday was april nineteen and a branch of flowering lilac was florence's regular birthday present to her sister miss nightingale used to talk of catelet's law with great delight and commended it to gardening friends for verification in their naturalist diaries but this is a lighter example of catelet's researches what fascinated miss nightingale most was his essai de physique sociale first published in eighteen thirty five in which he showed the possibility of applying the statistical method to social dynamics and deduced from such method various conclusions with regard to the physical and intellectual qualities of man in regard to sanitation we have heard already of the reforms which miss nightingale was instrumental in carrying out in army medical statistics she turned next to the question of hospital statistics where improvement seemed desirable both for the sure advance of medical knowledge and in the interests of good administration miss nightingale had been painfully impressed during the crimean war with the statistical carelessness which prevailed in the military hospitals even the number of deaths was not accurately recorded as scutari she said three separate registers were kept first the adjutant's daily head-roll of soldiers burials on which it may be presumed no one was entered who was not buried although it is possible that some may have been buried who were not entered second the medical officer's return in regard to which it is quite certain that hundreds of men were buried who never appeared upon it third the return made in the orderly room which is only remarkable as giving a totally different account of the deaths from either of the others when miss nightingale came home and began examining hospital statistics in london she found not indeed such glaring carelessness as this but a complete lack of scientific coordination 
the statistics of hospitals were kept on no uniform plan each hospital followed its own nomenclature and classification of diseases there had been no reduction on any uniform model of the vast amount of observations which had been made so far as relates she said either to medical or to sanitary science these observations in their present state bear exactly the same relation as an indefinite number of astronomical observations made without concert and reduced to no common standard would bear to the progress of astronomy miss nightingale set herself to remedy this defect with assistance from friendly doctors on the medical side and of dr farr of the registrar general's office on the statistical she prepared one a standard list under various classes and orders of diseases and two model hospital statistical forms the general adoption of her forms would as she wrote enable us to ascertain the relative mortality in different hospitals as well as of different diseases and injuries at the same and at different ages the relative frequency of different diseases and injuries among the classes which enter hospitals in different countries and in different districts of the same countries then again the relation of the duration of cases to the general utility of a hospital had never been shown miss nightingale's proposed forms would enable the mortality in hospitals and also the mortality from particular diseases injuries and operations to be ascertained with accuracy and these facts together with the duration of cases would enable the value of particular methods of treatment and of special operations to be brought to statistical proof the sanitary state of the hospital itself could likewise be ascertained having formed her plan miss nightingale proceeded with her usual resourcefulness to action she had her model forms printed eighteen fifty nine and she persuaded some of the london hospitals to adopt them experimentally sir james paget at st bartholomew's was particularly helpful st mary's st thomas's and university college also agreed to use the forms she and dr farr studied the results which were sufficient to show how large a field for statistical analysis and inquiry would be opened by the general adoption of her forms the case was now ready for a further move dr farr was one of the general secretaries of the international statistical congress which was to meet in london in the summer of eighteen sixty he and miss nightingale drew up the program for the second section of the congress sanitary statistics and her scheme for uniform hospital statistics was the principal subject of discussion her model forms were printed with an explanatory memorandum the section discussed and approved them and a resolution was passed that her proposal should be communicated to all the governments represented at the congress she took a keen interest in all the proceedings and gave a series of breakfast parties presided over by her cousin hilary to the delegates some of whom were afterwards admitted to the presence of their hostess upstairs the foreign delegates much appreciated this courtesy as their spokesman said at the closing meeting of the congress all the world knows the name of miss nightingale and it was an honor to be received by the illustrious invalid the providence of the english army the written instruction sent by the providence to her cousin for the entertainment of the guests show her care for little things and her knowledge of the weaknesses of great men take care that the cream for breakfast is not turned put back dr x s big book where he can see it when drinking his tea miss nightingale also induced her friend mrs herbert to invite the statisticians to an evening party the feast of statistics acted upon her as a tonic she has been more than usually ill for the last four or five weeks wrote her cousin hilary july twelfth now i cannot help thinking that her strength is rallying a little she is much interested in the statistical congress congresses like wars are sometimes muddled through by our country and miss nightingale was able here and there to smooth ruffled plumes a distinguished friend of hers though his name had been printed as one of the secretaries of a section had not received so much as an intimation of the place of meeting he was disgusted at so unbusinesslike an omission and was half inclined to sulk in his tents miss nightingale's letter on the subject is characteristic miss nightingale to dr t graham balfour 
30 Old Burlington Street, July 12, 1860. You are quite right in what you say. We are all of us in the same boat. And if it were not that England would not be the mercantile nation she is, if she had not business habits somewhere, I should wonder from my experience where they are. Certain of us who were asked to do business for the Statistical Congress had it already since December last, and were not able to get it out of the Registrar General's office till this week. Certain of us were asked to do business this morning and to have it ready by tonight, which, if not done, would arrest the proceedings of the Congress, and if done, must be the fruit of only five hours' consideration, when five months might just as well have been granted for it. I don't say that this is so bad as the treatment of you who are secretary, but still it is provoking to see a great international business worked in this way. What I want now is to put a good face upon it before the foreigners. Let them not see our shortcomings and disunions. Many countries far behind us in political business are far before us in organization power. If anyone has ever been behind the scenes living in the interior, of the maison mere of the sisters of charity at paris as i have and seen their counting-house and office all worked by women an office which has twelve thousand officials all women scattered all over the known world an office to compare with which in business habits i have never seen any either government or private in england they will think like me that it is this mere business power which keeps these enormous religious orders going I hope that you will try to impress these foreign delegates then with a sense of our enormous business power, in which I don't believe one bit, and to keep the Congress going. Many thanks for all your papers. I trust you will settle some sectional business with the delegates here tomorrow morning, and I trust I shall be able to see you, if not tomorrow morning, soon. Mind, I don't mean anything against your office by this tirade on the contrary, I believe it is one of the few efficient ones now in existence. Having received the imprimatur of an international congress, Miss Nightingale circulated her paper on hospital statistics widely among medical men and hospital officials. Thereby she produced immediate effect. She printed large quantities of her model forms and supplied them on request to hospitals in various parts of the country. Through the good offices of M. Mou, she also worked upon public opinion in France. Some months ago, she wrote to Dr. Farr, October 20, 1860, I got inserted into the leading medical journals of Paris an article on the proposed hospital registers, and you see they are at work. The London hospitals took the matter up, Guise printed a statistical analysis of its cases from 1854 to 1861. St. Thomas's of its from 1857 to 1860. St. Bartholomew's, a table of its cases for 1860. With regard to the future, a meeting was held at Guise Hospital on June 21, 1861, and it was unanimously agreed by delegates from Guy's, St. Bartholomew's, St. Thomas's, the London, St. George's, King's College, the Middlesex, and St. Mary's, that the Metropolitan Hospitals should adopt one uniform system of registration of patients, that each hospital should publish its statistics annually, and that Miss Nightingale's model forms should, as far as possible, be adopted. She called further attention to her scheme in a paper sent to the Social Science Congress at Dublin in August 1861 and incorporated it in a later edition of her notes on hospitals. The statistics of the various hospitals which had accepted her forms were published in the Journal of the Statistical Society for September 1862, but I do not find that the experiment has been continued. So far from there being any uniform hospital statistics of the kind contemplated by Miss Nightingale, even in London some of the hospitals do not keep or at any rate do not publish any at all. The laboriousness and therefore the costliness of the work of compilation, the difficulty of securing actual as well as apparent uniformity, and a consequent doubt as to the value of conclusions deduced from the figures are presumably among the causes which have defeated Miss Nightingale's scheme. Some limited portion of her object is perhaps attained by the statistical data which the administration of King's Hospital Fund demands, 
but even here there are possibilities of misleading comparison there is probably no department of human inquiry in which the art of cooking statistics is unknown and there are sceptics who have substituted statistics for expert witnesses in the well-known saying about classes of false statements miss nightingale's scheme for uniform hospital statistics seems to require for its realization a more diffused passion for statistics and a greater delicacy of statistical conscience than a voluntary and competitive system of hospitals is likely to create at the time she was full of hope and having obtained a start with medical statistics she next pursued the subject in relation to surgical operations sir james paget had been in communication with her on this point we want he had written february eighteen eighteen sixty one a much more exact account and a more particular record of each case thus in some returns we have about forty per cent of the deaths ascribed to exhaustion in others referring to the same kind of operations about three per cent or less the truth being that in nearly all cases of exhaustion there was some cause of death which more accurate inquiry would have ascertained miss nightingale may one eighteen sixty one congratulated him on st bartholomew's having the credit of the first statistical report worth having but the table of operations was still she thought most unsatisfactory it would be most desirable that an uniform table should be adopted in all hospitals including all the elements of age sex accident habit of body nature of operation after accidents etc etc could you come in tomorrow between two and four and bring your list of the causes of death after operations it would be invaluable coming from such an authority for constructing a form she consulted other surgeons civil and military and wrote a paper with model forms for the international statistical congress held at berlin in september eighteen sixty three these also were included in a revised edition of notes on hospitals the royal college of surgeons referred the subject to a committee which however reported adversely upon miss nightingale's forms part two before the international congress at london in eighteen sixty separated miss nightingale addressed a letter to lord shaftesbury president of the second section which was read to the whole congress and adopted by it as a resolution the point of it was to impress upon governments the importance of publishing more numerous abstracts of the large amount of statistical information in their possession she gave various instances in which useful lessons might thus be enforced upon the public mind and cited guizot's words valuable reports replete with facts and suggestions drawn up by committees inspectors directors and prefects remain unknown to the public government ought to take care to make itself acquainted with and promote the diffusion of all good methods to watch all endeavors to encourage every improvement with our habits and institutions there is but one instrument endowed with energy and power sufficient to secure this salutary influence that instrument is the press with miss nightingale statistics were a passion and not merely a hobby they did indeed please her as congenial to the nature of her mind her correspondence with dr balfour and dr farr shows how she revelled in them i have a new year's gift for you wrote dr farr january eighteen sixty it is in the shape of tables as you will conjecture i am exceedingly anxious she replied as you may suppose to see your charming gift especially those returns showing the deaths admissions diseases etc etc but she loved statistics not for their own sake but for their practical uses it was by the statistical method that she had driven home the lessons of the crimean hospitals it was the study of statistics that had opened her eyes to the preventable mortality among the army at home and that had thus enabled her to work for the health of the british soldier she was already engaged on similar studies in relation to india she was in very serious and even in bitter earnest a passionate statistician and the passion as will appear in a later chapter was even a religious passion miss nightingale made a valiant attempt to extend the scope of the census of eighteen sixty one in the interest of collecting statistical data for sanitary improvements there were two directions in which she desired to extend the questions one was to enumerate the numbers of sick and infirm on the census day 
for sanitary purposes it would be extremely useful to determine the proportion of sick in the different parts of the country to those who said that it could not be done because the people would not give the information the answer was that it had been done in ireland the other point was to obtain full information about house accommodation facts which as would now be considered obvious have a vital bearing on the sanitary and social conditions of the people this point also had been covered in the irish census dr farr entirely agreed with miss nightingale but he could not persuade sir george lewis the home secretary to include these provisions in the census bill eighteen sixty miss nightingale thereupon drew up a memorandum on the subject and through mr lowe vice-president of the council submitted it to the home secretary mr lowe may have agreed with her but he failed to persuade his colleague whenever i have power wrote mr lowe may nine you can always command me but official omnipotence is circumscribed in the narrow limits of its own department sir george lewis replied that both of miss nightingale's points had been duly considered before the census bill was introduced it was thought that the question of health or sickness was too indeterminate with regard to an enumeration of houses it was thought that this is not a proper subject to be included in a census of population a very official answer but sir george added that he did not see how the result of such enumeration could be peculiarly instructive an avowal which he also made in the house of commons the cleverest of men are sometimes dense and this remark of sir george lewis added to his subsequent conduct of the war office earned for him in miss nightingale's familiar correspondence the sobriquet of the muff in communicating the result of her first attempt to dr farr she said if you think that anything more can be done pray say so i'm your man but she had not waited to be spurred on she had already bethought herself of a second string in the house of lords lord shaftesbury to whom she had appealed promised to do all he could lord grey did the same and asked her to send dr farr to coach him she began to thank god we have a house of lords miss nightingale to robert lowe old burlington street may tenth eighteen sixty i cannot forbear thanking you for your letter and for your exertions in our favour sir george lewis's letter being interpreted means mr waddington does not choose to take the trouble it is a letter such as i have scores of in my possession from airy filder and alas from lord raglan from sir john hall the doctor and from andrew smith it is a true horse guards letter they are the very same arguments that lord john used against the feasibility of registering the cause of death in thirty seven which has now been the law of the land for twenty three years he was beaten in the lords and we are now going to fight sir george lewis in the lords and we hope to beat him too it is mere child's play to tell us that what every man of the millions who belong to friendly societies does every day of his life as to registering himself sick or well cannot be done in the census it is mere childishness to tell us that it is not important to know what houses the people live in the french census does it the irish census tells us of the great diminution of mud cabins between forty one and fifty one the connection between the health and the dwellings of the population is one of the most important that exists the diseases can be obtained approximately also and all the more important such as smallpox fevers measles heart disease etc all those which affect the national health there will be very little error about ladies nervous diseases there will be a great deal where there is error in these things the error is uniform as is proved by the friendly societies and corrects itself the passionate statisticians were however hopelessly outvoted in the house of commons mr caird moved in her sense on the subject of fuller detail about house accommodation and in sending her the printed notice of his amendment said that his position would be greatly strengthened with the house if he could obtain miss nightingale's permission to quote her name in favour of the usefulness of such an inquiry i do not know whether she gave permission the debate is reported very briefly in hansard but in any case mr caird's amendment was promptly negatived as for the house of lords miss nightingale's reliance upon a better love of statistics in that assembly was cruelly falsified the census bill came up late in the session and i do not find that either lord grey or lord shaftesbury said a word upon the subject the only critical contribution made to the debate proceeded from lord ellenborough 
who so far from wanting the census bill to include provision for more statistical data proposed to exclude most of those that were already in he could not for the life of him see what was the use of asking people so many questions here then miss nightingale was in advance of the time in one case by a generation and the other by two generations recent censuses have included more particulars of the housing of the people though still not so many as she wanted official statistics of the local distribution of sickness will presently be obtained i suppose in a different way through the machinery of the national health insurance act deprived by the recalcitrance of the home secretary and parliament of a fuller feast of statistics at home miss nightingale turned to the colonies and dependencies the secretary for the colonies gave her facilities for collecting much curious and instructive information and the secretary for india accepted her aid in collecting and tabulating facts and figures which were the foundation of some of the most notable and beneficent of her labors but though she was already eighteen sixty to one engaged in these inquiries they belong in the main to a later period and we must now turn to another side of miss nightingale's work for the improvement of the national health end of the passionate statistician part four chapter three of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the founder of modern nursing eighteen sixty where is the woman who shall be the clara or the theresa of protestant england laboring for the certain benefit of her sex with their ardor but without their delusion southey's colloquies eighteen twenty nine the nineteenth century produced three famous persons in this country who contributed more than any of their contemporaries to the relief of human suffering in disease simpson the introducer of chloroform lister the inventor of antiseptic surgery and florence nightingale the founder of modern nursing the second of the great discoveries completed the beneficent work of the first the third development the creation of nursing as a trained profession has cooperated powerfully with the other two and would have been beneficent even if the use of anaesthetics and antiseptics had not been discovered the contribution of florence nightingale to the healing art was less original than that of either simpson or lister but perhaps from its wider range it has saved as many lives and relieved as much if not so acute suffering as either of the other two the profession of nursing is at once very old and very new and the place of miss nightingale in the history of it has not always been rightly understood nursing and even nursing by educated women is very old she herself nursed the unhappy emaciated victims of hunger and disease how often have i seen her wash wounds whose fetid odor prevented every one else from even looking at them she fed the sick with her own hands and revived the dying with small and frequent portions of nourishment i know that many wealthy persons cannot overcome the repugnance caused by such works of charity i do not judge them but if i had a hundred tongues and a clarion voice i could not enumerate the number of patients for whom she provided solace and care this passage which is not unlike some of the panegyrics showered upon florence nightingale's work during the crimean war was written nearly fifteen centuries earlier by st jerome in describing the work of fabiola a lady of patrician rank who in three hundred ninety a d built a hospital at rome where she devoted herself to the care of the sick female nursing is as old as christianity and for centuries the religious orders had sent cultivated women into the hospitals the very name of sister now applied to a rank in the nursing profession in general recalls its historical origin in religious enthusiasm nor was there anything novel in the mere fact though there was much that was novel in the method of miss nightingale's service as a war nurse it was novel in the case of the british army 
but in that of other countries sisters had already accompanied armies to the field and again it was not an original conception on miss nightingale's part that nurses should be trained for their work her master theodore fleidner had shown the way in germany and in our own country mrs fry's institute of nursing was established in eighteen forty and the st john's house in eighteen forty eight miss nightingale's at st thomas's not till eighteen sixty nevertheless though not the founder of nursing florence nightingale was the founder of modern nursing it is not always realized how modern is the institution of nursing on any large scale as a distinct and trained calling i have indicated above the three lines of influence religion war and science along which the development of sick nursing has proceeded miss nightingale came at the psychological moment to give it a vast impetus upon each of those lines religion was tending to become less abstract and more closely allied to the service of man miss nightingale was the saint clara or the saint teresa of the new order for whom southey had called she was prepared by her experience by the character of her mind by the drift of her philosophical speculations not to imitate old forms but to create a new order an order of nurses who should indeed be devoted to their calling but should be organized on a secular basis the deeply religious bent of miss nightingale's character the single-mindedness of her purpose and her constant appeal to high ideals enabled her to give to or at any rate to require from the seculars of the new order something of the devotion possessed by the religious regulars the crimean war in which miss nightingale was one of the central figures gave further force to a movement for increasing the number and improving the qualification of nurses it enlisted sentiment in the cause the american civil war in which as we shall hear presently miss nightingale's example played a great part extended the movement to the united states and the red cross organization may also be considered as an outcome of her work in the crimea the progress of science was tending in a like direction medicine and surgery were on the eve of receiving great developments sanitary science was already making advance at the time when florence nightingale was in training at kaiserwerth joseph lister was a medical student at university college cohn the founder of bacteriology was only eight years her junior parks one of the founders of modern hygiene was almost exactly her contemporary it was inevitable that nursing also should be developed in a scientific spirit and no one was better qualified than miss nightingale to take the lead in such a movement her experience in the east had filled her with a passionate conviction of the importance of sanitary science she was the centre of a circle of earnest and devoted men who were devoting themselves to it she was personally acquainted with many of the leading physicians and surgeons of the day and there was yet a fourth line upon which miss nightingale might seem to be predestined for this special work what is called the woman's movement was beginning there is an old legend wrote miss nightingale at the beginning of her pamphlet on kaiserwerth that the nineteenth century is to be the century of women at the time when she wrote eighteen fifty one the century she added had not yet been theirs but there was a spirit stirring the waters other notable women were at work claiming for their sex a place in the sun of the world's work miss nightingale was not wholly sympathetic to what she called women's missionariness but the circumstances of her own life as the first part of this memoir has shown made her intensely interested in claiming that a woman should not be debarred from entering a walk of life to which she is fitted simply because she is a woman and of such walks of life nursing is obviously one controversy is perennial between those who ascribe the course of political or social history mainly to great men and those who ascribe it rather to streams of tendency it is less open to controversy to say that the great men who leave the more 
permanent mark upon history are those whose genius conforms to the spirit of their time but who are yet a little in advance of their age among such great men the founder of modern nursing is to be reckoned two in what precise respect it may be asked did florence nightingale found modern nursing the answer to this question may i think be disentangled without much difficulty from a good deal of conflicting statement i have referred already in connection with the fettering scruples of miss nightingale's parents to a conflict of evidence upon the morals of hospitals and hospital nurses in the middle of the nineteenth century her own opinion at that time and she did not express it without much inquiry and observation is given in the pamphlet above mentioned where she says that hospitals were a school it may almost be said for immorality and impropriety inevitable where women of bad character are admitted as nurses to become worse by their contact with male patients and young surgeons we see the nurses drinking we see the neglect at night owing to their falling asleep such statements were indignantly denied by other authorities equally well qualified to form a correct judgment controversy broke out upon the subject a few years later in connection with the nightingale memorial fund a correspondent of the times who signed himself one who has walked a good many hospitals gave in eighteen fifty seven the same kind of account that miss nightingale had given in eighteen fifty one he was answered and his statements were hotly denied obviously there were hospitals and hospitals and still more there were nurses and nurses and no general indictment was just on the point of morals upon the question of drinking among nurses both in hospitals and in private service there is less room for doubt dickens was a characterist but he was an effective characterist and no caricature is effective in its day unless it bears considerable resemblance to the truth in his preface he spoke of mrs gamp as a fair representation at the time martin chuzzlewit was published of the hired attendant on the poor and he might have added says his biographer that the rich were no better off for the original of mrs gamp was in reality a person hired by a most distinguished friend of his own a lady to take charge of an invalid very dear to her this one can the more readily understand in the light of a remark by lady palmerston quoted above mrs gamp said mrs harris if ever there was a sober creature to be got at eighteen pence a day for working people and three and six for gentle folks you are that inwallable person great ladies clearly thought that such persons existed only and could only be expected to exist in the world of imagination and of mrs harris in eighteen fifty four miss mary stanley or a friend of hers sent out a circular very possibly with the knowledge of miss nightingale to various persons connected with hospitals and infirmaries of which the object was to suggest that nurses should be instructed on the kaiserworth plan in the art of administering religious comfort to patients the replies which were subsequently printed throw much light upon the position of nurses at the time if i can but obtain a sober set wrote a doctor in the north it is as much as i can hope for i inquired for dr x said another reply about the character of the nurses and he says they always engage them without any character as no respectable person would undertake so disagreeable an office he says the duties they have to perform are most unpleasant and that it is little wonder that many of them drink as they require something to keep up the stimulus the ordinary wages were fourteen pounds to sixteen pounds a year it should be remembered further that hospital nurses had as a rule in the middle of the last century no uniform dress and continued their own food which they bought for themselves eating their meals in the ward kitchens or scullery if the sister happened to be partial to red herrings for breakfast or onion stew for dinner or toasted cheese for supper the consequent state of the ward may be imagined the assistant nurses had to do all the scrubbing and cleaning of the wards 
and to cook for the other nurses and themselves a side light is thrown on the slovenliness of the arrangements by the account of what happened at king's college hospital when the nursing was taken over in eighteen fifty six by trained nurses from st john's house under miss mary jones by the end of the day the newcomers who had arrived in clean and dainty uniforms were like a set of sweeps or charwomen in such an appalling state of disorder had they found their wards there were some excellent nurses under the old regime apart from those trained at st john's house as sir james paget testified though it may be noted that even amongst his model sisters one was not seldom rather tipsy but the greater part of them he says were rough dull unobservant untaught the stoutest defender of the old system the most stubborn opponent of miss nightingale's reforms gives unconsciously equal support to sir james paget's statement that in the department of nursing there is the greatest and happiest contrast of all mr south was of opinion that all was for the best before miss nightingale began to interfere in the best of all possible nursing worlds but his conception of the ideal nurse is this as regards the nurses or ward maids these are in much the same position as housemaids and require little teaching beyond that of poultice making from all this facts emerge which will clearly explain wherein miss nightingale's work as the founder of modern nursing consisted she was not entirely alone nor was she in point of time the first in the field and there were exceptional cases to which the following statements do not apply but she was able to do on a larger scale and on a scale and in a form which attracted general imitation what others had attempted and speaking generally we may say that before miss nightingale appeared on the scene nursing was and was regarded as a menial occupation which did not attract women of character that it was ill-paid and little respected that no high standard of efficiency was expected and that no training was organized the women picked up their knowledge in the wards they were as the correspondent of the times said meek pious saucy careless drunken or unchaste according to circumstances or temperament mostly attentive and rarely unkind but with very few exceptions they were untrained a poor woman is left a widow with two or three children what is she to do she would starve on needlework she is unfit for domestic service she knows nobody to give her charring and has no money to buy a mangle so she gets a recommendation from a clergyman and is engaged as a hospital nurse the change which has come about since miss nightingale's work took effect is strikingly illustrated in the census in eighteen sixty one there were twenty seven thousand six hundred eighteen nurses in hospitals or nurses not apparently domestic servants and they were enumerated in the tables of occupations of the people under the head of domestic in nineteen o one there were sixty four thousand two hundred fourteen nurses and they were enumerated under the head of medicine miss nightingale was the founder of modern nursing because she made public opinion perceive and act upon the perception that nursing was an art and must be raised to the status of a trained profession that was the essence of the matter other things such as the opening of nursing to higher social strata the better payment of nurses and so forth though important and interesting were only results three the means by which miss nightingale achieved this great work were three she brought to bear upon it the force successively of her example her precept and her practice the first two of these aspects of her work will be considered in the remainder of the present chapter the third is the subject of the next chapter no woman i suppose who was not canonized or who had not worn or been deprived of a crown has ever excited among her sex so much passionate and affectionate admiration and set to so many an example as florence nightingale i have tried in an earlier chapter entitled the popular heroine to describe the effect which her work in the crimean war produced upon the minds of her contemporaries to get first-hand impressions the younger readers of to-day 
must go to their grandmothers or great aunts it is they who can help us best to some imagination of the thrill which the stories of her nursing in the crimea excited throughout the land of the intensity of sympathetic admiration which went out towards her of the impulse towards a fuller and worthier life which proceeded from her example but old letters are of some assistance too from a packet of family letters here is one from an aunt to a niece april fifteenth eighteen fifty seven i fear from a line in one of the newspapers that florence nightingale's life is approaching an end i have been deeply impressed by her life these last few days which in respect of mine forms but a fragment in regard of time and what she has accomplished a high mission has been given her which has cost her her life to fulfil in how many other minds young and old alike must florence nightingale's example have stirred similar thoughts a lady who had attained high distinction as a nightingale nurse was asked after miss nightingale's death to record her recollections my first thoughts of miss nightingale date back to that winter of frozen rivers when children catching up the rumors of the street ran about shouting sebastopol's taken or danced listening around the old weaver's wife who had come to the door of her cottage to catch the last light and read aloud to her husband what lord ragland was doing and saying or later in the hour before bedtime sat at their father's feet while he told of the frozen trenches of the dreary corridors of pain and of that ministering angel whose devotion was lightening a nation's distress or perhaps later still in sleep dreamed children's dreams of creeping amid sleeping russians stealing the golden crown from the czar's head and escaping with it to florence nightingale such experiences left indelibly impressed on the minds of the children of my generation the gentle and heroic figure of miss nightingale often no doubt the impulse was fleeting and the broken purpose wasted in air and often too the impulse was vague and resulted in no definite action yet not on that account perhaps to be cast aside as valueless i have a belief of my own says one of george eliot's characters and it comforts me that by desiring what is perfectly good even when we don't quite know what it is and cannot do what we would we are part of the divine power against evil but often the force of florence nightingale's example was direct and practical among those whom it influenced in this way was Louis, the grand duchess of baden who in eighteen fifty nine founded a ladies society in baden for the training of nurses she had never seen miss nightingale but a letter filled the grand duchess with enthusiastic gratitude i felt she wrote september eighteen sixty one that both joy and strength had come to me from your dear letter i may try indeed to thank you for it but i shall never succeed in expressing how deeply and how highly i felt your kindness if there is any progress in the work i have so much at heart it is greatly to your encouraging support i owe it those who saw miss nightingale and who were sympathetic felt thrilled in her presence she is so far more delightful in herself wrote clara novello than in one's imagination to nurses already engaged in work miss nightingale's personal influence was an inspiration miss mary jones of king's college hospital addressed her as my beloved friend and mistress i value your nosegay too much to part with any one flower even i look on a visit to you as my one indulgence and greatest pleasure but those who never saw miss nightingale nor even heard from her felt the force of her example in what was publicly known of her career there was as it were a call and a challenge to women here was a woman of high ability and of social standing who had forsaken all to be a nurse she sought to raise nursing to the rank of a high art she had already in some measure done it by her example End of the founder of modern nursing part four chapter three of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Kathleen. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook, the founder of modern nursing, continued. Four. In every walk of life, however, there are those who seek the palm without the dust. Miss Nightingale had seen already in the Crimea many women who had followed her example, indeed, in desiring to nurse the sick, but into whose heads it had never entered that nursing required special gifts and careful training. Example had to be supplemented by precept. Miss Nightingale's precepts upon the art of nursing were first given to the world in 1859 to 60. Her notes on nursing, the best known, and in some ways the best, of her books, was published in December 1859. It was instantly recognized by the leaders in medical and sanitary science as a work of first-rate importance, as one of those rare books to which, within their range, the term epoch-making may rightly be applied. I am ashamed to find wrote sir james paget how much i have learnt from the notes more i think than from any other book of the same size that i have ever read i am delighted with them wrote sir james clark they will do more to call attention to household hygiene than anything that has ever been written this wrote harriet martineau is a work of genius if i ever saw one and it will operate accordingly it is so real and so intense that it will i doubt not create an order of nurses before it has finished its work this was a true prediction miss nightingale was the founder of a new model and the notes on nursing was its gospel the anticipations of her friends that the notes would be popular were abundantly fulfilled here was a book by florence nightingale on the very subject to which her fame was attached the effect produced upon many minds by notes upon nursing was the greater because it came as it were as a kind of resurrection of the popular heroine the years which had passed since miss nightingale's return from the crimea were as we now know years of ceaseless activity years during which she had done some of her greatest work but it must be remembered that all this was entirely unknown to most people at the time the common belief was that Miss Nightingale had retired into private life upon her return from the Crimea, but now after a long interval she came before the public again, and, though as in all that she wrote for the public eye, there was a conspicuous absence of self-advertisement, there was enough in the book to connect many of its pages with scenes and episodes of the Crimean War an enthusiastic review in a paper not generally given to enthusiasm pointed out the connection hundreds of brave men attested with their dying breath how nobly miss nightingale's self-imposed task was fulfilled and this little book would be almost enough to explain her success its tone seems to tell of the solemn scenes from which experience in such matters has to be gained its language is grave earnest and impetuous like that of a person who has lived among sad realities and has been face to face with almost every form of human suffering nor was it only the general tone of the book that was suggestive of the heroine of the crimean war here and there little touches of personal experience were introduced in which every one could read the occasion between the lines when the author talked of her sadly large experience of deathbeds the reader thought of the lady with the lamp at scutari and when in her chapter on variety she recalled the acute suffering produced from the patient in a hut not being able to see out of window the reader's mind went back to the pictures of miss nightingale at balaclava i shall never forget she wrote the rapture of fever patients over a bunch of bright-colored flowers she was thinking again of the crimea the wild flowers there are many and brilliant and the nurses used to gather them in the early morning walk which each took in turn the book was not cheap at first the price was fives but fifteen thousand copies were sold in a month and a cheaper edition at twos quickly followed it was read sooner or later by all sorts and conditions of people in palaces in cottages in factories Queen Victoria thanked Miss Nightingale very much for the book, and sent in return a print of herself and the Prince Consort. From the Grand Duchess of Baden, 
the book called forth an overflowing tribute i will not attempt to describe to you she wrote october ninth eighteen sixty with how much interest and admiration i read these pages so beautiful in their simplicity so admirable in their true christian spirit rarely has a book made so deep an impression on me i cannot refrain from expressing the real admiration i feel for the noble english lady who has devoted so much of her life to suffering mankind and who has given to all her sisters an example never to be forgotten with further expressions of personal admiration the grand duchess added a very just characterization of the book the gentle feelings of the woman are joined to experience reflection and science miss nightingale was urged to prepare a popular seven-penny edition and this appeared early in eighteen sixty one with the title notes on nursing for the laboring classes and with a new chapter called minding baby and now girls this chapter begins i have a word for you you and i have all had a great deal to do with minding baby though baby was not our own baby and we would all of us do a great deal for baby which we would not do for ourselves did i tell you wrote miss nightingale to madame mole may seventh eighteen sixty one what prompted my little chapter on minding baby a peckham schoolmaster asked me saying he could always make the schoolgirls mind my book by telling them it was for baby's sake and several opened their parents windows at night greatly to the indignation of the parents i am thinking and removed dunghills before the doors in consequence in its cheap form the book had a very large circulation mr chadwick interested himself in getting it recommended for school reading benevolent persons distributed it gratuitously in villages and cities edition after edition was rapidly called for among miss nightingale's papers i find letters from correspondents reporting cases in which office clerks and factory hands after reading the book voted the windows open the book was read not only by all sorts and conditions of people at home but also in many countries and in many tongues abroad it had instantly been reprinted in america it was translated into german into french with a preface by miss nightingale's old acquaintance m guizot and into most of the other european languages if the book be out of print it ought to be included in one of the cheaper series of the day it can never be out of date and no one who has read it has ever found it dull five miss nightingale was essentially a man of action not a writer yet her writings are very characteristic of her work and none is more pleasantly so than notes on nursing not the whole of her nature breaks through language and escapes into it but this little book alone would be enough to explain to an understanding reader several characteristics of her mind and work it is an incomparable treatise on the art of nursing but as sir james paget indicated it is more than that it is an alphabet of household hygiene miss nightingale's treatment of the subject reveals at the outset her philosophical grasp shall we begin she says by taking it as a general principle that all disease at some period or other of its course is more or less a reparative process not necessarily accompanied with suffering an effort of nature to remedy a process of poisoning or decay which has taken place weeks months sometimes years beforehand unnoticed the termination of the disease being then while the antecedent process was going on determined if we are asked is such or such a disease a reparative process can such an illness be unaccompanied by suffering will any care prevent such a patient from suffering this or that i humbly say i do not know but when you have done away with all that pain and suffering which in patients are the symptoms not of their disease but of the absence of one or all of the essentials to the success of nature's reparative processes we shall then know what are the symptoms of and the sufferings inseparable from the disease this is surely sound philosophy not overthrown by any later discoveries about germs and microbes it is the philosophy of eliminating the known as a preliminary to investigating the unknown 
it leads miss nightingale to insist on the importance as she calls it of nursing the well before they become the sick or in other words to the principles of domestic hygiene ventilation warming drains light cleanliness in all this her book had more originality than the younger readers of to-day will realize without some effort of retrospective imagination the homes of the poor were in her day those that were not very much caricatured by dickens and cruikshank the schools of the poor which have taught some of the principles of hygiene directly and have had a yet wider influence indirectly by setting an example of airy rooms and cleanliness were still in the future working people in those days could moreover hardly be reached by writings it was the popular fame of florence nightingale that won for her notes on nursing an audience from the laboring classes nor is it only among those classes that great changes in current ideas and practice about domestic hygiene have been effected at the time when miss nightingale wrote stuffiness characterized the most genteel interiors she was a pioneer in establishing the principles of modern hygiene and perhaps even to-day there is still room for a wider acceptance of her doctrine that nursing the well is even more important than nursing the sick preventative hygiene than curative medicine a characteristic of miss nightingale's mind and of her methods in action is as has been noticed already her combination of general grasp with minute attention to detail and this is particularly remarkable in her notes on nursing in the chapter dealing with nursing in the more common acceptance of the term one is struck on almost every page with this rare combination of gifts nothing is too minute for her touch but everything is referred to a general principle her philosophy of noises with the detailed injunctions which she bases upon it is alone enough to entitle her to the eternal gratitude of invalids the book is no less remarkable for delicacy of observation and fineness of sympathy apprehension uncertainty waiting expectation fear of surprise do a patient more harm than any exertion remember he is face to face with his enemy all the time internally wrestling with him having long imaginary conversations with him you are thinking of something else rid him of his adversary quickly is a first rule with the sick people who think outside their heads who tell everything that led them towards this conclusion and away from that ought never to be with the sick a sick person intensely enjoys hearing of any material good any positive or practical success of the right do instead of advising him with advice he has heard at least fifty times before tell him of one benevolent act which has really succeeded practically it is like a day's health to him you have no idea what the craving of the sick with undiminished power of thinking but little power of doing is to hear of good practical action when they can no longer partake in it the whole chapter entitled chattering hopes and advices from which this last extract is taken is full of wit and wisdom it could only have been written as the expression of an understanding mind and a sympathetic heart just as the following chapter observation of the sick with its directions in the finer technique of nursing could only have come from one of long and varied experience in the practice of it another of miss nightingale's characteristic her taste for epigrammatic and often pungent expression is conspicuous in notes on nursing feverishness is generally supposed to be a symptom of fever in nine cases out of ten it is a symptom of bedding no man not even a doctor ever gives any other definition of what a nurse should be than this devoted and obedient this definition would do just as well for a porter it might even do for a horse it would not do for a policeman some obedient nurses know no medium between now no fire now fire as if they were volunteer riflemen it seems a commonly received idea among men and even among women themselves 
that it requires nothing but a disappointment in love or incapacity in other things to turn a woman into a good nurse this reminds one of the parish where a stupid old man was set to be schoolmaster because he was past keeping the pigs there is lively humor too in many of the personal descriptions miss nightingale quotes lord melbourne's saying i would rather have men about me when i am ill i think it requires very strong health to put up with women i am quite of his opinion she adds and she gives some little word pictures of the female nurse old style compelled by her dress every woman now either shuffles or waddles only a man can cross the floor of a sick room without shaking it she was writing in the days of crinolines and draws a picture of respectable elderly women stooping forward when invested therein another picture is of the nurse who is supposed like port wine to improve with age we are not told the circumstances but we are assured that it was a fact that a nurse when ordered to administer brandy and water to a fainting patient supplied the last week's punch then there is a description of the mincing nurse with an affectedly sympathizing voice like an undertaker's at a funeral all miss nightingale's pictures were drawn from life i wonder wrote one of her friends if the originals will recognize themselves no one then could read the notes on nursing without perceiving that the author was a woman of marked ability of wisdom and of true goodness the book does not of itself prove miss nightingale's power of administration or resolute will for a woman or a man may be decisive of speech without being masterful in action but with this exception the reviewer was right who said that the book was enough to explain the success which miss nightingale had attained the book points even more clearly to one of the main lines on which she was to work in the future no one could read it without perceiving that nursing as explained and taught by miss nightingale must be a very delicate and a very difficult art it required a sound mastery of the laws of household hygiene some knowledge of medicine or surgery and above all an acute and sympathetic faculty of observation merely looking at the sick is not observing it was obvious that if miss nightingale's ideal of nursing was to be realized the nurse required both training and inspiration nursing was an art and like any other art from a shoemaker's to a sculptor's needed in its votaries the sense of a calling and then a diligent apprenticeship the way in which miss nightingale translated her precepts into practice is the subject of the next chapter in notes on nursing as in nearly everything that came from her pen what she wrote had direct reference to action in a characteristic appendix to her notes on nursing miss nightingale discusses some errors in novels pointing out among other things the untruth of deathbed scenes in works of fiction shakespeare she says is the only author who has ever touched the subject with truth and his truth is only on the side of art the best definition of a nurse she wrote elsewhere can be found as always in shakespeare it is in cymbeline that the ideal of a nightingale nurse was prefigured so kind so duteous diligent so tender over his occasions true so feet so nurse-like End of the Founder of Modern Nursing Continued Part 4, Chapter 4 of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the nightingale nurses eighteen sixty 1860 to eighteen sixty one life is short and the art of healing is long hippocrates the value of hospitals as schools of surgery and medicine is hardly greater than is their usefulness as a training for nurses and the field is no less large it is an employment suited to women there has been an astonishing change in this matter since miss nightingale volunteered 
This change is perhaps the best fruit the past half century has to show. So writes one who has devoted laborious years to the condition of England question. If it be as Mr. Charles Booth says, then June 24, 1860 is a memorable day in the history of the 19th century, for it is the day on which the Nightingale Training School for Nurses was opened at St. Thomas's Hospital. This school was a direct outcome of Miss Nightingale's services in the Crimean War. The Nightingale Fund, amounting to £44,000, was a tribute from the British Empire to the popular heroine. The capital sum, after defrayment of some expenses, was invested in the name of trustees, and a council was nominated by Miss Nightingale for the administration of the trusts to enable her to establish an institution for the training, sustenance, and protection of nurses and hospital attendants. She intended, as we have heard, to found or conduct such an institution on her own lines, and her first idea has been to become the superintendent of it herself. On returning from the East, however, Miss Nightingale was in weak health, and she became absorbed in the large and manifold labors for the British Army which have already been described. She saw no early prospect of strength or time available for the superintendence of a new institution. She was unwilling that money subscribed for a public purpose should longer lie idle. In March 1858, she wrote in this sense to Mr. Sidney Herbert, the chairman of the council, begging to be relieved from further responsibility in the matter and asking that the council should proceed to apply the fund to such objects as it might deem best. The council, however, pointed out that the fund was well invested, that further delay would be partly compensated for by accumulation of resources, and that the contributors were anxious that Miss Nightingale's mind and intention should animate the work. They therefore begged her to postpone a final decision, and to this suggestion she acceded. But Miss Nightingale's labors for the army continued, and her health did not improve. Her life indeed seemed to her medical advisers to hang upon a slender thread. They thought that she could only live for a few months. She became apprehensive, lest death should overtake her before she had impressed her mind and intention upon any application of the Nightingale Fund. In 1859, she set on foot preparations for doing something. A subcommittee of the council was appointed, consisting of Mr. Herbert, Sir John McNeill, Sir James Clark, Dr. Bowman, and Sir Joshua Jebb, with Mr. A. H. Clough as secretary. It was obvious to Miss Nightingale that it would be impossible for her, in view of the state of her health, to found an entirely new institution under her own superintendence. She saw that she must work through existing hospitals and the agency of other persons. It was this latter consideration that settled her choice of the place at which to found her training school. She had naturally been besieged by suggestions from officials of this hospital and of that, of this charity and the other, each urging that his or hers was the one preeminently suited to benefactions from the Nightingale Fund. Her choice fell for the main application of the fund upon St. Thomas's Hospital. The resident medical officer, Mr. R. G. Whitfield, was sympathetic. The hospital was large, rich, and well-managed. But above all, the matron was a woman after Miss Nightingale's own heart, strong, devoted to her work, devoid of all self-seeking, full of decision and administrative ability, of this remarkable woman, Mrs. Ward Roper, who for 27 years was superintendent of the Nightingale School, Miss Nightingale has left a character sketch. I saw her first in October 1854, when the expedition of nurses was sent to the Crimean War. She had been then nine months matron of the great hospital in London, of which for 33 years she remained head and reformer of the nursing 
Training was then unknown, the only nurse worthy of the name that could be given to that expedition, though several were supplied, was a sister who had been pensioned some time before and who proved invaluable. I saw her next after the conclusion of the Crimean War. She had already made her mark. She had weeded out the inefficient, morally and technically. She had obtained better women as nurses. She had put her finger on some of the most flagrant blots, such as the night nursing, and where she laid her finger the blot was diminished as far as possible. But no training had yet been thought of. Her power of organization or administration, her courage and discrimination in character were alike remarkable. She was straightforward, true, upright. She was decided. Her judgment of character came by intuition at a flash, not the result of much weighing and consideration, yet she rarely made a mistake, and she would take the greatest pains in her written delineations of character required for a record, writing them again and again in order to be perfectly just, not smart or clever, but they were in excellent language. She was free from self-consciousness, nothing artificial about her. She did nothing and abstained from nothing because she was being looked at. Her whole heart and mind, her whole life and strength were in the work she had undertaken. She never went to pleasuring, seldom into society. Yet she was one of the wittiest people one could hear on a summer's day and had gone a great deal into society in her young, unmarried life. She was left a widow at forty-two with a young family. She had never had any training in hospital life. There was none to be had. Her force of character was extraordinary. Her word was law. For her thoughts, words, and acts were all the same. She moved in one piece. She talked a great deal, but she never wasted herself in talking. She did what she said. Some people substitute words for acts. She never she knew what she wanted, and she did it. She was a strict disciplinarian, very kind, often affectionate, rather than loving. She took such an intense interest in everything, even in things matrons do not generally consider their business, that she never tired. She had great taste and spent her own money for the hospital. She was a thorough gentlewoman, nothing mean or low about her, magnanimous and generous, rather than courteous, and all this was done quietly. She had a hard life, but never proclaimed it. What she did was done silently. Every artist, it has been said, in painting the portrait of a sitter, paints also something of his own portrait. Miss Nightingale's vigorous character sketch of her dear matron is, I think, a case in point. After much consultation with Mrs. Wardroper and Mr. Whitfield of St. Thomas's Hospital, and with Sir John McNeil and others outside, Miss Nightingale formulated a scheme. The committee of her council met the governors of the hospital, and an agreement was arrived at for the foundation of the Nightingale School. The basis of the agreement was that the hospital was to provide facilities for the training and the Nightingale Fund to pay the cost, including the payment of the nurses themselves. In May 1860, advertisements were inserted in the public press inviting candidates for admission, and on June 24, 15 probationers were admitted for a year's training. Thus, on a modest scale, but with a vast amount of forethought, was launched the scheme which was destined to found the modern art and practice of nursing. Part 2. The essential principles of the scheme were stated by Miss Nightingale to be two, one, that nurses should have their technical training in hospitals specially organized for the purpose. Two, that they should live in a home fit to form their moral life and discipline. The scheme was carefully adjusted to these two ends. The pupils served as assistant nurses in the wards of the hospital. They received instruction from the sisters and the resident medical officer. Other members of the medical staff, namely Dr. Bernays, Dr. Brinton, and Mr. Legro Clark gave lectures. How seriously the pupils were expected to undertake their studies, how strictly their superiors would watch their progress, is shown by the formidable monthly sheet of personal character and acquirements of each nurse, which Miss Nightingale drew up for the matron to fill in. 
the moral record was under five heads punctuality quietness trustworthiness personal neatness and cleanliness and ward management or order the technical record was under fourteen main heads some of them with as many as ten or twelve subheads observation of the sick was especially detailed in this manner against each item of personal character or technical acquirement the nurse's record was to be marked as excellent good moderate imperfect or zero those who passed the examiners as it were at the end of their year's course were placed on the hospital register as certificated nurses as rewards for good conduct and efficiency the council offered gratuities of five pounds and three pounds according to two classes of efficiency to all their certificated nurses on receiving evidence of their having served satisfactorily in a hospital during one entire year succeeding that of their training decidedly miss nightingale emphasized the educational side of her new experiment no public school university or other institution ever had so elaborate and exhaustive a system of marks equally thorough and scientific are the general directions which the resident medical officer presently drew up at miss nightingale's earnest request for the training of the probationer nurses in taking notes of the medical and surgical cases in hospitals equal care was taken to ensure miss nightingale's second principle the hospital was to be a home as well as a school the upper floor of a new wing of st thomas's hospital was fitted up for the accommodation of the pupils so as to provide a separate bedroom for each a common sitting-room and two rooms for the sister in charge of them no pupil was admitted without a testimonial of good character their board lodging washing and uniform were provided by the fund they were given ten pounds for their personal expenses the chaplain addressed them twice a week they were placed under the direct authority of the matron whose discipline as will have been gathered from miss nightingale's character sketch was strict the least flightiness was reprimanded and any pronounced flirtation was visited with the last penalty although wrote the matron to miss nightingale with regard to one probationer i have not the smallest reason to doubt the correctness of her moral character her manner nevertheless is objectionable and she uses her eyes unpleasantly as her years increase this failing an unfortunate one may possibly decrease a girl who was detected in daily correspondence and in walking out with a medical student was dismissed the nurses were only allowed to go out two together of course we part as soon as we get to the corner said one of them at a later time when the probationers had finished their training they were expected to enter into service as hospital nurses or in such other situations in public institutions as through the council or otherwise might be offered to them it was not intended that they should enter upon private nursing this was an important point in miss nightingale's scheme she had it in her mind from the first that her training school should in its turn be the means of training elsewhere she wanted to sow an acorn which might in course of time produce a forest part three such then was the scheme which was started on june twenty fourth eighteen sixty miss nightingale confined to her room was unable to visit the hospital but every detail was thought out by her she took constant counsel from her friend miss mary jones at king's college hospital who gave her valuable suggestions and she had eyes and ears to serve her everywhere her friend mrs bracebridge visited the dormitory and pronounced it excellent on the day after the opening mrs wardroper reported that dr whitfield was as hearty in the cause as herself they both felt it to be an honor that st thomas's had been selected for the experiment though it was an honor which would subject them to rather harsh criticism outside opinion however was favorable i must send a few lines wrote sir william bowman august twenty five eighteen sixty to say how much satisfied i was yesterday 
with all i saw of your nurses at st thomas's as far as a cursory inspection could go everything seemed perfect as to order cleanliness and propriety of demeanour your costume i particularly liked i suppose i must not say admired two or three of your probationers whom i spoke to impressed me favourably they seemed earnest and simple-minded intelligent and nice-mannered altogether the experiment seemed to be working well considering the difficulties it is being tried under the sisters i could judge nothing about mrs wardroper i was much pleased with and wished she had sold charge without mediums the dormitory i liked much a writer in a popular magazine gave a glowing account of the nightingale school the nurses wore a brown dress and their snowy caps and aprons looked like bits of extra light as they moved cheerfully and noiselessly from bed to bed miss nightingale sent books prints maps and flowers for the nurses quarters i do not for one moment think wrote mrs ward roper that you wish to spoil them by overindulgence but i very much fear they will sadly miss your considerate kindness when they go from us already january eighteen sixty one the matron was receiving applications from country hospitals for nurses to be sent after the year's training miss nightingale's demand for detailed information was almost insatiable even the monthly report with all its amplitude of heads and subheads was not enough mrs wardroper supplemented it by private reports miss nightingale suggested to her that she should encourage the nurses to keep diaries which might afterwards be inspected i am very pleased wrote mrs ward roper after two or three years trial january eleventh eighteen sixty three that you approve of the diaries and i am sure your approbation will stimulate them to increased perseverance when miss nightingale detected bad spelling a probationer was given dictation lessons miss tarot a friend of miss nightingale obtained admission to the hospital as a supernumerary and supplemented the matron's reports i am sorry she wrote in one of many letters that the probationers have lately been disposed to quarrel among themselves i suppose where women live together there will be jealousies and dislikes are sets and cliques and dislikes unknown where men live together the first year's working of the experiment augured well however for the success of the scheme all the probationers who completed their course thirteen out of the fifteen expressed their gratitude for the benefits they had received six were admitted as full nurses in st thomas's hospital two were appointed nurses in poor law infirmaries and applications were under consideration for the placing of others the seed had been sown on good ground part four a little later miss nightingale applied a portion of the fund to another purpose which she had much at heart this was the training of midwives for service among the poor here again she worked through an existing institution and by the agency of a woman already known to her the hospital selected for this experiment was that of king's college where miss nightingale herself before her call to the crimea had been inclined to serve the nursing at king's college hospital was undertaken by nurses trained at the st john's house an institution which had furnished a contingent to miss nightingale's crimean expedition the nature of the experiment was explained by miss nightingale in a letter to miss harriet martineau september twenty fourth eighteen sixty one they are to be persons selected by country parishes between twenty six and thirty five years of age of good health and good character to follow a course of not less than six months practical training and to conform to all the rules of st john's house which nurses at king's college hospital no further obligation is imposed upon them by us they are supposed to return to their parishes and continue their avocation there i am sorry that we shall be obliged to require a weekly sum for the board which will be merely the cost price not less than eight shillings or more than nine shillings a week our funds do not permit us at least at first to do this cost free for the hospital being very poor we have had to furnish the maternity ward and are to maintain the lying in beds in fact we established this branch of the hospital which did not exist before 
the women will be taught their business by the physician accoucheurs themselves who have most generously entered heart and soul into the plan at the bedside of the lying-in patients in this ward the entrance to which is forbidden to the men students and they will also deliver poor women at their own homes outpatients of the hospital the head nurse of the ward who is paid by us will be an experienced midwife so that the pupil nurses will never be left to their own devices they will be entirely under the lady superintendent certainly the best moral trainer of women i know they will be lodged in the hospital close to her if i had a young sister i should gladly send her to this school so sure am i of its moral goodness which i mention because i know poor mothers are quite as particular as rich ones not merely as to the morality but as to the prosperity of their daughters in nearly every country but our own there is a government school for midwives i trust that our school may lead the way towards supplying a want long felt in england here we experiment and if we succeed we are sure of getting candidates i am not sure this is not the best way the quiet beginning and the principle that nothing second best is good enough for the people are very characteristic part five the experiment at king's college hospital which began in october eighteen sixty one had to be abandoned after six years successful working owing to an epidemic of pure peril fever in the wards but that at st thomas's flourishes to this day on an enlarged scale and throughout miss nightingale's active years occupied a constant share of her thoughts and personal attention from eighteen seventy two onward she wrote as we shall hear later a new year's address whenever health and time permitted to the nightingale nurses constantly inculcating high ideals and giving personal inspiration to the order which bore her name every year as it passed carried into wider circles her scheme of affording to women desirous of working as hospital nurses the means of obtaining a practical and scientific training and of raising by degrees the standard of education and character among nurses as a class from year to year the other hospitals were assisted from the mother school with trained superintendents and staff and new centres were formed with the same objects and it may well be said that the seed thus sown by miss nightingale through the means of the fund has been mainly instrumental in raising the calling of nurses to the position it now holds so said the council of the fund in their report for the year in which miss nightingale died and the facts collected in histories of modern nursing fully bear out their statement in many cases nightingale nurses were sent out in groups as we shall hear in a later chapter to initiate reform in other institutions in the british colonies and the united states the nightingale power worked in a similar way colonial hospitals went to the nightingale school for their superintendents miss alice fisher who regenerated blockley hospital philadelphia was a nightingale nurse and miss linda richards the pioneer nurse of the united states enjoyed the advantage of postgraduate work in st thomas's and of miss nightingale's personal kindly interest and encouragement nor was the influence of her scheme confined to the anglo-saxon world in germany in france in austria and in other countries the training of nurses similarly followed miss nightingale's lead thus did the seed which florence nightingale transplanted from kaiserswerth grow up in other soil and with different development into a mighty tree with many branches in these days when all our great hospitals have their training schools for nurses when the tendency is towards increasing the requirements beyond the standard described in this chapter and when nursing has become a highly organized profession it requires some effort to realize how novel and even how daring was the work of the founder of modern nursing just as a colonel of the old school helped us to understand the difficulties of miss nightingale's experiment in the crimean war so a surgeon of the old school wrote a little book which is invaluable in helping us to realize the novelty of her experiment in st thomas's hospital this is the book by mr south to which i have already referred he was of the highest distinction in his profession hunterian orator and twice president of the college of surgeons he was also a 
senior surgeon at st thomas's hospital a fact which perhaps explains mrs wardroper's anticipation of rather harsh criticism for mr south was strongly and even bitterly opposed to the whole idea of the nightingale fund and of any new provision for the training of nurses he was not at all disposed to allow that the nursing establishments of our hospitals are inefficient or that they are likely to be improved by any special institution for training he believed that the nursing at st thomas's was good as indeed in many respects it was and he did not perceive that what the nightingale fund had in view was to raise the general level and to send out from st thomas's trained nurses who in their turn would train other nurses elsewhere perhaps if he had perceived this he would have regarded it as superfluous his point of view was that of the man who finds the world very well as it is i have cited the pleasure with which certain army doctors in the east found in the fact that few of their colleagues had subscribed to the nightingale fund mr south found similar satisfaction in scanning the subscription list at home that this proposed hospital nurse training scheme has not met with the approbation or support of the medical profession is he wrote beyond doubt the very small number of medical men whose names appear in the enormous list of subscribers to the fund cannot have passed unnoticed only three physicians and one surgeon from one london hospital and one physician from a second are found among the supporters miss nightingale's nursing work had the support of some leading doctors but i suppose we must take mr south's word for it that the medical profession as a whole was unsympathetic or hostile towards reforms which in a later generation received general approbation the doctors do not stand alone among the professions in a tendency to oppose reforms the hostility of lawyers to legal reform is almost proverbial and as for the politicians one half of them is professionally engaged in predicting dire results from reforms introduced by the other half and so it continues until the paradoxes of one generation become the commonplaces of the next but if the course of political and social progress is strewn with the wrecks of predictions of ruin neither is it free from the disillusionments of reformers fears may be liars but hopes are sometimes dupes miss nightingale as the founder of modern nursing achieved great and beneficent results but she lived to experience some disappointments her standard was so high that she was more conscious of shortcoming than of achievement we shall perhaps better understand her mind when we pass in the next chapter to consider the religious sanction and the ideal of human perfectibility which she had worked out for herself in the world of thought and which inspired her efforts in the world of action end of the nightingale nurses 1860 to 1861part four chapter five of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the religious sanctions suggestions for thought eighteen sixty parts one two and three it fortifies my soul to know that though i perish truth is so that howsoe'er i stray and range whate'er i do thou dost not change i steadier step when i recall that if i slip thou dost not fall a h clough the life and work of miss nightingale as described in the foregoing chapters of this memoir were such as were unlikely to have proceeded from any one who was not possessed by some strong spiritual impulse it was a life devoted to work and in that work she sought and found herself yet from what is ordinarily called self-seeking her work was conspicuously free the body was so weak that the wonder is how a woman in delicate health was able to perform so much 
of what Sidney Herbert called a man's work in the world. She was supported, sustained, inspired by great spiritual force and energy, which drove her to seek self-satisfaction in a dedicated life of work, and which in its turn found expression in a form of religion independently attained and intensely held. In a previous chapter, I have traced the development of Miss Nightingale's religious views during her earlier years, and have shown how they broadened out into a tolerance which took more account of deeds than of creeds. But, as was there said, she was interested in creeds also. Her nature was profoundly religious, and she had a mind as apt for speculative as for practical thought. Her critical spirit had detected weak places, as she deemed them, in the creed alike of Protestants and of Catholics. The precise and practical bent of her mind could not be satisfied until she had found for the feelings of her heart some more logical basis. She was thus driven forward to that reconstruction of her religious creed to which passing reference has already been made. At the beginning of her diary for 1853, on a page placed opposite January for a memoranda from 1852, there is this entry, The last day of the old year. I am so glad this year is over. Nevertheless, it has not been wasted, I trust. I have remodeled my whole religious belief from beginning to end. I have learnt to know God. I have recast my social belief. Have them both written for use when my hour is come. This entry refers to the manuscripts called, respectively, Religion and Novel, in a letter of 1852 already cited. The manuscripts, after being read by one or two friends, remained for some years in Miss Nightingale's desk, though during that period of strenuous activity in the world of deeds, the subject matter, we may be sure, often occupied her thoughts. In 1858 and 1859, she took up the manuscripts again. The companionship of Arthur Hugh Clough, who at this time was much with her, was doubtless one of the causes which led to an active resumption of her theological speculations. She was re-reading Mill's Logic and reading Edgar Quinet's Histoire de Méside. Mr. Clough's notes of conversation with her show how much she was indebted in her speculations to Mill. Guinet and J. S. Mill, wrote Mr. Clough, March 2, 1859, seemed, she said, the two men who had the true belief about God's laws. She referred in particular to two chapters in Mill's Logic about free will and necessity, which seemed to her to be the beginning of the true religious belief. The excellence of God, she said, is that he is inexorable. If he were to be changed by people's praying, we should be at the mercy of who prayed to him. It reminded her, she said, of what old James Martin said some years ago when she saw him, that he didn't like having dissenters praying. He liked to have the prayers all set down and arranged. He didn't know what people mightn't be praying, perhaps that the money might be taken out of his pocket and put into theirs. She rewrote some of what had been written six or seven years before, and she added a great deal more. Towards the end of 1859, she began printing it. In the following year, the whole was in type, and a very few copies were struck off. This book, entitled Suggestions for Thought, is in three volumes, comprising in all 829 large octavo pages. It was never published by her. It has, with conspicuous merits, equally conspicuous defects. The merits are of the substance, the defects are of form and arrangement, but Miss Nightingale never found time or strength or inclination, I know not which or how many of the three were wanting, to remove the defects by recasting the book. Unpublished, therefore, it is likely, I suppose, to remain. But as it stands, it is a remarkable work. No one, indeed, could read it without being impressed, by the powerful mind, the spiritual force, and with some qualifications, the literary ability of the writer. If she had not during her more active years been absorbed in practical affairs, or if at a later time her energy or inclination had not been impaired by ill health, Miss Nightingale might have attained a place among the philosophical writers of the nineteenth century. 
Section 2 in 1860, at the time when Miss Nightingale put her suggestions for thought into type, she was half inclined to publish the work. She consulted some of her intimate friends on the point. She also submitted the manuscript to two famous men, than whom none were better qualified to give a just opinion, John Stuart Mill and Benjamin Jowett. With Mr. Mill, she was not personally acquainted, and she sought an introduction through her friend Mr. Chadwick. By way of breaking the ground, he sent to Mill a copy of Notes on Nursing. Mill promised to read the book immediately, though he added, I do not need it to enable me to share the admiration which is felt towards Miss Nightingale more universally, I should imagine, than towards any other living person. This expression must have pleased her, for she was a diligent reader, and with some differences of opinion, a warm admirer of Mill's books being thus assured of his good will and being further informed through mr chadwick that no formal introduction was necessary if miss nightingale conceived that mr mill could be of any service to her she sent him a copy of the suggestions or rather of a portion of them he read it and was greatly interested so much so that in addition to sending her a letter of general criticism he was at the pains to annotate it in the margin he hoped that he might be allowed to see the remainder. A perusal of this increased his high opinion. I have seldom felt less inclined to criticize, he said, than in reading this book. But one or two criticisms he did offer. For your consideration, he said, and not as pretending to lay down the law on the subject to anyone, much less to you. And he invited further correspondence. Miss Nightingale's essays remained in his mind, for in a famous book published nine years later, he introduced an allusion to them. To Mr. Jowett, Miss Nightingale was introduced by Mr. Clough, who had asked him to read some of the suggestions. It seemed to me, he said to Mr. Clough, after reading it, as if I had received the impress of a new mind. His interest in such philanthropic efforts as those connected with the name of Florence Nightingale is reflected in a passage in the famous essay on interpretation and he must have been the more interested in the suggestions when mr clough told him that she was the author and asked him to write to her about them her name for the book in familiar letters was the stuff by which name also it is spoken of in her will i write to thank you said mr jowett in one of the earlier letters of a long series april sixth eighteen sixty one for the stuff to which i shall venture to add the epithet precious he thought as highly of the book as did mr mill though in a different way and he too in addition to long letters of general discussion suggested by the book annotated it in detail his annotations are most voluminous and careful they are admirable in criticism and from them alone a reader not otherwise acquainted with mr jowett's work might form a tolerably accurate idea of his character and modes of thought the proof copy of the stuff with mr jowett's annotations was one of miss nightingale's most cherished possessions i shall refer to some of the detailed criticisms later i have ventured he said to put down the criticisms which occur to me quite baldly they must not be supposed to be inconsistent with the greatest respect for the mind and genius of the writer the criticisms were many and often far-reaching but no less frequent are expressions such as very good very fine and noble on the immediate question to publish or not to publish mr mill and mr jowett gave what might at first sight appear to be very different advice mr mill after reading the first instalment of the book said if any part of your object in sending it was to know my opinion as to the desirableness of its being published i have no difficulty in giving it strongly in the affirmative and in his next letter he said if when i had only read the first volume i was very desirous that it should be published i am much more so after reading the second mr jowett on the other hand was against publication it is presumptuous i fear to pose as a court of appeal between two such judges but i will hazard the opinion that mr jowett's was the better advice and this is not quite so presumptuous as it may seem for the fact is that though mr mill wanted to see the book published he would also have been glad to see it recast and similarly mr jowett though he urged that the book must be recast 
was very anxious that it should ultimately be published. I should be very sorry, he wrote at the end, if the greater part of this book did not in some form see the light. I have been greatly struck by reading it, and I am sure it would similarly affect others. Many sparks will blaze up in people's minds from it. In point of arrangement, indeed, wrote Mr. Mill of condensation, and of giving, as it were, a keen edge to the argument, it would have much benefited by the recasting which you have been prevented from giving it, by a cause on all other accounts so much to be lamented. This, however, applies more to the general mode of laying out the argument than to the details. Mr. Mill put it admirably in these two sentences, points which Mr. Jowett over and over again explained and illustrated with the utmost care in his detailed annotations, and they are points which must strike every reader of Miss Nightingale's book. The repetitions are tiresome, nay, almost intolerable, to any one who reads a considerable portion of it consecutively. And Miss Nightingale, in a later letter to Madame Mole, says that she could not read the book herself. The argument in isolated passages and sometimes in particular chapters is closely knit, but in the book taken as a whole, it often loses itself in digressions, and there is a lack of any consistent ordo concatenatioque rarum the book is as remarkable for literary felicities in detail as it is deficient in the art of literary arrangement some consideration of this point will serve to illustrate an aspect of miss nightingale's character the defect which mr mill and mr jowett saw in her suggestions for thought might seem to be among the last to be expected in her her mind was singularly methodical and orderly this was one of the essential characteristics of her work as an administrator and a reformer. In this very book, the characteristic appears, though in a somewhat superficial form. Each volume is prefaced by an elaborate digest, with many divisions and subdivisions. Yet the fact remains that the appearance of close method does not correspond with any similarly close arrangement of the material. It may be said that the subject matter is less tractable by methodic heads and subheads than the organization of a department or the arrangement of a hospital, and that is true, but it is worth noting that something of the same criticism that was made by Mr. Mill and Mr. Jowett upon Miss Nightingale's suggestions for thought was made by another able man upon her notes on the army. I consider them deficient, wrote Sir John McNeill, November 18, 1858, in a certain form of artistical skill or art, and chargeable with frequent repetitions but I confess that these deficiencies constitute to my mind some of their greatest charms. They give to the whole the most unmistakable stamp of earnestness and truth, such as no reader of ordinary perception can doubt. They must, I think, in every class of mind produce the conviction that you were exclusively occupied with the good you might do, and not at all with your reputation as an artist." This apology is perfectly valid in relation to the particular work in question, and Sir John might have added another. The notes on the army were a series of reports of which indeed the whole should have been read consecutively by the Secretary of State, but each of which referred to a different branch of the War Department. But the case is different when we pass to a philosophic treatise, which is addressed to thinkers. Some of the lack of sustained coherence in Miss Nightingale's suggestions for thought and many of its repetitions may be referred to the method of composition. Different chapters were written at different times, but when she thought of publishing it, she did not care to correct those defects. Why was this? The explanation is to be found, I think, partly in a view which she had come to hold of the literary art, partly in a certain impetuosity of temper. She had put literary pursuits away from her as a vain temptation. She cared for writing only as a means to action, and she could not see that literary form is of the essence of the matter, if writing is to influence current thought on difficult subjects. Infinitely laborious again when action was in sight, and capable of infinite patience when she saw the need, she was content to throw out her thoughts careless of the form. There is a complete and consistent scheme underlying her suggestions. It was ever present in her own mind and she could not be troubled to pare and prune, to revise and recast in the interests of what she despised as mere artistry, known omnia possumus. 
Those who are capable of completion in one field are often impatient of it in another. Ruskin, so careful of finish in his literary craftsmanship, was asked why he so seldom finished his drawings to the edges. Oh, he replied, I can't be bothered to do the tailoring. Mr. Jowett urged Miss Nightingale in one of his letters, November 17, 1861, to devote time and trouble to improving the form of her suggestions. No one can get the form in which it is necessary to put forth new ideas without great labor and thought and tact. It takes years after ideas are clear in your own mind to mold them into a shape intelligible to others. Miss Nightingale's answer to Mr. Jowett is not in existence, but I imagine that it was to the effect that she had no time for the tailoring. Section 3 the difference in the advice given by Mr. Mill and Mr. Jowett, respectively, went deeper, however, than to the question of form. And here again a consideration of the point will throw light on Miss Nightingale's character. The book was ostensibly one of reconstruction. It was, in fact, very largely one of revolt. The first and the third volumes are a philosophical exposition of her creed, law as the basis of a new theology. The second, devoted to practical deductions, is a criticism of the religion and social life of her day. The criticism under both heads is scathing and full of touches of her characteristically caustic humor. This second volume includes a full discussion of the position of women and a plea for their emancipation from many of the restrictions of the time. It is easy to see how much of this appeals strongly to Mr. Mill and why he deemed its publication desirable and it is equally easy to understand that much of it offended Mr. Jowett, and why he deemed revision essential. I shall not presume on this point to decide between her counsellors. As her biographer, I content myself with recording that the plea for moderation, for conciliation, for suavity, which Mr. Jowett urged in scores of marginalia and in dozens of letters, seems to have prevailed. The essence of the plea was that the new should, as far as possible, be grafted upon the old. It was a plea for accommodation. Miss Nightingale had ideas which were of real value, but they would not avail to modify and purify religious thought if they were presented in too combative and revolutionary a form. One passage, though not among those to which Mr. Jowett more particularly objected, will serve to illustrate his point of view. I select it because it is characteristic of the writer's humor. It is from a section entitled John Bull and His Church. John Bull will have plenty for his money. He will have his services long till he is quite tired that he may have his money's worth. Like his concerts, plenty in them. No cheating till he goes home yawning. So he has his confession lumping all his sins together and then his absolution, and then his praise, and then his litany, asking for every imaginable thing, and ending with asking God for mercy on all men, lest he should have left out anything, till there does not remain to God the smallest choice or judgment. And then his sermon, a long one, three services in one, that he may not have put on his best clothes, nor paid all his tithes for nothing. No person blessed with any sense of humor is likely to find this passage offensive, but Mr. Jowett objected to it because it is not historically true. J. B. had a church and liturgy made for him by Henry the Eighth and Queen Elizabeth, and human nature in churches is conservative. And generally Mr. Jowett asked Miss Nightingale not to find fault with the times or with anybody, but to endeavor out of the elements that exist to reconstruct religion. Theology is a progressive science. Each age adds something to the idea of God. Let Miss Nightingale seek to win converts by leading them gently by the hand, not, as it were, by knocking them upon the head. She had peculiar advantages for doing this. Let her be very careful not to throw them away. So did Mr. Jowett reason with her. The point is put in innumerable forms, but this paragraph from a letter already mentioned, November 17, 1861, will serve as a type. I should not much care if only a comparatively small part of your work is finished. Its greatest value would be that it comes from you who worked in the Crimea. Shall I say one odd and perhaps rather impertinent thing? You have a great advantage in writing on these subjects as a woman. Do not throw it away 
but he used the advantage to the utmost in writing against the world athanasia contra mundum every feeling every sympathy should be made an ally so that with the clearest statement of the meaning there is the least friction and drawback possible whether it was mr jowett's criticism that alone or mainly caused miss nightingale to abandon the idea of publishing her, her suggestions for thought i do not know but two things may be said only once so far as i have traced did she take the world at all into her confidence on the subject of her religious beliefs it was twelve years later in some articles in fraser's magazine to which we shall come in due course in those articles the fundamental doctrines of the suggestions for thought are contained but they are stated in a manner and a temper which showed that she had given heed to the mild wisdom of mr jowett the other thing that may be said is that for mr jowett personally miss nightingale felt from the first a high regard at the time with which we are now concerned they knew each other by correspondence only though of course mr clough would have had much to tell her of his friend i do so like mr jowett she wrote at this time to a friend and at the same time mr jowett wrote to her i reckon you if i may do so among unseen friends presently they met the friendship ripened and remained firm to the end End of the Religious Sanction Suggestions for Thought, Part 1Part 4, Chapter 5 of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook the religious sanction suggestions for thought continued parts four five and six miss nightingale then in addition to her other activities is to be reckoned among the strenuous seekers after truth in religion and philosophy the suggestions had their immediate origin as i have explained already in a desire to meet by some positive reconstruction the negative free thinking among the working classes and the first volume was addressed on the title page and by a dedication to the artisans of england mr jowett criticized this restricted appeal a book cannot be written he said for the artisans separated from the educated classes it must embrace them both there is one intellectual world with common ideas and the more permanent part of that is the world of the higher classes therefore i would urge you not to write for the artisans but to write for everybody and mr mill had written there is much in the work which is calculated to do great good to many persons besides the artisans to whom it is more especially addressed there was some force too especially in regard to the more abstract argument of the first and third volumes in what m mole said that she had set out to give the working classes a religion and that she gave them a philosophy instead the address of the book to artisans became palpably untenable when miss nightingale passed in the second and longest volume to practical deductions and to a criticism of life as lived among the upper ten her sense of humour perceived the incongruity and the second and third volumes were addressed generally to searchers after religious truth the address to artisans is only significant as illustrating a phase of miss nightingale's interests the essential significance of the book in the story of her life is the revelation which it gives of her own mind in its search after truth and of the conclusions in which she ultimately found support i have been much struck in reading the book by the number of illustrations which miss nightingale draws from nursing medicine and administration it may be said i think that the line of speculation
followed in her suggestions for thought was the result of reflection upon those data by a mind which was at once intensely spiritual and severely logical we come very near to the root of the thing in her mind in this passage of tender and yet humorous autobiography when i was young i could not understand what people meant by their thoughts wandering in prayer i asked for what i really wished and really wished for what i asked and my thoughts wandered no more than those of a mother would wander who was supplicating her sovereign for her son's reprieve from execution i liked the morning service much better than the afternoon because we asked for more things i was always miserable if i was not at church when the litany was said how ill-natured it is if you believe in prayer not to ask for everybody what they want i well remember when an uncle died the care i took on behalf of my aunt and cousins to be always present in spirit at the petition for the fatherless children and widows and when gonfalonieri was in the austrian prison of spielberg at that for prisoners and captives my conscience pricked me a little whether this should extend to those who were in prison for murder and debt but i supposed that i might pray for them spiritually i could not pray for george the fourth i thought the people very good who prayed for him and wondered whether he could have been much worse if he had not been prayed for william the fourth i prayed for a little but when victoria came to the throne i prayed for her in a rapture of feeling and my thoughts never wandered to this simple faith of youth experience succeeded a patient might pray for sleep but laudanum was more efficacious what was the use of praying to be delivered from plague and pestilence so long as the common sewers were still allowed to run into the thames if god sent a visitation of cholera which was the more probable reading of his mind that he sent it in order that men might pray to him for relief from it or in order that they should themselves set about removing the predisposing causes miss nightingale's conclusion was that if there be a plan in the universe the plan must be other than what the popular religion of the day logically interpreted implies god's scheme for us she inferred was not that he should give us what we asked for but that mankind should obtain it for mankind this was the germ from which miss nightingale's philosophy of religion was developed she had read much in metaphysics and in theology she had reasoned long with herself of providence foreknowledge will and fate fixed fate free will for knowledge absolute she reasoned long but did not feel herself in wandering mazes lost she began with considering the nature of belief and showed that any true explanation of the term throws us back on the nature of the object of belief the supreme object of belief we call god but in different ages men have meant very different things by god there is the savage idea of god the hindu the greek the israelite and so forth and there is the christian idea which again is widely different according to the patristic or theological notions and according to the popular one this last required to be exalted and purified the true idea of god which is alone reconcilable with the deepest morality and with the widest contemplation of nature and history and the world is the idea not of an individual swayed by likings and personalities but of an universal being who is law the laws of god were she held discoverable by experience research and analysis 
or as she sometimes put it the character of god was ascertainable though his essence might remain a mystery the laws of god were the laws of life and these were ascertainable by careful and especially by statistical inquiry this is what i meant by saying in an earlier chapter that miss nightingale regarded the study of statistics with something of religious reverence statistics compiled by meteorologists have shown she says in the suggestions that storms can be foreseen when a ship goes down in an unforeseen gale do we say how could god permit such a dreadful calamity as the loss of all hands on board the devil must have done it no we say study the signs of approaching gales and you will not be lost is it not the same with moral evil the laws of which are just as calculable a copy of Ketelet's book already mentioned had been presented to her with the author's homage respect and affection she often spoke of the belgian statistician in similar terms his book was in her eyes a religious work a revelation of the will of god in her annotated copy she enlarged the title the book was not merely an essai de physique sociale it exhibited the sense of infinite power the assurances of solid certainty and the endless vista of improvement from the principles of physique sociale if only found possible to apply on occasions when it is so much wanted a very large if many will say as in effect her father constantly said in written discussions with her on these subjects but her reply was always the same the greater the difficulty the more the need for serious study with the concentrated study of mankind upon the problem the answer would be found truth is so said her friend truth is not what one troweth said she and there was no phrase oftener on her lips in serious conversation she went on to develop this idea of god as law in relation to human fate and to those problems of free will and necessity which milton thought to be inscrutable mysteries and around which metaphysicians and logicians have for ages disputed she found her ultimate solution in a hypothesis which mr mill told her that he had at one time tried but abandoned the hypothesis of a being who willing only good leaves evil in the world solely in order to stimulate human faculties by an unremitting struggle against every form of it a perfect being who created a perfectible one and so ordered the world that its course should be a constant struggle towards perfection miss nightingale did not blink the fact that her hypothesis left mysteries unexplained the finite cannot apprehend the infinite we cannot she wrote understand the existence of god willing laws we cannot understand the perfect being all this appears to me exactly what we ought to allow to be a mystery but she held with bossuet that il ne faut pas confondre la question de la nature de dieu avec celle des rapports de dieu et du monde we ought she continued with all our mights to learn the perfections not to understand the perfect to study his character and his laws not his essence or how he lives willing his laws it is evident that creation is a mystery but god's end and object in creating need not be a mystery everybody tells us that the existence of evil is incomprehensible whereas i believe it is much more difficult it is impossible to conceive the existence of god or even of a good man without evil 
Good and evil are relative terms, and neither is intelligible without the other. Without supposing, then, that she had solved the ultimate riddle of the universe, Miss Nightingale had hold of an hypothesis which solved for her many of the mediate riddles. It seemed to her to contain a lofty conception of God, to justify his ways to men, to explain the supposed war between free will and necessity. Her views on some of these high matters will perhaps be made clearer by the letter of explanation which she wrote to her father in sending him a copy of some of her stuff. Old Burlington Street, July 6, 1859. Dear Papa, I shall be so pleased to send you some of my works as you are so good as to wish to read them. I have asked Aunt Mai to send you the shortest, a portion of Volume 1. I think the subject is this. Granted that we see signs of universal law all over this world, that is, law or plan or constant sequences in the moral and intellectual as well as physical phenomena of the world. Granted this, we must, in this universal law, find the traces of a being who made it and what is more of the character of the being who made it if we stop at the superficial signs the being is something so bad as no human character can be found to equal in badness and certainly all the beings he has made are better than himself but go deeper and see wider and it appears as if this plan of universal law were the only one by which a good being could teach his creatures to teach themselves and one another what the road is to universal perfection. And this we shall acknowledge is the only way for any educator, whether human or divine, to act, these to teach men to teach themselves and each other if we could not depend upon god that is if this sequence were not always to be calculated upon in moral as well as in physical things if he were to have caprices by some called grace by others answers to prayer etc there would be no order in creation to depend upon there would be chaos and the only way by which man can have free will that is, can learn to govern his own will, to have what will he thinks right, which is having his will free, is to have universal order or law, by some miscalled necessity. I put this thus brusquely, because philosophers have generally said that necessity and free will are incompatible. It seems to have appeared to God that law is the only way, on the contrary, to give man his free will. And this I have attempted to prove. And further, that this is the only plan a perfectly good, omnipotent being could pursue. Ever, dear Papa, your loving child, F. N. I need not enter into the fundamental difficulty which Mr. Mill found in this last assumption, nor into the difficulties which Mr. Jowett pointed out in a series of letters in Miss Nightingale's Reconciliation of Free Will and Necessity. Our concern here is with what she thought, and the hypothesis satisfied her judgment. It had the further result of giving her a rational basis for belief in a future life. The chapter in which she discussed this subject seemed to Mr. Jowett the most responsible and serious in the whole book. He made some critical objections to details in the argument, but her general line was in accordance with what we know to have been his own conviction on the subject, namely that the evidence for a future life must be found in moral ideas and in a letter to miss nightingale he says i shall never give up the faith in immortality though i cannot determine 
or conceive the manner of another state of being that christ became a mass of clay again seems to me of all incredible things the most incredible to miss nightingale the belief followed logically from her general hypothesis the theory of perfectibility required a future state of infinite progress for each and all the theory of a good god required it the purpose of god as she conceived it is that in the end each and all shall in accordance with law desire and obtain to will right all sin and sorrow being but one of the processes through which mankind is learning and teaching hence it is that belief in a future in connection with human existence is essential to the belief that we are under righteous government how plain wrote mr nightingale to his daughter after reading the chapter are the steps of your argument the senses the reason the feelings appreciate the laws of goodness benevolence and righteousness in the thought of god but circumstances indicate a want of benevolence unless there is reason to believe in a future development therefore a continued existence is according to law mr jowett in his marginalia suggested that she might have made more of the opposite alternative if there is no future state then what of god what of human nature not only would there be an awful deception but a deception of all the best feelings and of those in which we most trust work out the supposition and look it full in the face and whether right or wrong it is hardly possible to suppress the temper of a demon towards the supreme being so miss nightingale intensely thought and therefore the idea of god as universal law willing human perfection gave her even greater security than is put forward in the lines from clough which i have placed at the head of this chapter she quoted them herself but added yes but truth is so that i shall not perish her speculations gave her a basis further for understanding what is meant by a philosophy of history miss nightingale to her father hampstead october twenty four eighteen sixty one seven years this very day since i began the fight for the army i think dicey's cavour and monckton milne's tocqueville and the quarterly the two most masterly sketches of a true statesman i have read for some time cavour's death was heroic in the prime of his glory and success working to the last but i am not sure that there is not something more heroic and more pathetic in tocqueville's broken-hearted but not in despair faithful to the end of the good fight lost although fought so well people call him narrow that is people who are so wide that they can do nothing themselves the unheroic tone of the teachers of the present day is bad as when excellent jowett says that in these days only exceptional cases can fight the good fight is not this the reason why these cases are exceptional and was there ever an age in so much need of heroism most just is the praise to tocqueville of imitating god in his statesmanship in reconciling man's free will and god's law the only mode in which god or statesman can govern but he is unfair to himself when he says he will not play the part of providence he did as far as he could he is untrue to himself in saying how little we can ever find out of the laws of history undoubtedly we have as yet found out hardly anything i suppose buckle has some of the crudest generalizations extant but did we study history as much as physical science would this be so is it not like the children who say i'm too little when told to do a difficult sum to attribute this to the inability of our reason surely god says just the contrary tocqueville tells us not to call events mysterious he calls upon governments to comprehend the mysterious influences 
mysterious only to our ignorance and i would drop the word altogether perhaps tocqueville was the first statesman who united an acknowledgment of the fact that according to the laws of god all human history could not have been other than it has been with the conviction that this instead of stimulating us to do nothing stimulates us to do everything above all her religious belief satisfied her as giving high motive to human conduct it linked in logical connection the service of man to the service of god it inspired with religious enthusiasm her conviction that each individual woman as well as man should be given the freedom to make the best of himself the doing of god's will that is according to her philosophy the discovery of causes and effects the rectification of errors the education of men to profit by their mistakes was the way to communion with god the reader may remember from previous chapters that florence nightingale was conscious of a call from god to be a saviour and that the tribute which she paid to her dear master sidney herbert was to call him a saver there are passages in the suggestions for thought which show with what significance she used those terms god's plan is that we should make mistakes that the consequences should be definite and invariable then comes some saviour christ or another not one saviour but many and one who learns for all the world by the consequences of those errors and saves us from them there must be saviours from social from moral error most people have not learnt any lesson from life at all suffer as they may they learn nothing they would alter nothing we sometimes hear of men having given a colour to their age now if the colour is a right colour those men are saviours miss nightingale's own work in the world at scutari for the health of the british soldier at home for hospitals for nursing and presently for india received from her philosophy a religious sanction section five how if at all it may be asked did she adjust her innermost beliefs to the current creeds of the day i shall not attempt to define what she did not define but a few remarks may be made was she unitarian or trinitarian i think that we may answer as we will she was very sure of god but very chary as we have seen of attempting to define his essence sometimes she seemed to think of god in a unitarian sense but there is a passage in the suggestions in which she philosophizes the trinity the perfect exists in three relations to other existence one as the creator of all other existence of its purpose and of the means of fulfilling its purpose this is the father two as partaken in these other modes of existence this is the son three as manifested to these other modes of existence this is the holy ghost then again was she protestant or catholic she used language at different times which might be interpreted in either direction but she used it at all times with some inner meaning of her own here is a letter which philosophizes an evangelical doctrine miss nightingale to her father hampstead september twenty sixth eighteen sixty three dear papa i am sure that if any one finds nourishment in renan or in any book i should be very sorry to depreciate it there is not so much solid food in books nowadays especially in religious books that we can afford to do so i always think of madame moles i don't want any book writer to chew my food for me now nearly all books are chewed food especially religious books what i dislike in renan is not that it is fine writing but that it is all fine writing his christ is the hero of a novel he himself a successful novel writer 
i am revolted by such expressions as charmant délicieux religion du par sentiment in such a subject as for the religion of sentiment i really don't know what he means it is an expression of balzac's if he means the religion of love i agree and do not agree we must love something lovable and a religion of love must certainly include the explaining of god's character to be something lovable of god's providence which is the self-same thing as god's laws as something loving and lovable on the other hand i go along with christ not with renan's christ far more than most christians do i do think that christ on the cross is the highest expression hitherto of god not in the vulgar meaning of the atonement but god does hang on the cross every day in every one of us the whole meaning of god's providence that is his laws is the cross when christ preaches the cross when all mystical theology preaches the cross i go along with them entirely it is the self-same thing as what i mean when i say that god educates the world by his laws that is by sin that man must create mankind that all this evil that is the cross is the proof of god's goodness is the only way by which god could work out man's salvation without a contradiction you say but there is too much evil i say there is just enough not a millionth part of a grain more than is necessary to teach man by his own mistakes by his sins if you will to show man the way to perfection in eternity to perfection which is the only happiness there were many points on the other hand at which roman catholicism strongly appealed to her so marked is this attitude in the suggestions in passages sometimes ironical sometimes serious that at one of the latter places mr jowett's note in the margin is the enemy will say this book is written by an infidel who has been a papist but i wish that there were more of these sort of reflections showing the true relation of superstitious ideas to moral and spiritual religion i can well believe that her friend cardinal manning for whom she entertained a high respect though she waged a battle royale against him on occasion may sometimes have regarded her as a likely convert but towards acceptance of roman doctrines i find no ground for thinking that she was at any time inclined yet the spirit of catholic saintliness and especially that of the saints whose contemplative piety was joined to active benevolence appealed strongly to her she read books of catholic devotion constantly and made innumerable annotations in them and from them she was greatly attracted by the writings of the port royalists on which subject there is a long correspondence with her father she admired intensely the aid which catholic piety had given and was to many of her own friends giving to the bermondsey nuns especially and to the mother and sisters of the trinita de monte towards purity of heart and the doing of everything from a right motive then again to be businesslike was with miss nightingale almost the highest commendation and in this character also the roman church appealed to her its acceptance of doctrines and all their logical conclusions seemed to her businesslike its organization was businesslike its recognition of women workers was businesslike so then miss nightingale was broad-minded in her attitude towards creeds and churches for her own part she believed that religious truth was positive and could be discovered but in her outlook upon the beliefs of others she judged them by their fruits she asked not so much what was a man's or a woman's religious formula but whether it renewed a right spirit within them with religiosity if it was centred on self she had no sympathy is there anything higher she asked in thinking of one's own salvation than in thinking of one's own dinner i have always felt that the soldier who gives his life for something which is certainly not himself or his shilling a day whether he call it his queen or his country or his colours is higher in the scale than the saints 
or the fakirs or the evangelicals who some of them don't believe that the end of religion is to secure one's own salvation within the limits indicated by these remarks she would have agreed a good deal with what mrs carlyle said to john sterling i confess that i care almost nothing about what a man believes in comparison with how he believes if his belief be correct it is much the better for himself but its intensity its efficacy is the ground on which i love and trust him section six there is a school of philosophy much current in our day which carries this point of view further the meaning of a conception it tells us expresses itself in practical consequences if the conception be true religious truth is relative to the individual the way to test a religion is to live it if the philosophy of the pragmatists be right then few forms of religious creed can claim better witness to their truth than that wherein florence nightingale lived and moved and had her being she had remodelled her whole religious belief from beginning to end and had learnt to know god in the years immediately preceding her active work in the world her belief helped to sustain her natural courage amidst the horrors of scutari and the fever and the cold of balaclava it inspired the life of arduous labour to which she devoted herself on returning from the east it informed her unceasing efforts for the health of the army and the people for the reformation of hospitals for the creation of an art of nursing does some one echoing the words of monsieur mole which i have quoted above doubt whether any vital force can have proceeded from a belief in law as the thought of god and suggest that to herself as to others she was offering a stone instead of bread it was not so to her the religion which she found was as the body and blood of the most high it is impossible to doubt the spiritual intensity the religious fervour of passages such as these from the pages in suggestions for thought in which she describes communion with god if it is said we cannot love a law the mode in which god reveals himself the answer is we can love the spirit which originates which is manifested in the law it is not the material presence only that we love in our fellow creatures it is the spirit which bespeaks the material presence that we love shall we then not love the spirit of all that is lovable which all material presence bespeaks to us how penetrated must those have been who first genuinely had the conception who felt who thought whose imaginations helped them to conceive that the divine verity manifests itself in the human partakes itself becomes one with the human descends into the hell of sin and suffering with the human by being verily and indeed taken and received by the human we will seek continually and stimulate mankind to seek with us to prepare the eye and the ear of the great human existence that seeing it shall perceive and hearing it shall understand whether we eat or drink or whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of god to do it to the glory of god must be to fulfil the lord's purpose that purpose is man's increase in truth increase in right being the history of mankind should be will be one day the history of man's endeavour after increase of truth and after a right nature what does ignorant finite man want how great how suffering yet how sublime are his wants think of his wounded aching heart as compared with the bird and beast his longing eye his speaking countenance compared with these they show something of such difference but nothing nothing compared with what is within where no eye can read what then poor sufferer dost thou want i want a wise and loving counsellor 
whose love and wisdom should come home to the whole of my nature i would work oh how gladly but i want direction how to work i would suffer oh how willingly but for a purpose god always speaks plain in his laws his everlasting voice my poor child he says dost thou complain that i do not prematurely give thee food which thou couldst not digest my son i am always one with thee though thou art not always one with me that spirit racked or blighted by sin my child it is thy father's spirit whence comes it why does it suffer or why is it blighted but that it is incipient love and truth and wisdom tortured or suppressed but law that is the will of the perfect is now was without beginning and ever shall be as the inducement and the means by which that blight or suffering which is god within man shall become man one with god first find the infinite said a wise man then name him as thou wilt it is not hard to know god said joubert provided one will not force oneself to define him and another of old time said lead thou me god law reason duty life all names for thee alike are vain and hollow there is a section of miss nightingale's suggestions for thought called cassandra it is the story of a girl's imprisoned life it is in part autobiographical and i have quoted from it several times in the course of this work it ends with the death of the heroine let neither name nor date be placed on her grave still less the expression of regret or of admiration but simply the words i believe in god end of the religious sanction suggestions for thought continued Part four, chapter six of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One by Edward Tyus Cook. Miss Nightingale at Home, eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one few women and not many men have lived a fuller and busier life than was miss nightingale's during the five years which followed her return from the crimean war they were years of public work but of work done in quiet and what is more remarkable they were years to her of constant physical weakness at the turn of the year eighteen fifty seven eight she was thought like to die there were many times during the year 1859 when she and her friends expected her death at any moment. Thank you, wrote George Eliot to Miss Hennell in February, for sending me that authentic word about Miss Nightingale. I wonder if she would rather rest from her blessed labors or live to go on working. Sometimes when I read of the death of some great sensitive human being, I have a triumph in the sense that they are at rest and yet along with that deep sadness at the thought that the rare nature is gone for ever into the darkness in the same year miss nightingale gave mr clough full instructions for her funeral to her friend colonel lefroy she had written as if the end were very near what a crown yours will be he answered march twenty when you rest from your labours and your works follow you a year later she wrote to mr manning february twenty five dear sir or dear friend whichever i may call you i am in the land of the living still as you see contrary to everybody's expectation but so much weaker than when you were so kind as to come here that i do not sit up at all now nunc dimittis she added is the only prayer i can make now as far as regards myself yet during all the time she was full of energy and fire and lived laborious days in writing and in talking 
if the reader will turn to the bibliography eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one he will see at a glance how numerous were her printed works and preceding chapters have enabled him to estimate the amount of toil and thought that lay behind them her unprinted memoranda are on a like scale and her correspondence was enormous then too hardly a day passed upon which she did not transact business personally with one or other or with several of her cabinet among persons whom miss nightingale declined on the ground of failing health to receive and the number included old friends and colleagues as well as strangers there were some who would not believe that she was as ill as she said they thought that she was cloaking hardness of heart or perversity of temper but they were wrong among occasional visitors again whom she did receive there were those to whom the evidence of their senses derived from her animated and vigorous conversation seemed to negative the idea that she was a serious invalid but they did not understand sir john lawrence for instance was received in march eighteen sixty one to discuss indian questions he found her much better than he expected so her cousin hilary reported and said so to dr sutherland as he went downstairs dr sutherland replied you cannot know but when i go back i shall find her quite abattu and shall not speak another word to her and so it was dr sutherland found her trembling all over and had to administer medical aid for any interview with a stranger and for many interviews with her familiar colleagues she had to save up strength very carefully in advance and the transaction of any critical business or the strain of any excitement in conversation left her prostrate and palpitating afterwards the doctors now told her that her heart was seriously affected mr chadwick doubted this her father writing to his wife from london and describing an evening spent with florence said eighteen sixty one chadwick and sutherland at dinner the former persisting that flo's voice alone is sufficient to show that her so-called heart complaint is doubtful in truth she still seems to work like a hercules in spite of all weakness she worked without pause but there were times when for weeks she did not leave her sofa or her bed and for months did not go out of doors it may be as mr chadwick thought that the diagnosis of the physicians was wrong or at any rate that it exaggerated the seriousness of the case as she lived to be ninety the truth must be i suppose that none of her vital organs or functions were at this time diseased the history of her case points i am told to dilatation of the heart and neurasthenia the former of these states though often distressing in its symptoms yields i understand to drugs and rest and for the a tonic condition of the nervous system which is called neurasthenia and which is often the product of excessive stress upon the functions of the mind complete rest is also often a remedy if upon her return to england miss nightingale had taken a long period of rest it is probable that she would have regained normal health of body but as we have seen she allowed herself no rest at all she taxed exhausted powers of body to the uttermost even now complete rest would probably have cured her but as she could not or would not put work aside she was only able to carry it on by careful husbandry of her strength part two this state of the case led to a way of life which during the years now under consideration seemed a matter of necessity and which in later and less strenuous years had become perhaps in some degree a matter of habit miss nightingale during the busy years eighteen fifty six to sixty one lived the life of a laborious hermit a life which may in some respects be likened to that of queen victoria in the years following the death of the prince consort 
in her own secluded court she worked indefatigably but she screened herself closely from the world after the year eighteen fifty eight miss nightingale abandoned malvern and for change of air went instead to one or other of the northern heights of london for the rest of the time she lived in london itself and sometimes when she was living at hampstead she would drive daily to her london quarters for the transaction of business whether in london or at hampstead or highgate she did most of her work reclining on a sofa she must have been touched when an upholsterer hearing of her illness volunteered march eighteen sixty to make a reclining couch to her order he offered it as some slight token of the esteem she is held in by the working classes for her kindness to our soldiers many of whom are related to my workmen who would gladly work in her behalf without pay the screen from the outside world was provided by the devotion of relations and a few intimate friends in official business connected with the war office and hospitals her most constant helper was dr sutherland when not engaged on official business elsewhere he was with her nearly every day and a large number of her drafts copies and memoranda of this date are in his handwriting captain galton also rendered some assistance of a like sort among her kinsfolk the most helpful to her was mr clough who besides being the secretary of the nightingale fund was devoted in many ways to her service a little note from him february sixteenth eighteen fifty nine one of many will show the kind of thing willy-nilly you must stay till saturday the railway carriage is ordered at euston station they do not admit that saturday is a later day for the express than any other let us hope they are right the arrangements are therefore made for saturday i think you must allow me to see them carried out myself i enclose a yellow and maladive looking letter apparently from whom shall we hang at pulo penang there was also a brown paper parcel with i think two blue books inside it from mr alexander which i left lying at the burlington the rooms will all be ready as before i send a daily news with harriet martineau's latest on the eternal laws farewell a h clough her uncle and aunt mr and mrs samuel smith also played helpful parts at this time in miss nightingale's life of her aunt my and herself miss nightingale wrote that they were as two lovers and the aunt played a lover's part both in affectionate solicitude and in keeping the rest of the world away mr smith who was an examiner of private bills had rooms conveniently situated in whitehall and placed his business-like habits entirely at his niece's service much of her correspondence in the case of outsiders was undertaken by him and he also acted as her banker and accountant he found some reward perhaps for the drudgery in the pungency of the dockets in which miss nightingale conveyed her instructions on the letter from a lady working at cluer who loved and honoured miss nightingale and looked forward to seeing her some day the docket is dear uncle sam please choke off this woman and tell her that i shall never be well enough to see her either here or hereafter to the secretary of a certain sanitary association i will give twenty-one shillings for mrs s s sake provided they don't send me any more of their stupid books and don't let this unbusiness-like woman write any more of these unbusiness-like letters to be unbusiness-like was in miss nightingale's eyes an unpardonable sin whether in woman or in man in a woman it was almost as bad as another which is touched upon in one of the dockets choke her off my private belief is that she merely wants a chance of getting married on a letter of a very rambling kind from a would-be nurse uncle sam's attention is called to 
the curious thing that she does not seem to know whether it is a parent or a child that she has lost to a reverend gentleman who had a secret cure these miserable ecclesiastical quacks could you give them a lesson what would they think of me did i possess such a discovery and keep it secret to the inventor of a patent bed quilt this man's letter reminds me of the pills which when taken by a gentleman with a wooden leg made it grow again to the british army scripture readers she will send a subscription though with some misgiving i am like paul farrell who never would engage in anything knowing that he was a murderer and might be found out any day so i think her uncle had read her religious speculations and would have caught the allusion to her heterodox opinions to a pious lady who sent a tract please answer this fool but don't give her my address miss nightingale disliked tracts she received great bundles of them for distribution at scutari i said i distributed them she once confessed whether to the fire or not i did not say like all female celebrities miss nightingale received many offers of marriage a letter which she wrote in the papers in support of the volunteer movement produced several one was from a poor engineer who was profoundly touched by her noble sentiments and feared that only in heaven would her holy work be truly appreciated but meanwhile offered his hand and heart which are free only you are so much above me it is gratifying to observe uncle sam is told that this is not the first fruits but the one and fortieth of my volunteer letter and that i could have as many husbands as mahomet's mother alas it is i who am the grey donkey to a petitioner who sent copies of verses to accompany accounts of his evangelical principles and pecuniary embarrassments this is the third time the man has written i think it is time you put a stop to him and his poetry miss nightingale detested gush almost as much as unbusinesslike habits indeed if the two things need be distinguished she kept everything she received but in looking through the presentation copies of poems in her library i was struck and i fear that the donors would have been pained by the fact that she seldom had the curiosity even to cut the leaves where her praises are sung to a very long-winded appeal from a lady who claimed the thrilling honour of miss nightingale's sympathy i believe all this though i don't know the woman from adam send her two pound for me at the same time giving her a hint to look at bleak house but mr smith though not a member of parliament was an old parliamentary hand and i have seen copies of some of the admirable letters in which he carried out more or less his niece's instructions i feel confident that he did not wound this petitioner's feelings by allusion to mrs jellyby or boreal boulaga nor was it supposed that he would miss nightingale seldom denied herself a joke but though she had a keen scent for palpable humbug and was instantly offended by it her heart was easily touched and i am not sure that all her pecuniary benefactions which were constant numerous and manifold would have passed the test of a strict charity organization committee often however she took great pains in following up cases and in relieving them in the best way she was particularly open to appeals from the widows or other relations of soldiers and sailors her intimate knowledge of hospitals and other charitable institutions and the favour of queen victoria in placing many beds at her disposal increased her means of helpfulness many of her petitioners especially if they were autograph hunters in disguise were disappointed no doubt at not receiving an answer from miss nightingale herself but pecuniarily they were sometimes the gainers on many of their letters i find this supplementary docket from kind-hearted uncle sam sent also something on my own account and sometimes he sent something when she had said send nothing 
and she got the credit for it dear uncle sam i am so glad to think that i am laying up such a store in heaven upon your two pounds sent without my permission to this woman the uncle's tongue was almost as sharp and witty i have been told as the niece's pen and he must have found her comments very congenial part three the places at which miss nightingale lay perdue during these years were west hill lodge highgate the house of the howitts may june eighteen fifty nine montague grove hampstead oak hill house frognal september eighteen fifty nine to january eighteen sixty and upper terrace lodge number three hampstead end of eighteen sixty at one time when mr clough was abroad in search of health his young children stayed with her aunt at hampstead and her letters show that she took pleasure in their pleasures on the heath a letter to mrs clough hampstead september one eighteen sixty contains as pretty a description of a young child as may anywhere be found it came in its flannel coat to see me no one had ever prepared me for its royalty it sat quite upright but would not say a word good or bad the cats jumped up upon it it put out its hand with a kind of gracious dignity and caressed them as if they were presenting addresses and they responded in a humble grateful way quite cowed by infant majesty then it put out its little bare cold feet for me to warm which when i did it smiled in about twenty minutes it waved its hand to go away still without speaking a word i think it is the most beautifully organized little piece of humanity i ever saw the scene of miss nightingale's london court was the burlington hotel in april eighteen sixty one colonel phipps wrote to sir harry verney it has been arranged that an apartment at kensington palace shall be put into proper repair with a view to its being offered by the queen to miss nightingale as a residence i need not tell you how grateful it will be to the queen's feelings even in this slight degree to be able to mark her respect for this most excellent lady of whom everybody in this country must be proud but the queen's offer was respectfully declined those were days when there were no motor-cars or underground railways and miss nightingale immersed in daily business with men of affairs felt that a residence so remote from official london as kensington palace would deprive her of many opportunities for useful work she remained accordingly at the burlington where she had a small suite of apartments in a house attached to the hotel it comprised on an upper floor a bedroom a dressing-room a room for her maid and a spare bedroom and on a lower floor a sitting-room the spare bedroom enabled her to send dine and sleep invitations to busy men who were working with her on such occasions she would invite other members of her cabinet to dinner or to breakfast but she seldom was able to sit down to table with them hired rooms in hotels or lodgings gave miss nightingale for many years of her life all that she wanted in such sort the smaller the home the greater the quiet she was entirely free from dependence upon or affection for things she simplified life by reducing her impedimenta to the smallest compass her father in an incautious moment once wrote of sending some things for her drawing-room at the burlington she replied indignantly that she had no drawing-room a thing which was the destruction of so many women's lives there are always flowers in her rooms wrote her cousin beatrice to mr nightingale but so many blue books that i should think she could not complain of their looking like drawing-rooms i saw her wrote her sister to madame mole just before we came here embley and found the table covered among her beautiful flowers sent her by all sorts of people with indian reports and plans of new hospitals she was always fond of flowers she believed too in their curative or at any rate consolatory effect upon the sick 
and had made some study of their several colors in this respect with flowers and fruit and game she was abundantly supplied by her friend lady ashburton among others and by her admirer lady burdett coutts she forwarded many of such gifts to friends nurses and hospitals she asked her mother to send greenery and flowers from the country for the london hospitals it gives such pleasure to people who never see anything but four walls she was particularly thoughtful of the bermondsey nuns who had served with her in the crimean war she was constantly solicitous about the reverend mother's health as were the sisters about hers i am always praying for you wrote one of them her cardinal sister gonzaga and your health is no credit to my piety her little household always included some cats of which she was very fond madame mole had given her a family of fine persians some of them yellow and striped almost like tigers and very wild in a letter to sir james paget she seems to have complained that st bartholomew's hospital did not quite reciprocate her admiration yet she had a cat named bart's as well as one named tom sir james would communicate this evidence of affection to his colleagues but the fact was he added that thomas is a very boastful fellow and says sometimes that the lady thinks meanly of every one but him miss nightingale's fondness for cats was shared by her father and many of her letters to him and of his to her passed from problems of metaphysics to the less riddling antics of kittens end of miss nightingale at home eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty one part four chapter six of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook miss nightingale at home continued part four a diet of blue books has been likened by lord rosebery to one of cracknell biscuits but miss nightingale hungered and thirsted after facts and only complained of blue books when they did not give so many facts and figures as were reasonably containable in the given cubic space it may seem a strange reaction wrote mr jowett to her may eleventh eighteen sixty one to offer to a lady who is ill a discussion on metaphysics or theology but i hear that you still feel interested in such subjects and therefore may i venture to try and entertain you there follows a long disquisition upon freedom and necessity and other high matters mr jowett was correctly informed there was nothing which miss nightingale more enjoyed than metaphysical discussion it was not so much that she found in it an intellectual contrast to the problems of practical administration in which she was at other times engaged but rather as i have suggested in the preceding chapter that she believed it possible to attain in the region of philosophy and religion the same positive results that are deducible in sanitary science for recreation she turned occasionally to fiction she corresponded with mrs archer clive on the plot of paul farrell in a different sort the novels of another friend pleased her she said of your ruth this morning wrote her cousin hilary to mrs gaskell september sixth eighteen fifty nine it is a beautiful novel and i think i like it better still than when i first read it six years ago we had sent for ruth to lie on her table and tempt her and she bids me ask now for north and south which also she read of old miss nightingale who as a girl was music mad found occasional solace in hearing it 
she says in notes on nursing that wind instruments including the human voice and string instruments capable of continuous sound have generally a soothing effect upon invalids while the pianoforte with such instruments as have no continuity of sound has just the reverse there was an evening in october eighteen sixty when miss nightingale had a great treat clara novello contessa gigliucci was one of many women in whom the heroine of the crimea inspired a passionate admiration and she begged to be allowed to come and sing to the invalid i shall never in my life forget the evening she wrote to miss nightingale's cousin october twenty six the agitation i experienced made me unable to leave my bed all next day i never remember to have felt such emotions as i had the delight of kissing those lovely and blessed hands blessed in their deeds and blessed by so many and looked into that dear tender face i could not restrain my tears just such tears as rise when one hears a lovely melody or is told of an heroic deed miss nightingale presently wrote a letter of thanks saying that the singing had restored her and the contessa replied i can say with entire truth that god's gift to me of voice has never given me so much delight as when i was able to sing to you though probably i never sang so ill the contessa was a garibaldian and this was a further link between her and miss nightingale whose enthusiasm in the cause of italian unity and liberation was of long standing she sent several subscriptions in eighteen sixty to funds which were collected in this country for the garibaldian cause her checks were made payable to garibaldi and she expressed a hope that they would be used in the purchase of arms i quite agree she wrote june with the patriots who say better give money for arms than to heal the holes the arms have made she was often more of a soldier than of a nurse part five miss nightingale's fame was great in italy owing to the sardinian contingent in the crimea and indirectly it was the cause of one of the few occasions upon which her barriers were broken through an excellent lady full of breathless activity and of enthusiasm for italy had been asked during her visit to that country by persons anxious for its regeneration to send them a florence nightingale the lady was more particularly interested in educating the south and garibaldi himself had given his name to an appeal to english women for cooperation in that large undertaking she was staying at the burlington hotel and chancing to learn that miss nightingale was there also she burst in upon her she wanted me wrote miss nightingale in describing the incursion to write to half the people in london and to set up a whole system of education at naples you are to write all the statutes she said for ragged schools infant schools industrial schools provident societies as you do for the army miss nightingale suggested that there might be practical difficulties but though i really talked as loud and as fast as i possibly could i doubt if she took in a word the interview left miss nightingale much exhausted and uncle sam was called in to prevent any repetition of it she had however a real respect for the earnestness of her visitor and wrote letters to some italian friends about the scheme incursions by casual callers and visits from friendly entertainers were however alike very rare the greater part of her days during the years eighteen fifty eight to sixty one was spent in transacting the business which has been described in preceding chapters her voluminous correspondence her literary work the daily interviews with mr herbert or dr sutherland or others on matters of business left her with little time or strength for seeing other friends and relations and not very much for correspondence with them she occasionally saw lady ashburton to whom she was greatly attached more frequently another of her dearest friends mrs bracebridge but she was so helpful that her visits may be reckoned amongst business calls 
sometimes she saw dr manning but the same may almost be said of his visits since religious speculation and philanthropic enterprises were amongst the business of her life she saw miss mary jones the superintendent of st john's house from time to time but for the rest she lived in seclusion from her friends and admirers she was secluded hardly less from her relations her cousin miss hilary bonham carter or her aunt mai or her cousin beatrice often stayed in the house but this did not mean that they saw very much of her i communicate with her every day wrote mrs smith january eighteen sixty one but i have not seen her to speak to for nearly four years indeed we know wrote miss beatrice to mr nightingale how hard it is for you to hear nothing of her but no one can know anything now that the isolation of work has set in when miss nightingale decided upon making the burlington her headquarters aunt mai had undertaken the difficult commission from her niece of intimating to her parents that it might be better if they henceforth when staying in london were to go somewhere else it was essential said aunt mai to florence's health on which depended her work that she should live a life of seclusion it would be difficult to ward off stray callers if it were known that her parents were with her visitors would come to see them and break in upon her they went elsewhere accordingly and had to take their chance with others of being admitted or refused dear papa wrote miss nightingale june thirteen i shall always be well enough to see you as long as this mortal coil is on me at all mr herbert goes to spa the first week in july after that there will be less pressure on me the pressure of disappointment in his more than excusable administrative indifference but july will be later than your ordinary transit please tell mamma that the jug and nosegay were beautiful and again a few days later dear papa i will keep all sunday vacant for you i should like to have you twice please say at eleven and a half and three and a half hours thus spent with his daughter were among the keenest pleasures of mr nightingale's life in a letter of eighteen sixty one he writes to her quid quid ex agricola amavimus quid quid mirati sumus mandet mansurumque est in animus i say it not in vain praise but whatever i have heard at your bedside and from your sofa manet mansurumque est in animus and so would i fain hear whatever words i might catch from your lips when your active work ceases and your prophecy begins when the father returned to his pleasant country houses he would renew the intercourse with his daughter by turning to her suggestions for thought to miss nightingale from her father july twenty one eighteen sixty one i could realize you while i turned the pages on the progress of man towards that perfection so sure though so slow to come creating for himself that better world which he had so foolishly thought was to be given him for the asking was ever faith in the perfect law of love and goodness like yours the more of disappointment the more suffering the stronger faith i also can rely on the invisible power but can i give a more reasonable account of my faith than he who believes in atonements incarnations revelations and so forth was ever sentence truer than yours god's plan is that we make mistakes in them i will try to learn god's purpose i also feel myself mistaken all day long in thought feeling or doing but what help do i find do i learn therefrom do my threescore years and more give me the repose of a life spent in helping others or even in helping myself then he turns from such reflections as if too hard for him describes to her the doings of her favorite cats and talks of the hills and streams of her old home hoping against hope it may be to lure her back and jotting down his wandering thoughts the while but you will say tell me no more of my idle cats i have cares enough and thoughts enough elsewhere my other belongings where are they i relied on a secretary of state where is he where my hospitals where all my many friends on whom i placed my work where is my strength my mind still strains over the immeasurable wants of the army i have served and i am left alone with my physical powers confining me to my chamber 
how vain then is my thought that here if you had wings you might be at rest at this calm peaceful window where the hills keep creeping down into the far receding valley and multiply my thoughts as it were into eternity you will in your mind's eye at least rejoice with me while i recount a day too soon gone too full perhaps of erring reflection too short of inspiration the relations between father and daughter had been made more intimate by her book of religious and philosophical speculation mr nightingale it may be added had enlarged florence's allowance at the time of the marriage of his other daughter henceforth he undertook to pay without question all her bills for board and lodging and to allow her five hundred pounds a year besides she had made too a considerable sum by her notes on nursing and was able to enlarge the scale of her benefactions among the first uses which she made of her enlarged means was to give five hundred pounds for the improvement of the school near lee hurst in which her cousin beatrice who during these years often lived there with mr and mrs nightingale was greatly interested especially for the sanitary improvement for which purpose she asked her friend mr chadwick to go on a visit to her parents and inspect the school buildings she was careless of her own sanitary improvement dr sutherland had said but she was very particular about that of her relations when mr william shore smith her boy of earlier days was about to be married and was house hunting she obtained from him a written promise signed sealed and attested that he would enter into no covenant until dr sutherland had reported to her on the drains when another of her cousins was to be married miss nightingale's last good wishes before the event took the form of strict orders that the bride should put on thick-soled fur slippers over her shoes and walk into the church tell her nothing depresses the spirit so much as a damp chill to the feet she will wonder why she is so low i suspect some double entendre miss nightingale as we know was not an enthusiast on marriage in the abstract when at a later time one of her younger cousins wrote to announce her engagement aunt florence's answer by telegram was strictly non-committal a thousand thousand thanks for your letter part six miss nightingale's correspondence during these years was mostly upon business but she sometimes found time for the kind of letters which connoisseurs in that pleasant art account the best letters about nothing in particular in this kind her old friend madame mole continued to be favoured and these letters seldom lacked the caustic touch which their recipient relished as in this miss nightingale to madame mole june sixth eighteen fifty nine balzac somewhere says how all the world friends and enemies se fait complice de nos défauts and i have heard you observe that english mothers act greek chorus to their children do you philosophers i am passe and off the philosophizing stage come over and explain to us english society now where everybody has some little moral reason for doing everything that he likes where health is made the excuse for neglecting every duty and at the same time the not being able to perform said duty is deplored as the only cross how much more dangerous are our moralities than our immoralities everybody has everything both ways here when i lived in society english it seemed to me that in conversation people but more especially women were always doing one or more of three things one addressing themselves as when they adduce those little moral reasons for doing whatever they like two saying something to mean something else since i began what m mole calls my war against red tape the commonest argument brought against me both my men and women the best and cleverest and within the last week too is that i am led by dishonest flatterers and that they trust i may awaken to a sense of my duty as a woman now they don't really believe that i am led by dishonest flattery but they think i shall not like it to be supposed that i am this is only an anecdote i hate anecdotes don't you but it is a very fair illustration of my number two three acting an amiable or humble idea as when people tell an ill-natured story and then its palliation and then say we might have been worse 
and all the while all they mean to be in your mind is how amiable they are and how humble they are and they mean you to believe the story and not the palliation i have done with being amiable it is the mother of mischief miss nightingale may have done with being amiable but she had certainly not done with a lively sense of humour at the burlington one day or rather one night there was a domestic catastrophe miss nightingale's dressing-room was flooded she sent a characteristic account of the subsequent proceedings to her cousin miss nightingale to miss h bonham carter eighteen sixty one i have just reenacted the crimea on a small scale everybody did their duty and i was drowned but so distrustful was i of the results of their duty that i extorted from mr x a weekly inspection of the cistern i acted myself and no one has yet been drowned again mr x convinced four men sir harry verney papa uncle sam uncle octavius whom i brought under way that it was the frost and that he had done all that was possible then i had up mr x and he admitted at once that it was nothing to do with the frost and that what the workmen had done viz not altering the waste pipe was rascally i said he came off with an excuse and i came off with a severe internal congestion vide medical certificate i have had a larger responsibility of human lives than ever man or woman had before and i attribute my success to this i never gave or took an excuse yes i do see the difference now between me and other men when a disaster happens i act and they make excuses landlords might be browbeaten servants had to be bribed the prophetess had no honour in her own hotel the maids at the burlington had not mastered the elements of household hygiene as set out in notes on nursing amongst miss nightingale's papers there is this document august sixteenth eighteen sixty if for one fortnight from this time i find all the doors shut and all the windows open and if i will give the servants a doctor's fee viz one guinea signed f nightingale the burlington hotel continued to be miss nightingale's principal home till august eighteen sixty one the house number thirty in old burlington street still stands and a memorial tablet might well be affixed by the london county council or the society of arts no other spot in this country has associations with so much of miss nightingale's public work it was there that she wrote the famous report on her experiences in the crimea and there that she had the historic interview with lord panmure the starting point for the great and manifold reforms which she and mr herbert carried out for the health of the british army it was there too that she wrote her notes on hospitals and notes on nursing the books which helped to make a new epoch in hospital reform and to found the art of modern nursing and there that she thought out the scheme for professional training which has made nightingale nurses known throughout the world soon after lord herbert's death in august eighteen sixty one miss nightingale left old burlington street she was fond of the house she had found no other place in london so convenient for her work she had preferred to stay there rather than to accept the royal invitation to kensington palace but the associations of the burlington as she said to many friends at the time had now become too painful after the loss of her dear master she never visited it again the death of sidney herbert closed a chapter in the life of florence nightingale end of miss nightingale at home continued end of the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook